drop a bunch of bombs through the clouds. There's no sense of accomplishment. He shrugged and sipped his drink, dismissing the war as a sort of pointless equation, an irrelevant problem no longer deserving of his talents. An hour or so later, driving back to Los Angeles, I picked up a newscast on the radio. Student riots at Duke, Wisconsin, and Berkeley. Oil slick in the Santa Barbara Channel. Kennedy murder trials in New Orleans and Los Angeles. And suddenly, Edwards Air Force Base and that young pilot from Virginia seemed a million miles away. Who would ever have thought, for instance, that the war in Vietnam could be solved by taking the fun out of bombing? The police chief. The professional voice of law enforcement. Scanlon's Monthly, Volume 1, Number 7, June 1970. Weapons are my business. You name it, and I know it. Guns, bombs, gas, fire, knives, and everything else. Damn few people in the world know more about weaponry than I do. I'm an expert on demolition, ballistics, blades, motors, animals, anything capable of causing damage to man, beast, or structure. This is my profession, my bag, my trade, my thing, my evil specialty. And for this reason, the editors of Scanlon's have asked me to comment on a periodical called The Police Chief. At first, I refused, but various pressures soon caused me to change my mind. Money was not a factor in my decision. What finally spurred me to action was a sense of duty, even urgency, to make my voice heard. I am, as I said, a pro. And in this foul and desperate hour in our history, I think even pros should speak up. Frankly, I love this country. And also, quite frankly, I despise being put in this position, for a lot of reasons, which I don't mind listing. Number one. For one thing, the press used to have a good rule about not talking about each other, no matter what they thought, or even what they knew. In the good old days, a newspaper man would always protect his own kind. There was no way to get those bastards to testify against each other. It was worse than trying to make doctors testify in a malpractice suit or making a beat cop squeal on his buddy in a police brutality case. Number two. The reason I know about things like malpractice and police brutality is that I used to be a cop. A police chief, for that matter, in a small city just east of Los Angeles. And before that, I was a boss detective in Nevada. And before that, a beat cop in Oakland. So I know what I'm talking about when I say most journalists are lying shitheads. I never knew a reporter who could even say the word corrupt without pissing in his pants from pure guilt. Number three. The third reason for the bad way I feel about this article is that I used to have tremendous faith in this magazine called The Police Chief. I read it cover to cover every month, like some people read the Bible. And the city paid for my subscription. Because they knew I was valuable to them, and The Police Chief was valuable to me. I loved that goddamn magazine. It taught me things. It kept me ahead of the game. But no more. Things are different now, and not just for me either. As a respected law enforcement official for 20 years in the West, and now as a weapons consultant to a political candidate in Colorado, I can say from long and tremendous experience that the police chief has turned to cheap jelly. As a publication, it no longer excites me, and as a phony voice of the Brotherhood, it makes me sick with rage. One night in Oakland, about a dozen years ago, I actually got my rocks off from reading the advertisements. I hate to admit such a thing, but it's true. I remember one ad from Smith & Wesson when they first came out with their double-action 44 Magnum revolver. 240 grains of hot lead exploding out of a big pipe in your hand at 1,200 feet per second. And super accurate, even on a running target. 
Up until that time, we'd all thought the 357 Magnum was just about the bee's nuts. FBI filed tests had proved what the 357 could do. In one case, with FBI agents giving fire pursuit to a carload of fleeing suspects, an agent in the pursuing car brought the whole chase to an end with a single shot from his 357 revolver. His slug penetrated the trunk of the fleeing car, then the back seat, then the upper torso of a back seat passenger, then the front seat, then the neck of the driver, then the dashboard, and finally embedded itself in the engine block. Indeed, the 357 was such a terrifying weapon that for ten years only qualified marksmen were allowed to carry them. So it just about drove me crazy when, just after I'd qualified to carry a 357, I picked up a new issue of the police chief and saw an ad for the 44 Magnum, a brand new revolver with twice the velocity and twice the striking power of the old 357. One of the first real-life stories I heard about the 44 Magnum was from a Tennessee sheriff whom I met one spring at a law enforcement conference in St. Louis. Most men can't handle the goddamn thing, he said. It kicks worse than a goddamn bazooka, and it hits like a goddamn A-bomb. Last week, I had to chase a nigger downtown, and when he got so far away that he couldn't even hear my warning yell... I just pulled down on the bastard with this 44 Magnum and blew the head clean off his body with one shot. All we found were some teeth and one eyeball. The rest was all mush and bone splinters. Well, let's face it. That man was a bigot. We've learned a lot about racial problems since then, but even a nigger could read the police chief in 1970 and see that we haven't learned much about weapons. Today's beat cop in any large city is a sitting duck for snipers, rapers, dope addicts, bomb throwers, and communist fruits. These scum are well armed with U.S. Army weapons, and that's why I finally quit official police work. As a weapons specialist, I saw clearly in the years between 1960 and 1969 that the Army's weapons testing program on the Indo-Chinese Peninsula was making huge strides. In that active decade, the basic military cartridge developed from the ancient 30-06 to the neuter 308 to a rapid-fire 223. That lame old chestnut about sharpshooters was finally muscled aside by the proven value of sustained fire screens. The hand-thrown grenade was replaced at long last by the portable grenade launcher, the Claymore mine, and the fiery missile cluster. In the simplest of technical terms, the kill potential of the individual soldier was increased from 1.6 per second to 26.4 per second, or nearly 5 KP points higher than Pentagon figures indicate we would need to prevail in a land war with China. So the reason for this nation's dismal failure on the Indochinese Peninsula lies not in our weapons technology, but in a failure of will. Yes, our GIs are doomed in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Burma, etc., for the same insane reason that our law enforcement agents are doomed in Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago. They have been shackled for years by cowardly faggots and spies. Not all were conscious traitors. Some were morally weak. Others were victims of drugs. And many were simply crazy. Let's face it. The majority of people in this country are mentally ill. And this illness unfortunately extends into all walks of life, including law enforcement. The illness is manifest in our national stance from Bangkok to Bangor, to coin a phrase... But to those of us still dying on our feet in the dry rot of middle America, there is no worse pain and no more hideous proof of the plague that afflicts us all than the knowledge of what has happened to the police chief, a magazine we once loved because it was great. But let's take a look at it now. The editor-in-chief is an FBI dropout by the name of Quinn Tam a middle-aged career cop who ruined his whole life one day by accidentally walking on the fighting side of J. Edgar Hoover's wiretap fetish. Tam is legally sane, by liberal standards, but in grassroots police circles, he is primarily known as the model for Mitch Greenhill's famous song, Pig in the Stash. The real editor of the magazine is a woman named Pitcher, 
I knew her in the old days. But Tam's son does most of the work anyway. One of the most frightening things about the police chief is that it calls itself the professional voice of law enforcement. But all it really is is a house organ for a gang of high-salaried pansies who call themselves the International Association of Chiefs of Police Incorporated. How about that? Here's a crowd of suck-asses putting out this magazine that says it's the voice of cops, which is bullshit. All you have to do is look at the goddamn thing to see what it is. Look at the advertising. Fag tools. Breathalyzers. Paralyzers. Gas masks. Sirens. Funny little car radios with voice scramblers so the scum can't listen in. But no attack weapons! Not one! The last really functional weapon that got mentioned in the police chief was the nutcracker flail, a combination club and pincers about three feet long that can cripple almost anybody. It works like a huge pair of pliers. The officer first flails the living shit out of anybody he can reach, and then, when a suspect falls, he swiftly applies the nutcracker action, gripping the victim's neck, extremities, or genitals with the powerful pincers at the reaching end of the tool then squeezing until all resistance ceases. Believe me, our city streets would be a lot safer if every beat cop in the nation carried a nutcracker flail. So why is this fine weapon no longer advertised in PC? I'll tell you why. For the same reason they no longer advertise the 44 Magnum, or the fantastically efficient stoner rifle that can shoot through brick walls and make hash of the rabble inside. Yes. And also for the same reason they won't advertise the Growler, a mobile sound unit that emits such unholy shrieks and roars that every human being within a radius of ten city blocks is paralyzed with unbearable pain. They collapse in their tracks and curl up like worms, losing all control of their bowels and bleeding from the ears. Every PD in the country should have a Growler, but the PC won't advertise it because they're afraid of hurting their image. They want to be loved. In this critical hour, we don't need love. We need weapons. The newest and best and most efficient weapons we can get our hands on. This is a time of extreme peril. The rising tide is almost on us, but you'd never know it from reading the police, Chief. Let's look at the June 1970 issue. The first thing we get is a bunch of gibberish written by the police chief of Miami, Florida, saying the law enforcement system in the USA is doomed to failure. Facing this is a full-page ad for the Smith & Wesson street cleaner, described as a pepper fog tear smoke generator loaded with a new super-strength type CS gas just developed by General Ordnance. The street cleaner with Super CS not only sends the meanest troublemakers running, it convinces them not to come back. You can trigger anything from a one-second puff to a ten-minute deluge. Do you have a street cleaner yet? In all fairness, the pepper fogger is not a bad tool, but it's hardly a weapon. It may convince troublemakers not to come back in ten minutes, but wait a few hours and the scum will be back in your face like wild rats. The obvious solution to this problem is to abandon our obsession with tear gas and fill the street cleaner with a nerve agent. CS only slaps at the problem. Nerve gas solves it. Yet the bulk of all advertising in the PC is devoted to tear gas weapons. Federal Laboratories offers the 201 Z gun, along with the Fed 233 emergency kit, featuring speed heat grenades and gas projectiles guaranteed to pierce barricades. The AAI Corporation offers a multi-purpose grenade that can't be thrown back. And from Lake Erie Chemical, we have a new kind of gas mask that protects against CS. This difference is crucial. The ad explains that Army surplus gas masks do well enough against the now obsolete CN gas, but they're virtually useless against CS the powerful irritant agent that more and more departments are turning to, and that's now standard with the National Guard. 
Unfortunately, this is about as far as the police chief goes in terms of weapons or tools information. One of the few interesting items in the non-weapons category is a scrambler for police band car radios, so the enemy can't listen in. With the scrambler, everything will sound like Donald Duck. The only consistently useful function of the PC is the old faithful positions open section. For instance, Charlotte, North Carolina needs a firearms identification expert for the new city-county crime lab. Ellenville, New York is looking for a new chief of police, salary 10500 with liberal fringe benefits. Indeed! And the U.S. Department of Justice is now recruiting special agents for the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. The ad says they need a sizable number of new agents to start at $8,098 per annum with opportunity for premium overtime pay to gross up to $10,000. In my opinion, only a lunatic or a dope addict would do narc work for that kind of money. The hours are brutal and the risks are worse. I once had a friend who went to work as a drug agent for the feds and lost both of his legs. A girl he was trusting put LSD in his beer, then took him to a party where a gang of vicious freaks snapped his femurs with a meat axe. Let's face it, we live in savage times. Not only are cops called pigs, they are treated like swine and eat worse than hogs. Yet the PC still carries advertising for PIG tie clasps. What kind of two-legged scum sucker would wear a thing like that? Why are we groveling? This is the root nut question. Why has the once great police chief turned on its rank and file? Are we dupes? Do the red pansies want to destroy us? If not, why do they mock all we believe in? So it should come as no surprise to the self-proclaimed pigs who put out the police chief that most of us no longer turn to that soggy pink magazine when we're looking for serious information. Personally, I prefer the Shooting Times or Guns and Ammo. Their editorials on gun control are pure balls of fire, and their classified ads offer every conceivable kind of beastly weapon from brass knuckles and blowguns to 20 millimeter cannons. Another fine source of weapons info particularly for the private citizen, is a little-known book called How to Defend Yourself, Your Family, and Your Home, A Complete Guide to Self-Protection. Now here is a book with real class. It explains in 307 pages of fine detail how to set booby traps in your home so that midnight intruders will destroy themselves upon entry. It tells which type of shotgun is best for rapid-fire work in narrow hallways. A sawed-off double-barreled 12-gauge, one barrel loaded with a huge tear gas slug, the other with double-aught buckshot. This book is invaluable to anyone who fears that his home might be invaded at any moment by rioters, rapers, looters, dope addicts, niggers, reds, or any other group. No detail has been spared. Dogs. Alarm wiring, screens, bars, poisons, knives, guns. Ah, yes. This is a wonderful book and highly recommended by the National Police Officers Association of America. This is a very different group from the police chiefs. Very different. But why grapple now with a book of such massive stature? I need time to ponder it and to run tests on the many weapons and devices that appear in the text. No professional would attempt to deal lightly with this book. It is a rare combination of sociology and stone craziness, laced with weapons technology on a level that is rarely encountered. You will want this book, but I want you to know it first. And for that, I need time to deal smartly with the bugger on its own terms. No pro would settle for less. Raul Duke, Master of Weaponry.
Part 4 The Great Shark Hunt From Playboy Magazine, December 1974 4.30 in Cozumel now. Dawn is coming up on these gentle white beaches looking west at the Yucatan Channel. Thirty yards from my patio here at Cabanas del Caribe, the surf is rolling up very softly on the beach out there in the darkness beyond the palm trees. Many vicious mosquitoes and sand fleas out here tonight. There are 60 units in this rambling beachfront hotel, but my room, number 129, is the only one full of light and music and movement. I have both my doors and all four windows propped open, a huge bright magnet for every bug on the island. But I am not being bitten. Every inch of my body, from the soles of my bleeding bandaged feet to the top of my sun-scorched head, is covered with 612 insect repellent, a cheap, foul-smelling oil with no redeeming social or aesthetic characteristics except that it works. These goddamn bugs are all around, settling on the notebook, my wrists, my arms, circling the rim of my tall glass of Bacardi and Yeho and ice. But no bites. It has taken about six days to solve this hellish bug problem, which is excellent news on the one level, but as always, the solution to one problem just peels back another layer and exposes some new and more sensitive area. At this stage of the gig, things like mosquitoes and sand fleas are the least of our worries. Because in about two hours and 22 minutes, I have to get out of this hotel without paying an unnaturally massive bill, drive about three miles down the coast in a rented VW safari that can't be paid for either, and which may not even make it into town due to serious mechanical problems, and then get my technical advisor, Yale Bloor, out of the Maison San Miguel without paying his bill either and then drive us both out to the airport in that goddamn junk safari to catch the 750 Aero Mexico flight to Merida and Monterey, where we'll change planes for San Antonio and Denver. So we are looking at a very heavy day. 2,000 miles between here and home. No cash at all. Ten brutally expensive days in three hotels on the Stryker Aluminum Yachts credit tab which just got jerked out from under us when the local PR team decided we were acting too weird to be what we claimed to be, and so now we are down to about $44 extra between us, with my bill at the Cabanas hovering around $650 and Bloor's at the San Miguel not much less, plus 11 days for that wretched car from the local Avis dealer who already hit me for $40 cash for a broken windshield and God only knows how much he'll demand when he sees what condition his car is in now. Plus about $400 worth of black coral that we ordered up from Chino. Double-thumbed fist, coke spoons, shark's teeth, etc. And that $120 18-karat gold chain at the market. Also Sandy's black coral necklace. We will need all available cash for the black coral deal. So things like hotel bills and car rentals will have to be put off and paid by check, if anybody will take one. Or charged to Stryker Aluminum Yachts, which got me into this goddamn twisted scene in the first place. But the Stryker people are no longer with us. Extreme out-front hostility. Bruce, Joyce, even the bogus Letcher Eduardo. How did we blow the image? Dear Mr. Thompson, here's some background information on the Cozumel Cruise and International Fishing Tournament. Regarding the cruise schedule, about 14 strikers will leave Fort Lauderdale on April 23rd, arriving in Key West that night, leaving Key West midday on the 25th to assure skirting the Cuban coast in the daytime and arriving in Cozumel mid-afternoon on the 27th or 28th. In addition to the proven sail fishing, there will be a marlin-only day on Saturday, May 6th, in the initial attempt on an any-volume basis to determine how good the blue marlin fishing is. Each night during the tournament, there are cocktail parties with over 250 people attending, mariachi and island music, etc. We are happy you can make the trip. Flights leave Miami daily for Cozumel at 2.45 p.m.
You will need a Mexican tourist card, which you can pick up at the Mexican Tourism Department, 100 Biscayne Boulevard, room 612, Miami. There are no shots required. Sincerely, Terrence J. Byrne, Public Relations Representative, Stryker Aluminum Yachts, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Indeed. No shots. Just a tourist card, plenty of copper tone, a new pair of topsiders, and a fine gringo smile for the customs officers. The letter called up visions of heavy sport on the high seas, mano a mano, with giant sailfish and world record marlin. Reeling the bastards in, fighting off sharks with big gaffs, strapped into a soft white naga hide fighting chair in the cockpit of a big power cruiser. Then, back to the harbor at dusk for a brace of gin and tonics, tall drinks in the sunset, lounging around in cool deck chairs while the crew chops up bait and a strolling mariachi band roams on the pier, wailing mournful Olmic love songs. Ah, yes. I was definitely ready for it. Sixteen months of straight politics had left me reeling around on the brink of a nervous breakdown. I needed a change, something totally different from my normal line of work. Covering politics is a vicious, health-ripping ordeal that often requires eight or nine shots at once, twice or three times a week in the peak season. So this unexpected assignment to cover a deep-sea fishing tournament off the Yucatan coast of Mexico was a welcome relief from the horrors of the campaign trail in 1972. Right. Things would be different now. Hot sun, salt air, early to bed and early to rise. This one had all the signs of a high-style bag job. Fly off to the Caribbean as a guest of the idle rich, hang around on their boats for a week or so, then crank out a left-handed story to cover expenses and pay for a new motorcycle back in the Rockies. The story itself was a bit on the hazy side, but the editor at Playboy said not to worry. Almost everybody unfortunate enough to have had any dealings with me since the campaign ended seemed convinced that I was in serious need of a vacation, a cooling-out period, a chance to back off, and this fishing tournament in Cozumel looked just about perfect. It would pry my head out of politics, they said, and force me off in a new direction, out of the valley of death and back toward the land of the living. There was, however, a kink. I had just come back from vacation. It was the first one I'd ever attempted, or at least the first one I'd tried since I was fired from my last regular job on Christmas Day in 1958, when the production manager at Time magazine ripped up my punch card in a stuttering rage and told me to get the fuck out of the building. Since then, I had been unemployed, in the formal sense of that word. And when you've been out of work for 14 years, it's almost impossible to relate to a word like vacation. So, I was extremely nervous when circumstances compelled me in the late winter of 72 to fly to Cozumel with my wife Sandy in order to do nothing at all. Three days later, I ran out of air in a riptide, 90 feet down on Palancar Reef, and I came so close to drowning that they said, later, I was lucky to get off with a serious case of the bends. The nearest decompression chamber was in Miami, so they chartered a plane and flew me there that same night. I spent the next 19 days in a pressurized sphere somewhere in downtown Miami, and when I finally came out, the bill was $3,000. My wife finally located my attorney in a drug commune on the outskirts of Mazatlan. He flew immediately to Florida and had the courts declare me a pauper so I was able to leave without legal problems. I went back to Colorado with the idea of resting for at least six months. But three days after I got home, this assignment came in to cover the fishing tournament. It was a natural, they said because I was already familiar with the island. And besides, I needed a change from politics. Which was true in a way, but I had my own reasons for wanting to go back to Cozumel. On the evening before my near-fatal scuba dive on Palancar Reef, I had stashed 50 units of pure MDA in the adobe wall of the shark pool at the local aquarium next to the Hotel Barracuda. 
and this stash had been much on my mind while I was recovering from the bends in the Miami hospital. So when the Cozumel assignment came through, I drove immediately into town to consult with my old friend and drug crony, Yale Bloor. I explained the circumstances in detail, then asked his advice. It's clear as a fucking bell, he snapped. We'll have to go down there at once. You'll handle the fishermen while I get the drugs. These were the circumstances that sent me back to Cozumel in late April. Neither the editor nor the high-powered sport fishing crowd we'd be dealing with had any notion of my real reason for making the trip. Bloor knew, but he had a vested interest in maintaining the cover because I was passing him off on the tab as my technical advisor. It made perfect sense, I felt. In order to cover a highly competitive situation, you need plenty of trustworthy help. When I got to Cozumel on Monday afternoon, everybody on the island with any clout in the tourism business was half mad with excitement at the idea of having a genuine, real-life playboy writer in their midst for a week or ten days. When I slumped off the plane from Miami, I was greeted like Buffalo Bill on his first trip to Chicago. A whole gaggle of public relations specialists met the plane, and at least three of them were waiting for me. What could they do for me? What did I want? How could they make my life pleasant? Carry my bags? Well, why not? To where? Well, I paused, sensing an unexpected opening that could lead almost anywhere. I think I'm supposed to go to the cabanas, I said, but no, said one of the handlers. You have a press suite at Cozumeleño. I shrugged. Whatever's right, I muttered. Let's roll. I'd asked the travel agent in Colorado to get me one of those VW safari jeeps, the same kind I'd had on my last trip to Cozumel. But the PR crowd at the airport insisted on taking me straight to the hotel. My jeep, they said, would be delivered within the hour, and in the meantime, I was treated like some kind of high-style dignitary. A few people actually addressed me as Mr. Playboy, and the others kept calling me Sir. I was hustled into a waiting car and whisked off along the two-lane blacktop highway through the palm jungle and out in the general direction of the American Strip, a cluster of beachfront hotels on the northeast end of the island. Despite my lame protests, they took me to the newest, biggest, and most expensive hotel on the island, a huge, stark white concrete hulk that reminded me of the Oakland City Jail. We were met at the desk by the manager, the owner, and several hired heavies who explained that the terrible hammering noise I heard was merely the workmen putting the finishing touches on the third floor of what would eventually be a five-story colossus. We have just 90 rooms now, the manager explained, but by Christmas, we will have 300. Jesus God, I muttered. What? Never mind, I said. This is a hell of a thing you're building here. No doubt about that. It's extremely impressive in every way, but the odd fact is that I thought I had reservations down the beach at the Cabanas. I flashed a nice shrug and a smile, ignoring the awkward chill that was already settling on us. The manager coughed up a brittle laugh. The Cabanas? No, senor playboy. The Cosimileño is very different from the Cabanas. Yeah, I said, I can see that right off. The Mayan bellboy had already disappeared with my bags. We saved a junior suite for you, said the manager. I think you'll be satisfied. His English was very precise. His smile was unnaturally thick, and it was clear from a glance at my high-powered welcoming committee that I was going to be their guest for at least one night. And as soon as they forgot about me, I would flee this huge concrete morgue and sneak off to the comfortably run-down palm-shaded piece of the cabanas where I felt more at home. On the drive out from the airport, the PR man who was wearing a blue baseball cap and a stylish blue and white t-shirt, both emblazoned with the lightning flash striker logo, had told me that the owner of this new, huge Cosmoleño Hotel was a member of the island's ruling family. They own about half of it, he said with a grin, and what they don't own, they control absolutely with their fuel license. Fuel license? Yes, yeah, said the PR man. 
They control every gallon of fuel that's sold here, from the gasoline we're driving on right now in this Jeep to the gas in every stove and all the hotel restaurants and even the goddamn jet fuel at the airport. I didn't pay much attention to that talk at the time. It seemed like the same kind of sleazy, power-worshipping bullshit you'd expect to hear from any PR man, anywhere, on any subject, in any situation. My problem was clear from the start. I had come down to Cozumel, officially at least, to cover not just a fishing tournament, but a scene. I'd explain to the editor that big-time sport fishing attracts a certain kind of people, and it was the behavior of these people, not the fishing, that interested me. On my first visit to Cozumel, I'd discovered the fishing harbor completely by accident one night when Sandy and I were driving around the island more or less naked, finally twisted on MDA, and the only reason we located the yacht basin was that I took a wrong turn around midnight and tried, without realizing where I was going, to run a roadblock manned by three Mexican soldiers with submachine guns at the entrance to the island's only airport. It was a hard scene to cope with, as I recall. And now that I look back on it, I suspect that moldy white powder we'd eaten was probably some kind of animal tranquilizer instead of true MDA. There is a lot of PCP on the drug market these days. Anybody who wants to put a horse into a coma can buy it pretty easily from... Well, why blow that, eh? In any case, we were bent. And after being driven away from the airport by armed guards, I took the next available open road and we wound up in the yacht basin, where there was a party going on. I could hear it about a half a mile off, so I homed in on the music and drove across the highway and about 200 yards down a steep grassy embankment to get to the dock. Sandy refused to get out of the jeep, saying that these weren't the kind of people she felt ready to mix with, under the circumstances. So I left her huddled under a blanket on the front seat and walked out onto the dock by myself. It was exactly the kind of scene I'd been looking for. About 35 stone-drunk rich honkies from places like Jacksonville and Pompano Beach, reeling around in this midnight Mexican port on their $200,000 power cruisers and cursing the natives for not providing enough teenage whores to go with the mariachi music. It was a scene of total decadence, and I felt right at home in it. I began mixing with the crowd and trying to hire a boat for the next morning, which proved to be very difficult because nobody could understand what I was saying. What's wrong here, I wondered. Is there speed in this drug? Why can't these people understand me? One of the people I was talking to was the owner of a 60-foot Chris Craft from Milwaukee. He just arrived from Key West that afternoon, he said, and all he seemed to have any real interest in at the moment was the Argentine maid he was grappling with in the cockpit of his boat. She was about 15 years old, had dark blonde hair and red eyes, but it was hard to get a good look at her because Captain Tom, as he introduced himself, was bending her over a styrofoam bait box full of dolphin heads and trying to suck on her collarbone while he talked to me. Finally, I gave up on him and found a local fishing merchant called Fernando Murphy, whose drunkenness was so crude and extreme that we were able to communicate perfectly, even though he spoke little English. No fishing at night, he said. Come to my shop downtown by the plaza tomorrow and I rent you a nice boat. Wonderful, I said. How much? He laughed and fell against a pasty blonde woman from New Orleans who was too drunk to talk. For you, he said, a hundred and forty dollars a day, and I guarantee fish. Why not, I said. I'll be there at dawn. Have the boat ready. Chingado, he screamed. He dropped his drink on the dock and began grappling with his own shoulder blades. I was taken aback at his outburst, not understanding for a moment, until I saw that a laughing 300-pound man wearing Levi's and a red baseball hat in the cockpit of a nearby boat called Black Snapper had hooked the back of Murphy's shirt with a 30-pound marlin rod and was trying to reel him in. Murphy staggered backward, screaming, Chingado! once again, as he fell sideways on the dock and ripped his shirt open. Well, I thought, no point trying to do business with this crowd tonight, and in fact, I never fished on that trip but the general low tone of that party had stayed with me. 
A living caricature of white trash run amuck on foreign shores. An appalling kind of story, but not without a certain human interest quotient. On the first day of the tournament, I spent eight hours at sea aboard the eventual winner, a 54-foot striker called Sundancer, owned by a wealthy middle-aged industrialist named Frank Oliver from Palatka, Florida. Oliver ran a fleet of barges on the inland waterway out of Jacksonville, he said, and Sundancer was the only boat in the Cozumel Harbor flying a Confederate flag. He had about 325,000 in it, including a network of built-in vacuum cleaner wall plugs for the deep pile carpets. And although he said he spent maybe five weeks out of the year on the boat, he was a very serious angler, and he meant to win this tournament. To this end, he had hired one of the world's top fishing captains, a speedy little cracker named Cliff North, and turned Sundancer over to him on a year-round basis. North is a living legend in the sport fishing world, and the idea that Oliver would hire him as his personal captain was not entirely acceptable to the other anglers. One of them explained that it was like some rich weekend duffer hiring Arnold Palmer to shoot the final round of the Greater Cleveland Elks golf tourney for him. North lives on the boat with his wife and two young mates, who do all the menial work, and during the ten months of the year when Oliver's not around, he charters Sundancer out to anybody who can pay the rate. All Cliff has to do in return for this sinecure is make sure Oliver wins the three or four fishing tournaments he finds time to enter each year. Thanks to North and his expert boat handling, Frank Oliver is now listed in the sport fishing record books as one of the world's top anglers. Whether or not Oliver would win any tournaments without North and Sundancer is a subject of widespread disagreement and occasional rude opinion among sport fishing pros. Not even the most egotistical anglers will deny that a good boat and a hot rod captain to handle it are crucial factors in ocean fishing. But there is a definite division of opinion between anglers, who are mainly rich amateurs, and pros, the boat captains and the crews, about the relative value of skills. Most of the pros I talked to in Cozumel were reluctant at first to speak on this subject, at least for the record. But after the third or fourth drink, they would invariably come around to suggesting that anglers were more of a hazard than a help. And, as a general rule of thumb, you could catch more fish by just jamming the rod into a holder on the rear end of the boat and letting the fish do the work. After two or three days on the boats, the most generous consensus I could get from the pros was that even the best angler is worth about a 10% advantage in a tournament, and that most are seen as handicaps. Jesus God Almighty, said a veteran captain from Fort Lauderdale one night in a local hotel bar. You wouldn't believe the things I've seen these fools do. He laughed, but the sound was nervous and his body seemed to shudder as the memories came back on him. One of the people I work for, he said, has a wife who's just flat out crazy. He shook his head wearily. I don't want you to get me wrong now. I love her dearly as a person. But when it comes to fishing, God damn it, I'd like to chop her up and toss her out for the sharks. He took a long hit on his rum and coke. Yeah, I hate to say it, but that's all she's good for. Shark bait and nothing else. Jesus, the other day she almost killed herself. We hooked a big sailfish, and when that happens, you have to move pretty fast, you know. But all of a sudden, I heard her screaming like crazy, and when I looked down from the bridge, she had her hair all tangled up in the reel. He laughed. God damn, can you believe that? She almost got scalped. I had to jump down about 15 feet onto a wet deck in a bad sea. We were wallowing all around and cut the whole line loose with my knife. She came within about ten seconds of having all her hair pulled out. Few anglers, and especially winners like Frank Oliver, agree with the pros' 90-10 split. It's basically a teamwork situation, says Oliver, like a chain with no weak links. The angler, the captain, the mates, the boat, they're all critical. They work like gears with each other. Well, maybe so. Oliver won the tournament with 28 sailfish in the three days that counted. But he was fishing alone on Sundancer, a boat so lavishly outfitted it could have passed for the nautical den in Nelson Rockefeller's Fifth Avenue apartment, 
and with the Arnold Palmer of sport fishing up on the bridge. Most of his competition was fishing in twos and threes on charter boats they were assigned to at random, with wild-tempered, contemptuous captains they'd never even met before yesterday morning. Fishing against Cliff North is bad enough, said Jerry Hogan, captain of a stripped-down hulk of a boat called Lucky Striker. But when you have to go against North and only one angler, with everything set up exactly the way he wants it, that's just about impossible. Which is neither here nor there, in the rules of big-time sport fishing. If B.B. Rebozo decided to borrow a half million dollars from the Pentagon at no interest and enter the Cozumel tournament with the best boat he could buy and a crew of specially trained U.S. Marines, he would compete on the same basis with me if I entered the thing with a 110-year-old Colorado River J-boat and a crew of drug-crazed politicos from the Meat Possum Athletic Club. According to the rules, we'd be equal. And while B.B. could fish alone on his boat, the tournament directors could assign me a nightmarish trio of anglers like Sam Brown, John Mitchell, and Baby Healy. Could we win? Never in hell! But nobody connected with that tournament would ever forget the experience, which is almost what happened anyway for different reasons. By the third day of the tournament, or maybe it was the fourth, I had lost all control of my coverage. At one point, when Bloor ran amuck and disappeared for 30 hours, I was forced to jerk a dope addict out of the island's only nightclub and press him into service as a special observer for Playboy. He spent the final day of the tournament aboard Sundancer, snorting coke in the head and jabbering wildly at North while poor Oliver struggled desperately to maintain his one-fish lead over Hoggins' manic crew on Lucky Striker. Thursday night was definitely the turning point. Whatever rapport Bloor and I had developed with the Striker people was wearing very thin after three days of increasingly strange behavior, and the antisocial attitude we apparently manifested at the big striker cocktail party at the Punta Morena Beach Bar was clearly unacceptable. Almost everybody there was staggering drunk by nightfall, and the ugliness threshold was low. Here were all these heavy anglers, prosperous Florida businessmen for the most part, snarling and snapping at one another like East Harlem street fighters on the eve of a long-awaited rumble. You pot-bellied asshole! You couldn't catch a fish in a goddamn barrel! Watch your stupid lip, fella! That's my wife you just stepped on! Whose wife, fat face? Keep your fucking hands to yourself! Where's the goddamn waiter? Boy! Boy, over here! Get me another drink, will ya? Let me just put it to you this way, my friend. How about a goddamn fish-off? Just you and me, for a thousand bucks, eh? Yeah, how about it? People were lurching around in the sand with plates full of cold macaroni and shrimp sauce. Every now and then, somebody would jerk one of the giant turtles out of the tank on the patio and thrust it in the face of some bleary-eyed bystander, laughing wildly and struggling to hang on to the thing big green flippers clawing frantically at the air and lashing a spray of stale turtle water on everybody within a radius of ten feet. Here, I want you to meet my friend. She'll do a real job on your pecker. How horny are you? It was not a good scene to confront with a head full of acid. We drank heavily, trying to act natural, but the drug set us clearly apart. Bloor became obsessed with the notion that we'd stumbled into a gathering of drunken greed heads who were planning to turn Cozumel into a Mexican Miami beach, which was true to a certain extent, but he pursued it with a zeal that churned up angry resentment in every conversation he wandered into. At one point, I found him shouting at the manager of the hotel he was staying in. You're just a bunch of goddamn money-grubbing creeps! All this bullshit about tourism and development... What the hell do you want here? Another Aspen? The hotel man was baffled. What is Aspen, he asked. What are you talking about? You know goddamn well what I'm talking about, you sleazy bastard, Bloor shouted. These dirty concrete hotels you're building all over the beach, these dirty little hot dog stands, and I hurried across the patio and grabbed him by the shoulder. Never mind, Yale, I said, trying to focus at least one of my eyes on whoever he was talking to. He's still not adjusted to this altitude. I tried to smile at them, but I could sense it wasn't working. A drugged grimace, wild eyes, and very jerky movements. 
I could hear myself talking, but the words made no sense. These goddamned iguanas are all over the road. We did a 180 back there at the U-turn. Gale grabbed the emergency brake when he saw all those lizards jerked it right out by the root. Thank Christ we had those snow tires. We live at 5,000 feet, you know, damn little air pressure up there. But down here at sea level, you feel it squeezing your brain like a vice. No way to escape it. You can't even think straight. Nobody smiled. I was babbling out of control and Bloor was still yelling about land rapers. I left him and went to the bar. We're leaving, I said. But I want some ice for the road. The bartender gave me a Pepsi Cola cup full of melting shavings. We'll need more than that, I said. So he filled up another cup. He spoke no English, but I could grasp what he was trying to tell me. There was no container available for the amount of ice I wanted, and they were almost out of ice anyway. My head was beginning to pulsate violently at this point. I could barely keep a focus on his face. Rather than argue, I went out to the parking lot and drove the safari through a screen of small beech trees and up onto the patio, parking it right in front of the bar and indicating to the stunned bartender that I wanted the back seat filled with ice. The striker crowd was appalled. You crazy son of a bitch, someone yelled. You mashed about 15 trees. I nodded, but the words didn't register. All I could think about was ice, throwing one cup load after another into the back seat. The acid by this time had fucked up my vision to the point where I was seeing square out of one eye and round out of the other. It was impossible to focus on anything. I seemed to have four hands. The bartender had not been lying. The Punta Morena ice vat was virtually empty. I scraped a few more cup loads out of the bottom, hearing Bloor's angry cursing somewhere above and behind me. Then I jumped over the counter and into the front seat of the Jeep. Nobody seemed to notice. So I gunned the engine violently and leaned on the horn as I crept very slowly in first gear through the mashed trees and shrubbery. Loud voices seemed to be looming down on me from the rear and suddenly Bloor was climbing over the back yelling, Get moving, goddammit! Get moving! I stomped on the accelerator, and we fishtailed out of the deep sand parking lot. Thirty minutes later, after a top-speed, bug-spattered run all the way to the other side of the island, we rolled into the parking lot of what appeared to be a nightclub. Bloor had calmed down a bit, but he was still in a high, wild condition as we lurched to a stop about five feet from the door. I could hear loud music inside. We need a few drinks, I muttered. My tongue feels like an iguana's been chewing on it. Bloor stepped out. Keep the engine running, he said. I'll check the place out. He disappeared inside, and I leaned back on the seat to stare straight up at the star-crazed sky. It seemed about six feet above my eyes. Or maybe sixty feet, or six hundred. I couldn't be sure, and it didn't matter anyway because by that time, I was convinced I was in the cockpit of a 727 coming into L.A. at midnight. Jesus, I thought. I am ripped right straight to the tits. Where am I? Are we going up or down? Somewhere in the back of my brain, I knew I was sitting in a Jeep in the parking lot of a nightclub on an island off the Mexican coast, but how could I really be sure, with another part of my brain apparently convinced that I was looking down on the huge, glittering bowl of Los Angeles from the cockpit of a 727? Was that the Milky Way, or Sunset Boulevard, Orion, or the Beverly Hills Hotel? Who gives a fuck, I thought. It's a fine thing to just lie back and stare up or down at. My eyeballs felt cool. My body felt rested. Then Bloor was yelling at me again. Wake up, goddammit! Park the car and let's go inside. I've met some wonderful people. The rest of that night is very hazy in my memory. The inside of the club was loud and almost empty, except for the people Bloor had met who turned out to be two half-mad coke runners with a big silver can full of white powder. When I sat down at the table, one of them introduced himself as Frank and said, Here, I think you need something for your nose. Why not, I said, accepting the can he tossed into my lap. And I also need some rum. I yelled at the waiter and then opened the can, despite a rustle of protests around the table. 
I looked down at my lap, ignoring Frank's nervous behavior, and thought, Zang! This is definitely not Los Angeles. We must be somewhere else. I was staring down at what looked like a whole ounce of pure, glittering white cocaine. My first instinct was to jerk a 100 peso note out of my pocket and quickly roll it up for snorting purposes, but by this time, Frank had his hand on my arm. For Christ's sake, he was whispering, don't do that shit here. Take it into the bathroom. Which I did. It was a difficult trip through all those chairs and tables, but I finally managed to lock myself in the toilet stall and start lashing the stuff up my nose with no thought at all of the ominous noise I was making. It was like kneeling down on a beach and sticking a straw into the sand. After five minutes or so, both my nostrils were locked up like epoxy, and I hadn't even made a visible depression in the dune right in front of my eyes. Good God, I thought. This can't be true. I must be hallucinating. By the time I staggered back to the table, the others had calmed down. It was obvious that Bloor had already been into the can, so I handed it back to Frank with a twisted smile. Be careful with this stuff, I mumbled. It'll turn your brain to jelly. He smiled. What are you people doing here? You'd never believe it, I replied, accepting a tall glass of rum from the waiter. The band was taking a break now, and two of the musicians had wandered over to our table. Frank was saying something about a party later on. I shrugged, still fighting to clear my nasal passages with quick sniffs of rum. I sensed that this latest development might have serious consequences for the future of my story, but I was no longer especially concerned about that. From somewhere down deep in my memory... I heard a snatch of some half-remembered conversation between a construction worker and a bartender at a bar in Colorado. The construction man was explaining why he shouldn't have another drink. You can't wallow with the pigs at night and then soar with the eagles in the morning, he said. I thought briefly on this, then shrugged it off. My own situation was totally different, I felt. In about three hours, I was supposed to be down on the docks with my camera and tape recorder to spend another day on one of those goddamn boats. No, I thought. That geek in Colorado had it all wrong. The real problem is how to wallow with the eagles at night and then soar with the pigs in the morning. In any case, it made no difference. For a variety of good reasons, I missed my boat the next morning and spent the afternoon passed out in the sand on an empty beach about ten miles out of town. By Friday night, it was clear that the story was not only a dry hole, but maybe even a dry socket. Our most serious problem had to do with the rat-bastard tedium of spending eight hours a day out at sea in the boiling sun, being tossed around on the bridge of a high-powered motorboat, and watching middle-aged businessmen reeling sailfish up to the side of the boat every once in a while. Both Bloor and I had spent a full day at sea, on the only boats in the tournament getting any real action, Sundancer and Lucky Striker, and by dusk on Friday, we had pretty well come to the conclusion that deep-sea fishing is not one of your King Hell spectator sports. I've watched a lot of bad acts in my time, from tag team pro wrestling in Flomaton, Alabama, to the roller derby on Oakland TV and intramural softball tournaments at Scott Air Force Base in Illinois. But I'm damned if I can remember anything as insanely fucking dull as that third annual international Cozumel fishing tournament. The only thing that comes close to it in recent memory is an afternoon I spent last March in a traffic jam on the San Diego freeway. But even that had a certain adrenaline factor. By the end of the second hour, I was so crazy with rage that I cracked the top half of the steering wheel off my rented Mustang, then exploded the water pump by racing the engine at top speed and finally abandoned the mess altogether in the outside lane about two miles north of the Newport Beach exit. It was Saturday afternoon, I think, when the brain fog had cleared enough for a long, clean focus on our situation which had been drastically altered at that point by three nights of no sleep and a handful of spastic confrontations with the striker crowd. 
I'd been thrown out of one hotel and moved to another, and Bloor had been threatened with jail or deportation by the manager of his hotel on the Midtown Square. I had managed another zombie-like day at sea with massive aid from Frank's can, but our relationship with the striker people was apparently beyond redemption. Nobody connected with the tournament would have anything to do with us. We were treated like lepers. The only people we felt easy with at that point were a motley collection of local freaks, boozers, hustlers, and black coral divers who seemed to collect each afternoon on the porch of the Ball High, the town's main bar. They quickly befriended us, a sudden shift in old relationships with the island that caused me to begin signing all the tabs, splitting them about half and half between Striker and Playboy. Nobody seemed to care, especially the ever-growing crowd of new friends who came to drink with us. These people understood and were vaguely amused at the idea that we'd fallen into serious disfavor with the Strikers and the local power structure. For the past three sleepless days... We'd been gathering at the Balhai to brood publicly on the likelihood of massive retaliation by local jefes incensed by our rotten behavior. It was sometime around dusk on Saturday, hunkered down at a big round table on the Balhai porch, that I noticed the pea-green Mustang making its second pass in less than ten minutes. There's only one pea-green Mustang on the island, and one of the divers had told me it belonged to the mayor a heavy-set young Paul, and an appointed, not-elected official who looked like a beer-bellied lifeguard on some beach at Acapulco. We had seen him often in the past few days, usually in the late afternoon, and always cruising up and down the seaside frontera. That son of a bitch is beginning to make me nervous, Bloor muttered. Don't worry, I said. They won't shoot, not as long as we're here in a crowd. What? A gray-haired woman from Miami sitting next to us had caught the word shoot. It's the striker crowd, I explained. We hear they've decided to get heavy with us. Jesus Christ, said a retired airline pilot who'd been living off his boat and the ball high porch for the past few months. You don't think they'll start shooting, do you? Not on a peaceful island like this. I shrugged. Not here. They wouldn't shoot into a crowd. But we can't let them catch us alone. The woman from Miami started to say something, but Bloor cut her off with an outburst that spun heads the length of the porch. They're in for the shock of their goddamn lives tomorrow, he snarled. Wait till they see what gets off that goddamn ferry from Playa del Carmen in the morning. What the hell are you talking about, the ex-pilot asked. Bloor said nothing, staring blankly out to sea. I hesitated a moment, then instinctively picked up the thread. Heavies, I said. We made some calls last night. Tomorrow morning, they'll come off that boat like a pack of goddamn wolverines. Our friends at the table were glancing nervously at one another. Violent crime is almost unheard of on Cozumel. The native oligarchy is into far more subtle varieties. And the idea that the Balhai might be the scene of a Chicago-style shootout was a hard thing to grasp, even for me. Bloor cut in again, still staring off toward the mainland. You can hire just about anything you want in Merida, he said. We got these thugs for ten bucks a head, plus expenses. They'll crack every skull on the island if they have to, then burn every one of those goddamn redneck boats right down to the waterline. Nobody spoke for a moment. Then the woman from Miami and the retired airline pilot got up to leave. See you later, the man said stiffly. We have to get back to the boat and check things out. Moments later, the two divers who'd been sitting with us also left, saying they'd probably see us tomorrow at the striker party. Don't count on it, Bloor muttered. They grinned nervously and sped off down the frontera on their tiny Hondas. We were left alone at the big round table, sipping margaritas and staring out at the sunset over the Yucatan Peninsula, 12 miles across the channel. After a few long moments of silence, Bloor reached into his pocket and came up with a hollowed-out glass eye he'd bought from one of the street peddlers. There was a silver cap on the back, and he flipped it up, then jammed the straw from his margarita into the hole and snorted heavily before handing it over to me. Here, he said. Try some of Frank's best.
The waiter was hovering over us, but I ignored him until I realized I was having problems. Then I looked up from the eyeball in my hand and asked for two more drinks and a dry straw. Como no, he hissed, moving quickly away from the table. This thing's all jammed up from the moisture, I said to Bloor, showing him the powder-packed straw. We'll have to slice it open. Never mind, he said. There's plenty more where that came from. I nodded, accepting a fresh drink and about six dry straws from the waiter. You notice how fast our friends left, I said, bearing down on the eyeball again? I suspect they believed all that gibberish. He sipped his own new drink and stared at the glass eye in my hand. Why shouldn't they, he mumbled. I'm beginning to believe it myself. I felt a great numbness in the back of my mouth and my throat as I snapped the cap shut and handed the eyeball back to him. Don't worry, I said. We're professionals. Keep that in mind. I am, he said. But I'm afraid they might figure that out. It was late Saturday night, as I recall, when we learned that Frank Oliver had officially won the tournament. By one fish, ahead of the balls-out poor boy crew on Lucky Striker. I wrote this down in my notebook as we roamed around the dock where the boats were tied up. Nobody urged us to come aboard for a friendly drink, as I heard some of the anglers put it to others on the dock, and in fact, there were only a few people who spoke to us at all. Frank and his friend were sipping beers at the open bar nearby, but his kind of hospitality was not in tune with this scene. Jack Daniels and heavy petting on the foredeck is about as heavy as the striker crowd gets. And after a week of mounting isolation from this scene I was supposed to be covering, I was hung on the dark and ugly truth that my story was fucked. Not only did the boat people view me with gross disapproval, but most of them no longer even believed I was working for Playboy. All they knew for sure was that there was something very strange and off-center, to say the least, about me and all my assistants. Which was true, in a sense, and this feeling of alienation on both sides was compounded on ours by a galloping, drug-induced paranoia that honed each small incident, with every passing day, to a grim and fearful edge. The paranoid sense of isolation was bad enough, along with trying to live in two entirely different worlds at the same time. But the worst problem of all was the fact that I'd spent a week on this goddamn wretched story and I still didn't have the flimsiest notion of what deep-sea fishing felt like. I had no idea what it was like to actually catch a big fish. All I'd seen was a gang of frantic redneck businessmen occasionally hauling dark shadows up to the side of various boats just close enough to where some dollar-an-hour mate could cut the leader and score a point for the angler. During the whole week, I'd never seen a fish out of the water, except on the rare occasions when a hooked sailfish had jumped for an instant a hundred or so yards from the boat before going under again for the long reeling-in trip that usually took ten or fifteen minutes of silent struggle and always ended with the fish either slipping the hook or being dragged close enough to the boat to be tagged and then cut loose. The anglers assured me it was all a great thrill, but on the evidence, I couldn't believe it. The whole idea of fishing, it seemed to me, was to hook a thrashing sea monster of some kind and actually boat the bastard, and then eat it. All the rest seemed like dilettante bullshit, like hunting wild boar with a can of spray paint from the safety of a pickup truck. And it was this half-crazed sense of frustration that led me finally to start wandering around the docks and trying to hire somebody to take me and Bloor out at night to fish for man-eating sharks. It seemed like the only way to get a real feel for this sport, to fish or hunt for something genuinely dangerous, a beast that would tear your leg off in an instant if you made the slightest mistake. This concept was not widely understood on the dock in Cozumel. The businessmen anglers saw no point in getting the cockpits of their expensive tubs messed up with real blood, and especially not theirs. But I finally found two takers. Jerry Hogan on Lucky Striker and a local Mayan captain who worked for Fernando Murphy. Both of these efforts ended in disaster. 
for entirely different reasons and also at different times. But for the record, I feel a powerful obligation to record at least a brief observation about our shark hunting expeditions off the coast of Cozumel. The first is that I saw more sharks by accident while scuba diving during the daylight hours than I did during either of our elaborate big-money nighttime hunts off the fishing boats. And the second is that anybody who buys anything more complex or expensive than a bottle of beer on the waterfront of Cozumel is opting for serious trouble. Cerveza Superior at 75 cents a bottle on the porch of the Bow High is a genuine bargain, if only because you know what you're getting, compared with the insanely and even fatally inept deep-sea fishing and scuba diving tours offered at dockside shacks like El Timon or Fernando Murphy's. These people rent boats to dumb gringos for $140 a day or night, and then take you out to sea and dump you over the side with faulty diving gear and shark-filled waters during the day, or run you around in circles during the night. A Fernando Murphy specialty, while allegedly trolling for sharks about 500 yards offshore. There are plenty of bologna sandwiches while you wait for a strike, unable to communicate verbally with the guilt-stricken Mayan mate or the Mayan captain up top, who both understand what kind of a shuck they are running, but who are only following Fernando Murphy's orders. Meanwhile, Murphy is back in town playing maitre d' at his Tijuana-style nightclub, La Piñata. We found Murphy at his nightclub after spending six useless hours at sea on one of his boats and came close to getting beaten and jailed when we noisily ruined the atmosphere of the place by accusing him of outright thievery on the grounds of what his hired fishermen had already admitted he'd done to us. And the only thing that kept us from getting stomped by Murphy's heavies was the timely popping off of flashbulbs by an American photographer. There is nothing quite like the sudden white flash of a professional gringo camera to paralyze the brain of a Mexican punk long enough for the potential victims to make a quick, nonviolent exit. We were counting on this, and it worked. A sorry end to the only attempt we ever made to hire local fishermen for a shark hunt. Murphy had his $140 cash in advance. We had our harsh object lesson in commercial dealings on the Cozumel dock, and with the photos in the can, we understood the wisdom of leaving the island at once. Our other nighttime shark hunt with Jerry Hogan on Lucky Striker, was a totally different kind of experience. It was at least an honest value. Hogan and his two-man crew were the hippies of the Striker fleet, and they took me and Bloor out one night for a serious shark hunt, a strange adventure that nearly sunk their boat when they hooked a reef in pitch darkness about a mile out at sea and which ended with all of us up on the bridge while a four-foot nurse shark flopped crazily around in the cockpit even after Hogan had shot it four times in the head with a forty-five automatic. Looking back on all that, my only feeling for deep-sea fishing is one of absolute and visceral aversion. Hemingway had the right idea when he decided that a forty-five caliber submachine gun was the proper tool for shark fishing, but he was wrong about his targets. Why shoot innocent fish when the guilty walk free along the docks renting boats for $140 a day to drunken dupes who call themselves sport fishermen. Our departure from the island was not placid. The rough skeleton of the plan, as I conceived it with a head full of MDA on the night before, was to wait until about an hour before the first early morning flight to Merida on Aeromexico, then jump both our hotel bills by checking out in a raving frenzy at dawn at the end of the night clerk shift and signing Playboy slash Striker Aluminum Yachts on both bills. I felt this bogus duel imprimatur would be heavy enough to confuse both desk clerks long enough for us to reach the airport and make the escape. Our only other problem, except for connecting with the black coral wizard who was expecting at least $300 cash for the work we'd assigned him, was dumping the Avis rental jeep at the airport no more than three minutes before boarding time. 
I knew that the local Avis people would have me under observation by the same shadowy observer who'd nailed me on the broken windshield charge. But I also knew he'd be watching us long enough to know we were both late risers. He would set his psychic work clock, I felt, to coincide with our traditional noon-to-dawn working hours. I also knew that the hours he'd been keeping for the past week were so far off his normal wake-sleep schedule that by now he was probably a nervous, jabbering mess from trying to keep up with a gang of wild gringos fueled from an apparently bottomless satchel full of speed, acid, MDA, and cocaine. It boiled down to a question of armaments, or lack of them, and their long-term effects in the crunch. Looking back on my experience over the years, I was confident of being able to function at peak performance level, at least briefly, after 80 or 90 hours without sleep. There were negative factors, of course. 80 or 90 hours of continuous boozing, along with sporadic energy-slash-adrenaline sappers like frantic, rock-dodging swims in the high surf at night, and sudden, potentially dangerous confrontations with hotel managers... But on balance, I felt, the drug factor gave us a clear-cut advantage. In any 24-hour period, a determined private eye can muster the energy to keep pace with veteran drug users. But after 48 straight hours, and especially after 72, fatigue symptoms began manifesting drastically. Hallucinations, hysteria, massive nerve failure. After 72 hours, both the body and the brain are so badly depleted that only sleep will make the nut, while your habitual drug user, long accustomed to this weird and frenzied pace, is still hoarding at least three hours of high-speed reserve. There was no question in my mind, once the plane was finally airborne out of Cozumel, about what to do with the drugs. I had eaten three of the remaining five caps of MDA during the night, and Bloor had given our hash and all but six of his purple pills to the black coral wizard as a bonus for his all-night efforts. As we zoomed over the Yucatan Channel at 8,000 feet, we took stock of what we had left. Two hits of MDA, six tabs of acid, about a gram and a half of raw cocaine, four reds, and a random handful of speed. That, plus $44 and a desperate hope, that Sandy had made and paid for our reservations beyond Monterey, Mexico, was all we had between Cozumel and our refuge-slash-destination at Sam Brown's house in Denver. We were airborne out of Cozumel at 8.13 a.m., mountain daylight time, and if everything went right, we would arrive at Denver's Stapleton International Airport before 7. We'd been airborne for about eight minutes when I looked over at Bloor and told him what I'd been thinking. We don't have enough drugs here to risk carrying them through customs, I said. He nodded thoughtfully. Well, we're pretty well fixed for poor boys. Yeah, I replied, but I have my professional reputation to uphold, and there's only two things I've never done with drugs. Sell them or take them through customs, especially when we can replace everything we're holding for about $99 just as soon as we get off the plane. He hunkered down in his seat, saying nothing. Then he stared across at me. What are you saying? That we should just throw all this shit away? I thought for a moment. No. I think we should eat it. What? Yeah, why not? They can't bust you for what's already dissolved in your belly, no matter how weird you're acting. Jesus Christ, he muttered. We'll go stark raving nuts if we eat all this shit. I shrugged. Keep in mind where we'll be when we hit customs, I said. San Antonio, Texas. Are you ready to get busted in Texas? He stared down at his fingernails. Remember Tim Leary, I said? Ten years for three ounces of grass in his daughter's panties? He nodded. Jesus. Texas! I'd forgotten about that. Not me, I said. When Sandy went through customs in San Antonio about three weeks ago, they tore everything she was carrying apart. It took her two hours to put it back together. I could see him thinking. Well, he said finally, what if we eat this stuff and go crazy? And they nail us. Nothing, I said. We'll drink heavily. If we're seized, 
The stewardesses will testify we were drunk. He thought for a moment, then laughed. Yeah, just a couple of good old boys OD'd on booze. Nasty drunks staggering back into the country after a shameful vacation in Mexico. Totally fucked up. Right, I said. They can strip us down to the skin. It's no crime to enter the country helplessly drunk. He laughed. You're right. What do we start with? We shouldn't eat it all at once. That's too heavy. I nodded, reaching into my pocket for the MDA and offering him one as I tossed the other into my mouth. Let's eat some of the acid now, too, I said. That way we'll be adjusted to it by the time we have to eat the rest, and we can save the coke for emergencies. Along with the speed, he said. How much do you have left? Ten hits, I said. Pure white amphetamine powder. It'll straighten us right out if things get tense. You should save that for the end, he said. We can use this coke if we start getting messy. I swallowed the purple pill, ignoring the Mexican stewardess with her tray of sangria. I'll have two, said Bloor, reaching across me. Same here, I said, lifting two more off the tray. Bloor grinned at her. Pay no attention, we're just tourists, down here making fools of ourselves. Moments later, we hit down on the runway at Merida. It was a quick and painless stop. By 9 a.m., we were cruising over central Mexico at 20,000 feet, headed for Monterey. The plane was half empty, and we could have moved around if we wanted to, but I glanced across at Bloor, trying to use him as a mirror for my own condition, and decided that wandering around in the aisles would not be wise. Making yourself noticeable is one thing, but causing innocent passengers to shrink off with feelings of shock and repugnance is a different game entirely. One of the few things that can't be controlled about acid is the glitter it puts in the eyes. No amount of booze will cause the same kind of laughing, that fine predatory glow that comes with the first rush of acid up the spine. But Bloor felt like moving. Where's the goddamn head, he muttered. Never mind, I said. We're almost to Monterey. Don't attract attention. We have to check through immigration there. He straightened up in his seat. Immigration? Nothing serious, I said. Just turn in our tourist cards and see about the tickets to Denver. But we'll have to act straight. Why, he asked. I gave it some thought. Why, indeed. We were clean, or almost clean, anyway. About an hour out of Merida, we'd eaten another round of acid, which left us with two more of those, plus four reds and the coke and the speed. The luck of the split had left me with the speed and the acid. Bloor had the coke and the reds. And by the time the abroche su cinturon, fastened seatbelt sign, flashed on above Monterey, we'd agreed, more or less, that anything we hadn't eaten by the time we got to Texas would have to be flushed down the stainless steel john in the plane's lavatory. It had taken about 45 tortured minutes to reach this agreement because by that time, neither one of us could speak clearly. I tried to whisper through gritted teeth, but each time I succeeded in uttering a coherent sentence, my voice seemed to echo around the cabin like I was mumbling into a bullhorn. At one point, I leaned over as close as possible to Bloor's ear and hissed, Reds, how many? But the sound of my own voice was such a shock that I recoiled in horror and tried to pretend I'd said nothing. Was the stewardess staring? I couldn't be sure. Blurred seemed not to notice, but suddenly he was thrashing around in his seat and clawing frantically underneath himself with both hands. What the fuck, he was screaming. Quiet, I snapped. What's wrong with you? He was jerking at his seatbelt, still shouting. The stewardess ran down the aisle and unbuckled it for him. There was fear in her face as she backed off and watched him spring out of his seat. God damn, you clumsy bastard, he yelled. I stared straight ahead. Jesus, I thought. He's blowing it. He can't handle the acid. I should have abandoned this crazy bastard in Cozumel. I felt my teeth grinding as I tried to ignore his noise. Then I glanced across and saw him groping between the seats and coming up with a smoldering cigarette butt. Look at this, he shouted at me. He was holding the butt in one hand and fondling the back of his thigh with the other. Burned a big hole in my pants, he was saying. He just spit this dirty thing right down in my seat. 
What, I said, feeling in front of my mouth for the cigarette and my filter. But the filter was empty, and I suddenly understood. The fog in my brain suddenly cleared, and I heard myself laughing. I warned you about these goddamn bonanzas, I said. They'll never stick in the filter. The stewardess was pushing him back down into his seat. Fasten belts, she kept saying. Fasten belts. I grabbed his arm and jerked downward, pulling him off balance and causing him to fall heavily onto the back of the seat. It gave way and collapsed on the legs of whoever was sitting behind us. The stewardess jerked it quickly back to the upright position, then reached down to fasten Bloor's seat belt. I saw his left arm snake out and settle affectionately around her shoulders. Good God, I thought. This is it. I could see the headlines in tomorrow's news. Drug fracas on airliner near Monterey. Gringos jailed on arson, assault charges. But the stewardess only smiled and backed off a few steps, dismissing Bloor's crude advance with a slap at his arm and an icy professional smile. I tried to return it, but my face was not working properly. Her eyes narrowed. She was clearly more insulted by the demented grin I was trying now to fix on her than she was by Bloor's attempt to push her head down into his lap. He smiled happily as she stalked away. That'll teach you, he said. You're a goddamn nightmare to travel with. The acid was leveling out now. I could tell by the tone of his voice that he was into the manic stage. No more of that jerky, paranoid whispering. He was feeling confident now. His face had settled into that glaze of brittle serenity you invariably see on the face of a veteran acid eater who knows that the first rush is past, and now he can settle down for about six hours of real fun. I was not quite there myself, but I knew it was coming, and we still had about seven more hours and two plane changes between now and Denver. I knew the immigration scene at Monterey was only a formality, just stand in line for a while with all the other gringos and not get hysterical when the cop at the gate asks for your tourist card. We could ease through that one, I felt, on the strength of long experience. Anybody who's still on the street after seven or eight years of public acid eating has learned to trust his adrenaline gland for getting through routine confrontations with officialdom. Traffic citations, bridge tolls, airline ticket counters. And we had one of these coming up, getting our baggage off this plane and not losing it in the airport until we found out which flight would take us to San Antonio and Denver. Bloor was traveling light with only two bags. But I had my normal heavy load, two huge leather suitcases, a canvas sea bag, and tape recorder with two portable speakers. If we were going to lose anything, I wanted to lose it north of the border. The Monterey Airport is a cool, bright little building, so immaculately clean and efficient that we were almost immediately lulled into a condition of grinning euphoria. Everything seemed to be working perfectly. No lost baggage, no sudden outbursts of wild jabbering at the immigration desk, no cause for panic or fits of despair at the ticket counter. Our first-class reservations had already been made and confirmed all the way to Denver. Bloor had been reluctant to blow 32 extra dollars just to sit up front with the businessmen, but I felt it was necessary. There's a lot more latitude for weird behavior in first class, I told him, the stewardesses back in the tourist section don't have as much experience, so they're more likely to freak out if they think they have a dangerous nut on their hands. He glared at me. Do I look like a dangerous nut? I shrugged. It was hard to focus on his face. We were standing in a corridor outside the souvenir shop. You look like a serious dope addict, I said finally. Your hair is all wild, your eyes are glittering, your nose is all red... And I suddenly noticed white powder on the top edge of his mustache. You swine! You've been into the coke! He grinned blankly. Why not? Just a little pick-me-up. I nodded. Yeah, just wait till you start explaining yourself to the customs agent in San Antonio with white powder drooling out of your nose. I laughed. Have you ever seen those big bullet-nosed flashlights they use for rectal searches? He was rubbing his nostrils vigorously. Where's the drugstore? I'll get some of that Dristan nasal spray. 
He reached into his back pocket and I saw his face turn gray. Jesus, he hissed. I've lost my wallet. He kept fumbling in his pockets, but no wallet turned up. Good God, he moaned. It's still on the plane. His eyes flashed wildly around the airport. Where's the gate, he snapped. The wallet must be under the seat. I shook my head. No, it's too late. What? The plane. I saw it take off while you were in the restroom snorting up the coke. He thought for a moment, then uttered a loud, wavering howl. My passport! All my money! I have nothing! They'll never let me back into the country with no ID! I smiled. Ridiculous. I'll vouch for you. Shit, he said. You're crazy! You look crazy! Let's go find the bar, I said. We have 45 minutes. What? The drunker you get, the less it'll bother you, I said. The best thing right now is for you to get weeping, falling down drunk. I'll swear you staggered in front of a moving plane on the runway in Merida, and a jet engine sucked the coat right off your back and into its turbine. The whole thing seemed absurd. Your wallet was in the coat, right? I was a witness. It was all I could do to keep your whole body from being sucked into the turbine. I was laughing wildly now. The scene was very vivid. I could almost feel the terrible drag of the suction as we struggled to dig our heels into the hot asphalt runway. Somewhere in the distance, I could hear the wail of a mariachi band above the roar of the engines, sucking us ever closer to the whirling blades. I could hear the wild screech of a stewardess as she watched helplessly. A Mexican soldier with a machine gun was trying to help us, but suddenly he was sucked away like a leaf in the wind. Wild screams all around us, then a sickening thump as he disappeared feet first into the black maw of the turbine. The engine seemed to stall momentarily, then spit a nasty shower of hamburger and bone splinters all over the runway. More screaming from behind us as Bloor's coat ripped away. I was holding him by one arm when another soldier with a machine gun began firing at the plane, first at the cockpit and then at the murderous engine which suddenly exploded like a bomb going off right in front of us. The blast hurled us 200 feet across the tarmac and through a wire mesh fence. Jesus, what a scene! A fantastic tale to lay on the customs agent in San Antonio. And then, officer, while we were lying there on the grass, too stunned to move, another engine exploded, and then another. Huge balls of fire! It was a miracle that we escaped with our lives. Yes, so you'll have to make some allowance for Mr. Bloor's unsteady condition right now. He was badly shaken, half hysterical most of the afternoon. I want to get him back to Denver and put him under sedation. I was so caught up in this terrible vision that I'd failed to notice Bloor down on his knees until I heard him shout. He'd spread the contents of his kit bag all over the floor of the corridor, rummaging through the mess, and now he was smiling happily at the wallet in his hand. You found it, I said. He nodded, clutching it with both hands as if it might leap out of his grip with the strength of a half-captured lizard and disappear across the crowded lobby. I looked around and saw that people were stopping to watch us. My mind was still whirling from the fiery hallucination that had seized me, but I was able to kneel down and help Bloor stuff his belongings back into the kit bag. We're attracting a crowd, I muttered. Let's get to the bar where it's safe. Moments later, we were sitting at a table overlooking the runway, sipping margaritas and watching the ground crew load the 727 that would take us to San Antonio. My plan was to stay hunkered down in the bar until the last moment, then dash for the plane. Our luck had been excellent so far, but that scene in the lobby had triggered a wave of paranoia in my head. I felt very conspicuous, Bloor's mannerisms were becoming more and more psychotic. He took one sip of his drink, then whacked it down onto the table and stared at me. What is this, he snarled. A double margarita, I said, glancing over at the waitress to see if she had her eye on us. She did, and Bloor waved at her. What do you want, I whispered. Glaucoma, he said. The waitress was on us before I could argue. Glaucoma is an extremely complicated mix of about nine unlikely ingredients that Bloor had learned from some randy old woman he met on the porch of the Baal High. 
she taught the bartender there how to make it. Very precise measurements of gin, tequila, Kahlua, crushed ice, fruit juices, lime rinds, spices, all mixed to perfection in a tall frosted glass. It is not the kind of drink you want to order in an airport bar with a head full of acid and a noticeable speech impediment. Especially when you can't speak the local language and you just spilled the first drink you ordered all over the table. But Bloor persisted. When the waitress abandoned all hope, he walked over to speak with the bartender. I slumped in my chair, keeping an eye on the plane and hoping it was almost ready to go. But they hadn't even loaded the baggage yet. Departure time was still 20 minutes away. Plenty of time for some minor incident to mushroom into serious trouble. I watched Bloor talking to the bartender, pointing to various bottles behind the bar and occasionally using his fingers to indicate measurements. The bartender was nodding his head patiently. Finally, Bloor came back to the table. He's making it, he said. I'll be back in a minute. I have business. I ignored him. My mind was drifting again. Two days and nights without sleep, plus a steady diet of mind-altering drugs and double margaritas were beginning to affect my alertness. I ordered another drink and stared out at the hot brown hills beyond the runway. The bar was comfortably air-conditioned, but I could feel the warm sun through the window. Why worry, I thought. We've survived the worst. All we have to do now is not miss that plane out there. Once we're across the border, the worst that can happen is a nightmarish fuck-around at Customs in San Antonio. Maybe even a night in jail, but what the hell? A few misdemeanor charges? Public drunkenness? Disturbing the peace? Resisting arrest? But nothing serious. No felony. All the evidence for that would be eaten by the time we landed in Texas. My only real worry was the chance that there might already be grand larceny charges filed against us in Cozumel. We had, after all, jumped two hotel bills, totaling about 15,000 pesos, in addition to leaving that half-destroyed Avis Jeep in the airport parking lot, another 15,000 pesos, and we'd spent the past four or five days in the constant company of a flagrant, big-volume drug runner whose every movement and contact, for all we knew, might have been watched or even photographed by Interpol agents. Where was Frank now? Safe at home in California? are jailed in Mexico City, swearing desperate ignorance about how all those cans of white powder got into his luggage? I could almost hear it. You've got to believe me, Captain. I went down to Cozumel to check on a land investment. I was sitting in a bar one night, minding my own business, when all of a sudden these two drunken acid freaks sat down next to me and said they worked for Playboy. One of them had a handful of purple pills, and I was stupid enough to eat one. The next thing I knew, they were using my hotel room as their headquarters. They never slept. I tried to keep an eye on them, but there were plenty of times while I was sleeping when they could have put almost anything in my luggage. What? Where are they now? Well, I can't say for sure, but I can give you the names of the hotels they were using. Jesus, these terrible hallucinations. I tried to put them out of my mind as I finished my drink and called for another. A paranoid shudder jerked me out of my slump in the chair. I sat up and looked around. Where was that bastard Bloor? How long had he been gone? I glanced out at the plane and saw the fuel truck still parked under the wing. But they were loading the baggage now. Ten more minutes. I relaxed again, shoving a handful of pesos at the waitress to pay for our drinks, trying to smile at her when suddenly the whole airport seemed to echo with the sound of my name being shouted over a thousand loudspeakers. Then I heard Bloor's name, a harsh, heavily accented voice, bellowing along the corridors like the scream of a banshee. Passengers Hunter Thompson and Yale Bloor, report immediately to the immigration desk. I was too stunned to move. Mother of twelve bastards, I whispered. Did I actually hear that? I gripped both arms of my chair and tried to concentrate. Was I hallucinating again? There was no way to be sure. Then I heard the voice again, booming all over the airport. Will passengers Hunter Thompson and Gail Bloor report immediately to the immigration desk? No, I thought. 
This is impossible. It had to be paranoid dementia. My fear of being nailed at the last moment had become so intense that I was hearing voices. The sun through the window would cause the acid to boil in my brain. A huge bubble of drugs had burst a weak vein in my frontal lobes. Then I saw Bloor rushing into the bar. His eyes were wild, his hands were flapping crazily. Did you hear that? he shouted. I stared at him. Well, I thought, we're fucked. He heard it too. Or even if he hadn't, even if we're both hallucinating, it means we've OD'd. Totally out of control for the next six hours, crazed with fear and confusion, feeling our bodies disappear and our heads swell up like balloons, unable to even recognize each other. Wake up! God damn it, he yelled. We have to make a run for the plane! I shrugged. It's no use. They'll grab us at the gate. He was frantically trying to zip up his kit bag. Are you sure those were our names they called? Are you positive? I nodded, still not moving. Somewhere in the middle of my half-numb brain, the truth was beginning to stir. I was not hallucinating. The nightmare was real. And I suddenly remembered the striker PR man's talk about that all-powerful Hefe and Cozumel who had the fuel license. Of course! A man with that kind of leverage would have connections all over Mexico. Police, airlines, immigration. It was madness to think we could cross him and get away with it. No doubt he controlled the Avis franchise, too. And he'd gone into action the minute his henchman found that crippled jeep in the airport parking lot with its windshield shattered and an 11-day bill unpaid. The phone lines had been humming 20,000 feet beneath us all the way to Monterey. And now... With less than ten minutes to spare, they had ambushed us. I stood up and slung the sea bag over my shoulder, just as the waitress brought Bluer's glaucoma. He looked at her, then lifted it off the tray and drank the whole thing in one gulp. Gracias, gracias, he mumbled, handing her a fifty peso note. She started to make change, but he shook his head. Nada, nada. Keep the goddamn change. Then he pointed toward the kitchen. Back door, he said eagerly. Exito? He nodded at the plane about 50 feet below us on the runway. I could see a few passengers beginning to board. Big hurry, Bloor told her. Importante. She looked puzzled, then pointed to the main entrance to the bar. He stuttered helplessly for a moment, then began shouting, Where's the goddamn back door to this place? We have to catch that plane now! A long-delayed rush of adrenaline was beginning to clear my head. I grabbed his arm and lurched toward the main door. Let's go, I said. We'll run right past the bastards. My brain was still foggy, but the adrenaline had triggered a basic survival instinct. Our only hope was to run like doomed rats for the only available opening and hope for a miracle. As we hurried down the corridor, I jerked one of the press tags off my sea bag and gave it to Bloor. Start waving this at them when we hit the gate, I said, leaping sideways to avoid a covey of nuns in our way. Pardonne, I shouted. Prensa, prensa, mucho importante. Bloor picked up the cry as we approached the gate, running at full speed and shouting incoherently in garbled Spanish. The immigration booth was just beyond the glass doors leading out to the runway. The stairway up to the plane was still full of passengers, but the clock above the gate said exactly 11.20. Departure time. Our only hope was to burst past the cops at the desk and dash aboard the plane just as the stewardess pulled the big silver door closed. We had to slow down as we approached the glass doors, waving our tickets at the cops and yelling, Prensa, Prensa, at everybody in front of us. I was pouring sweat by this time, and we were both gasping for breath. A small, muscular-looking cop in a white shirt and dark glasses moved out to head us off as we stumbled through the doors. Senor Bloor, Senor Thompson, he asked sharply. The voice of doom. I staggered to a halt and sagged against the desk. But Bloor's leather-soled mod boots wouldn't hold on the marble floor, and he skidded past me at full speed and crashed into a ten-foot potted palm, dropping his kit bag and mangling several branches that he grabbed to keep from falling. Senor Thompson, Senor Bloor. Our accuser had a one-track mind. 
One of his assistants had run over to help Bloor keep his feet. Another cop picked his kit bag off the floor and handed it to him. I was too exhausted to do anything but nod my head meekly. The cop who'd called our names took the ticket out of my hand and glanced at it, then quickly handed it back to me. Aha, he said with a grin. Senor Thompson. Then he looked at Bloor. You are Senor Bloor? You're goddamn right I am, Bloor snapped. What the hell's going on here? This is a goddamn outrage. All this wax on these floors, I almost got killed. The little cop grinned again. Was there something sadistic in his smile? I couldn't be sure, but it didn't matter now. They had us on the gaff. I flashed on all the people I knew who'd been busted in Mexico. Dopers who'd pushed their luck too far, gotten careless. No doubt we would find friends in prison. I could almost hear them hooting their cheerful greetings as we were led into the yard and turned loose. This scene passed through my head in milliseconds. Bloor's wild yells were still floating in the air as the cop began pushing me out the door toward the plane. Hurry, hurry, he was saying. And behind me I heard his assistant prodding Bloor. We were afraid you would miss the plane, he was saying. We called on the PA system. He was grinning broadly now. You almost missed the plane. We were almost to San Antonio before I got a grip on myself. The adrenaline was still pumping violently through my head. The acid and booze and fatigue had been totally neutralized by that scene at the gate. My nerves were so jangled as the plane took off that I had to beg the stewardess for two scotch and waters, which I used to down two of our four reds. Bloor ate the other two with the help of two Bloody Marys. His hands were trembling badly, his eyes were filled with blood, but as he came back to life, he began cursing. Those dirty bastards on the PA system who had caused him to panic and get rid of all the coke. Jesus, he said quietly. You can't imagine what a horror that was. I was standing there at the urinal with my joint in one hand and a coke spoon in the other, jamming the stuff up my nose and trying to piss at the same time, when all of a fucking sudden, it just exploded all around me. They have a speaker up there in the corner of that bathroom, and the whole place is tile. He took a long hit on the drink. Shit, I almost went crazy. It was like somebody had snuck up behind me and dropped a cherry bomb down the back of my shirt. All I could think of was getting rid of the coke. I threw it into one of the urinals and ran like a bastard for the bar. He laughed nervously. Hell, I didn't even zip up my pants. I was running down the hall with my joint hanging out. I smiled, remembering the sense of almost apocalyptic despair that seized me when I heard the first announcement. That's odd, I said. It never even occurred to me to get rid of the drugs. I was thinking about all those hotel bills and that goddamn Jeep. If they'd nailed us for that stuff, a few pills wouldn't make much difference. He seemed to brood for a while. Then he spoke, staring fixedly at the seat in front of him. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't think I could stand another shock like that one. I had about 90 seconds of pure terror. I felt like my whole life had ended. Jesus! Standing at that urinal with a Coke spoon up my nose and suddenly hearing my name on the speaker? He moaned softly. Now I know how Liddy must have felt when he saw those cops running into the water gate. Seeing his whole life fall apart, from a hot rod in the White House to a 20-year jailbird in 60 seconds. Fuck Liddy, I said. It couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. I laughed out loud. Liddy was the bastard who ran Operation Intercept, remember that? Bloor nodded. What do you think would have happened if Gordon Liddy had been standing at the gate when we came crashing through? He smiled, sipping his drink. We'd be sitting in a Mexican jail right now, I said. Just one of these pills, I held up a purple acid tab, would have been enough to drive Liddy into a hate frenzy. He'd have had us locked up on suspicion of everything from hijacking to dope smuggling. He looked at the pill I was holding, then reached for it. Let's finish these off, he said. I can't stand this nervousness. You're right, I said, reaching into my pocket for the other one. We're almost to San Antonio. 
I tossed the pill down my throat and called the stewardess for another drink. Is that it, he asked? Are we clean? I nodded. Except for the speed. Get rid of it, he said. We're almost there. Don't worry, I replied. This acid will take hold just about the time we land. We should order more drinks. I unbuckled my seatbelt and walked up the aisle to the lavatory, fully intending to flush the speed down the toilet. But when I got inside, with the door locked behind me, I stared down at the little buggers resting so peacefully there in my palm, ten caps of pure white amphetamine powder, and I thought, no, we might need these in case of another emergency. I remembered the dangerous lethargy that had gripped me in Monterey. Then... I looked down at my white canvas basketball shoes and noticed how snugly the tongues fit under the laces. Plenty of pressure down there, I thought, and plenty of room for ten pills. So, I put all the speed in my shoes and went back to the seat. No point mentioning it to Bloor, I thought. He's clean, and therefore totally innocent. It would only inhibit his capacity for righteous anger, I felt, if I told him about the speed I was still carrying until we were safely through customs and reeling blindly around the San Antonio airport. Then, he would thank me for it. San Antonio was a cakewalk. No trouble at all. Despite the fact that we virtually fell off the plane, badly twisted again, and by the time we got our bags onto the conveyor belt leading up to the tall black customs agent, we were both laughing like fools at the trail of orange amphetamine pills strung out behind us on the floor of the tin-roofed customs shed. I was arguing with the agent about how much import tax I would have to pay on the two bottles of Prima tequila I was carrying when I noticed Bloor was almost doubled over with laughter right beside me. He had just paid a tax of $5.88 on his own tequila, and now he was cracking up while the agent fussed over my tax. What the hell's wrong with you, I snapped, glancing back at him. Then, I noticed he was looking down at my feet, fighting so hard to control his laughter that he was having trouble keeping his balance. I looked down, and there, about six inches from my right shoe, was a bright orange spansool. Another one was sitting on the black rubber floor mat about two feet behind me, and two feet farther back was another one. They looked as big as footballs. Insane, I thought. I've left a trail of speed all the way from the plane to this beetle-browed customs agent, who was now handing me the official receipt for my liquor tax. I accepted it with a smile that was already disintegrating into hysteria as I took it out of his hand. He was staring grimly at Bloor, who was out of control now, still laughing at the floor. The customs man couldn't see what Yale was laughing at because of the conveyor belt between us. But I could... It was another one of those goddamn orange balls resting on the white canvas toe of my shoe. I reached down as casually as I could and put the thing in my pocket. The customs man watched us with a look of total disgust on his face, and we hauled our bags through the swinging wooden doors and into the lobby of the San Antonio airport. Can you believe that, Bloor said? He never even looked inside these damn things. For all he knows, we just came across the border with 200 pounds of pure skag. I stopped laughing. It was true. My big suitcase, the elephant skin Abercrombie and Fitch job with brass corners, was still securely locked. Not one of our bags had been opened for even the laziest inspection. We had listed the five quarts of tequila on our declaration forms, and that was all that seemed to interest him. Jesus Christ, Bloor was saying, if we'd only known. I smiled, but I was still feeling nervous about it. There was something almost eerie about two laughing, staggering dopers checking through one of the heaviest drug checkpoints on the customs map without even opening their bags. It was almost insulting. The more I thought about it, the angrier I felt, because that cold-eyed nigger had been absolutely right. He had sized us up perfectly with one glance. I could almost hear him thinking, God damn, look at these two slobbering honkies. Anybody this fucked up can't be serious. Which was true. 
The only thing we slipped past him was a single cap of speed, and even that was an accident. So in truth, he had saved himself a lot of unnecessary work by ignoring our baggage. I would have preferred not to understand this embarrassment so keenly because it plunged me into a fit of depression, despite the acid, or maybe because of it. The rest of that trip was a nightmare of paranoid blunders and the kind of small humiliations that haunt you for many weeks afterward. About halfway between San Antonio and Denver, Bloor reached out into the aisle and grabbed a stewardess by the leg, causing her to drop a tray of 21 wine glasses, which crashed in a heap at her feet and ignited rumblings of bad discontent from the other first-class passengers who had ordered wine with their lunch. You stinking dope addict bastard, I muttered, trying to ignore him in the burst of ugliness that surrounded us. He grinned stupidly, ignoring the howls of the stewardess and fixing me with a dazed, uncomprehending stare that confirmed, forever, my convictions that nobody with even latent inclinations to use drugs should ever try to smuggle them. We were virtually shoveled off the plane in Denver, laughing and staggering in such a rotten condition that we were barely able to claim our luggage. Months later, I received a letter from a friend in Cozumel asking if I were still interested in buying an interest in some beach acres on the Caribbean shores. It arrived just as I was preparing to leave for Washington to cover the impeachment of Richard Nixon the final act in a drama that began for me almost exactly a year earlier when I had bought a news from a newsboy hustling the porch of the Ball High in Cozumel and read John Dean's original outcry about refusing to be the scapegoat. Well, a lot of madness has flowed under our various bridges since then, and we have all presumably learned a lot of things. John Dean is in prison, Richard Nixon has quit, and been pardoned by his hand-picked successor, and my feeling for national politics is about the same as my feeling for deep-sea fishing, buying land in Cozumel, or anything else where the losers end up thrashing around in the water on a barbed hook. Jimmy Carter and the Great Leap of Faith Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail, 76 Third-rate romance, low-rent rendezvous. From Rolling Stone, number 214, June 3rd, 1976. The view from Key West, 90 miles north of Havana and 900 years on the campaign trail. Farewell to the boys on the bus, or Johnny, I never knew ye. Another rude and wistful tale from the bowels of the American dream, with notes, nightmares, and other strange memories from Manchester, Boston, Miami, and Plains, Georgia. And 440 volts from Castrato, the demon lover of Coconut Grove. By Billy Herman, a harness racing trainer at Pompano Park in Miami. A lot of people will tell you that horses get spooked because they're just naturally nervous and jittery. But that ain't right. What you have to remember is that a horse sees things maybe six or seven times bigger than we do. This news just came over the radio, followed by a song about faster horses, younger women, older whiskey, and more money. And then came a news item about a Polish gentleman who was arrested earlier today for throwing more than two dozen bowling balls into the sea off a pier in Fort Lauderdale because he told arresting officers he thought they were nigger eggs. We are living in very strange times, and they are likely to get a lot stranger before we bottom out, which could happen a lot sooner than even Henry Kissinger thinks. Because this is, after all, another election year, and almost everybody I talk to seems to feel we are headed for strangeness, of one sort or another. And some people say we are already deep in the midst of it, which may be true. The evidence points both ways. But from my perch in this plastic catbird seat out here on the southernmost rim of Key West, the barometer looks to be falling so fast on all fronts that it no longer matters. And now comes this filthy news in the latest Gallup poll that Hubert Humphrey will be our next president. Or, 
Failing that, he will foul the national air for the next six months and drive us all to smack with his poison gibberish. Jesus! No wonder that poor bastard up in Fort Lauderdale ran amuck and decided that all bowling balls were actually nigger eggs that would have to be hurled at once into shark-infested waters. He was probably a desperate political activist of some kind trying to send a message to Washington. Last night, on this same radio station, I heard a warning about a new outbreak of dog mutilations in Coconut Grove. The disc jockey reading the news sounded angry and agitated. Three more mongrel dogs were found castrated and barely alive tonight, he said, and investigating officers said there was no doubt that all three animals were victims of the same bloodthirsty psychotic, a stocky middle-aged Cuban known as Castrato, who has terrorized dog owners in Coconut Grove for the past three months. Today's mutilations, police said, were executed with the same sadistic precision as all the others. According to the owner of one victim, a half-breed chow watchdog named Willie, the dog was minding his own business, just lying out there in the driveway, when all of a sudden I heard him start yelping and I looked out the front door just in time to see this dirty little spick shoot him again with one of those electric flashlight guns. Then the son of a bitch grabbed Willie by the hind legs and threw him into the back of an old red pickup. I yelled at him, but by the time I got hold of my shotgun and ran out on the porch, he was gone. It all happened so fast that I didn't even get the license number of the truck. The voice on the radio paused for a long moment, then dipped a few octaves and went on with the story. Several hours later, police said, Willie and two other dogs, both mongrels, were found in a vacant lot near the Dinner Key Yacht Marina. All three had been expertly castrated. Another long pause, followed by a moaning sound as the radio voice seemed to crack and stutter momentarily. And then it continued very slowly. The nature of the wounds, police said, left no room for doubt that today's mutilations were the work of the same fiendish hand responsible for all but two of the 49 previous dog castrations in Coconut Grove this year. This is definitely the work of Castrato, said senior dog warden Lionel Ole at a hastily called press conference late this afternoon. Look at the razor work on this mongrel chow, Ole told reporters. These cuts are surgically perfect, and so is this cauterization. This man you call Castrato is no amateur, gentlemen. This is very artistic surgery. Maybe 50 or 55 seconds from start to finish, assuming he works with a whip steel straight razor and a 220-volt soldering iron. Ole ended the press conference on a humorous note, urging reporters to work like dogs until this case is cracked. And if any of you people own mongrels, he added, Either keep them out of Coconut Grove or have them put to sleep. Meanwhile, said the newscaster, South Miami police have warned all dog owners in the area to be on the lookout for a red pickup truck cruising slowly in residential neighborhoods. The driver, a small but muscular Cuban between 40 and 50 years old, is known to be armed with an extremely dangerous high-voltage electric weapon called a taser and is also criminally insane. Jesus Christ! I'm not sure I can handle this kind of news and frantic stimulus at four o'clock in the morning, especially with a head full of speed, booze, and percodan. It is extremely difficult to concentrate on the cheap realities of Campaign 76 under these circumstances. The idea of covering even the early stages of this cynical and increasingly retrograde campaign has already plunged me into a condition bordering on terminal despair, and if I thought I might have to stay with these people all the way to November, I would change my name and seek work as a professional alligator poacher in the swamps around Lake Okeechobee. My frame of mind is not right for another long and maddening year of total involvement in a presidential campaign. And somewhere in the back of my brain lurks a growing suspicion that this campaign is not right either. But that is not the kind of judgment a journalist should make at this point. At least, not in print. So, for the moment, I will try to suspend both the despair and the final judgment. 
Both will be massively justified in the next few months, I think. And until then, I can fall back on the firmly held but rarely quoted conviction of most big-time Washington Pauls that nobody can function at top form on a full-time basis in more than one presidential campaign. This rule of thumb has never been applied to journalists, to my knowledge, but there is ample evidence to suggest it should be. There is no reason to think that even the best and brightest of journalists, as it were, can repeatedly, or even more than once, crank themselves up to the level of genuinely fanatical energy, commitment, and total concentration it takes to live in the speeding vortex of a presidential campaign from start to finish. There is not enough room on that hell-bound train for anybody who wants to relax and act human now and then. It is a gig for ambitious zealots and terminal action junkies. And this is especially true of a campaign like this one, which so far lacks any central overriding issue like the war in Vietnam that brought so many talented and totally dedicated non-politicians into the 68 and 72 campaigns. The issues this time are too varied and far too complex for the instant polarization of a which side are you on crusade. There will not be many ideologues seriously involved in the 76 campaign. This one is a technician's trip, run by and for politicians, which is not really a hell of a lot different from any other campaign, except that this time it is going to be painfully obvious. This time, on the 200th anniversary of what used to be called the American Dream, we are going to have our noses rubbed day after day on the tube and in the headlines in this mess we have made for ourselves. From the Education of a Correspondent by Herbert Matthews. Today, wherever in this world I meet a man or woman who fought for Spanish liberty, I meet a kindred soul. In those years we lived our best, and what has come after and what there is to come can never carry us to those heights again. My problem with this campaign began not quite two years ago, in May of 1974, when I flew down to Georgia with Teddy Kennedy and ran into Jimmy Carter. The meeting was not so much accidental as inevitable. I knew almost nothing about Carter at the time, and that was all I wanted to know. He was the lame duck governor of Georgia who had nominated Scoop Jackson at the 1972 Democratic Convention in Miami. And in the course of that year, I had written some ugly things about him. Or at least that's what he told me when I showed up at the governor's mansion for breakfast at 8 o'clock in the morning. I'd been up all night in the company of serious degenerates. Ah, but let's not get into that. At least not quite yet. I just reread that Castrato business, and it strikes me that I am probably just one or two twisted tangents away from terminal fusing of the brain circuits. Yes, the point. My feeling for Southern politicians is not especially warm, even now. Ever since the first cannonballs fell on Fort Sumter in 1861, Southern politics has been dominated by thieves, bigots, warmongers, and buffoons. There were governors like Earl Long in Louisiana, Kissin' Jim Folsom in Alabama, and Orville Faubus in Arkansas, and senators like Bilbo and Eastland from Mississippi, Smathers and Gurney from Florida, and Lyndon Johnson from Texas. Toward the end of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, the governor of Georgia was a white trash dingbat named Lester Maddox, who is still with us, in one crude form or another, and when the curtain finally falls on George Wallace, he will probably go down in history as the greatest thief of them all. Wallace was the first Southern politician to understand that there are just as many mean, stupid bigots above the Mason-Dixon line as there are below it, and when he made the shrewd decision to go national in 1968, he created an Alabama-based industry that has since made very rich men of himself and a handful of cronies. For more than a decade, George Wallace has bamboozled the national press and terrified the ranking fixers in both major parties. In 1968, 
He took enough Democratic votes from Hubert Humphrey to elect Richard Nixon. And if he had bothered to understand the delegate selection process in 1972, he could have prevented McGovern's nomination and muscled himself into the number two spot on a Humphrey Wallace ticket. McGovern could not have survived a second ballot shortfall in Miami that year, and anybody who thinks the happy warrior would not have made that trade with Wallace is a fool. Hubert Humphrey would have traded anything with anybody to get the Democratic nomination for himself in 1972, and he'll be ready to trade again this year if he sees the slightest chance. And he does. He saw it on the morning after the New Hampshire primary, when 5% of the vote came in as uncommitted. That rotten, truthless old freak was on national TV at the crack of dawn, cackling like a handful of animals at the wonderful news from New Hampshire. After almost four years of relatively statesmanlike restraint and infrequent TV appearances that showed his gray hair and haggard jowls, Four long and frantic years that saw the fall of Richard Nixon, the end of the war in Vietnam, and a neo-collapse of the U.S. economy. After all that time and all those sober denials that he would never run for president, all it took to jerk Hubert out of his closet was the news from New Hampshire that 5% of the Democratic voters, less than 4,000 people in that strange little state, had cast their ballots for uncommitted delegates. To Humphrey, who was not even entered in the New Hampshire primary, this meant 5% for him. Never mind that a completely unknown ex-governor of Georgia had won the New Hampshire with more than 30% of the vote, or that liberal congressman Morris Udall had finished a solid but disappointing second with 24%, or that liberal Senator Birch Bayh ran third with 16%. None of that mattered to Hubert, because he was privy to various rumors and force-fed press reports that many of the uncommitted delegates in New Hampshire were secret Humphrey supporters. There was no way to be sure, of course, but no reason to doubt it, either. At least not in the mushy mind of the happy warrior. His first TV appearance of the 76 campaign was a nasty shock to me. I had been up all night tapping the glass and nursing my bets along. I had bet the Quinella, taking Carter and Reagan against Udall and Ford. And when the sun came up on Wednesday, I was slumped in front of a TV set in an ancient New England farmhouse on a hilltop near a hamlet called Contacook. I had won early on Carter, but I had to wait for Hughes Rudd and the morning news to learn that Ford had finally overtaken Reagan. The margin at dawn was less than 1%, but it was enough to blow my quinella and put Reagan back on Cheap Street, where he's been ever since. And I was brooding on this unexpected loss, sipping my coffee and tapping the glass once again, when all of a sudden, I was smacked right straight in the eyes with the wild-eyed, babbling spectacle of Hubert Horatio Humphrey. His hair was bright orange, his cheeks were rouged, his forehead was caked with mantan, and his mouth was moving so fast that the words poured out in a high-pitched, chattering whine. Oh, my goodness, my gracious, isn't it wonderful? Yes, yes, indeed. Oh, yes, it just goes to show. I just can't say enough. No, I thought. This can't be true. Not now. Not so soon. Here was this monster, this shameful electrified corpse, giggling and raving and flapping his hands at the camera like he'd just been elected president. He looked like three iguanas in a feeding frenzy. I stood up and backed off from the TV set, but the view was no different from the other side of the room. I was seeing the real thing, and it stunned me, because I knew in my heart that he was real that even with the 5% shadow vote in the year's first primary, where his name was not on the ballot, and despite Jimmy Carter's surprising victory and four other nationally known candidates finishing higher than uncommitted, that Hubert Humphrey had somehow emerged from the chaos of New Hampshire with yet another new life and another serious shot at the presidency of the United States. This was more than a visceral feeling or some painful flash of dread instinct. It was, in fact, a thing I'd predicted myself at least six months earlier. 
It was a summer night in Washington, and I was having dinner at an outdoor restaurant near the Capitol with what the Wall Street Journal later described as a half dozen top operatives from the 1972 McGovern campaign. And at that point, there were already three certain candidates for 76. Jimmy Carter, Mo Udall, and Fred Harris. We had just come from a brief and feisty little session with Carter, and on the way to the restaurant, we had run into Udall on the street, so the talk at the table was understandably deep politics. Only one person in the group had even a tentative commitment to a candidate in 76, and after an hour or two of cruel judgments and bitter comment, Alan Barron, McGovern's press secretary and a prime mover in the new politics wing of the Democratic Party, proposed a secret ballot to find out which candidate those of us at the table actually believed would be the party nominee in 1976. Not who we want or who we like, Barron stressed, but who we really think is going to get it. I tore a page out of my notebook and sliced it up to make ballots. We each took one, wrote a name on it, then folded it up and passed the ballots to Barron, a Farouk-like personage with a carnivorous sense of humor and the build of a sumo wrestler. Alan and I have not always been friends. He was Muskie's campaign manager for Florida in 72, and he had never entirely recovered from his encounter with the gin-crazed boo-hoo on Big Ed's Sunshine Special. And even now, after all this time... I will occasionally catch him staring at me with a feral glint in his eyes. Indeed, and so much for that. Just another bucket of bad blood gone under the bridge, so to speak. And in presidential politics, you learn to love the bridges and never look down. Which gets us back to the vote count and the leer on Barron's face when he unfolded the first ballot. I knew it, he said. That's two already, counting mine. Yep, here's another one. He looked up and laughed. It's a landslide for Hubert. And it was. The final count was Humphrey 4, Muskie 2, and one vote for Udall from Rick Stearns, who was already involved in the planning and organizing stages of Udall's campaign. Nobody else at the table was committed to anything except gloom, pessimism, and a sort of aggressive neutrality. So much for the idea of a sequel to Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail 72. Barring some totally unexpected development, I will leave the dreary task of chronicling this low-rent trip to Teddy White, who is already trapped in a place I don't want to be. But there is no way to escape without wallowing deep in the first few primaries and getting a feel, more or less, for the evidence. And in order to properly depress and degrade myself for the ordeal to come, I decided in early January to resurrect the National Affairs Desk and set up, once again, in the place where I spent so much time in 1972 and then again in 1974. These were the boom and bust years of Richard Milhouse Nixon, who was criminally insane and also President of the United States for five years. Marching through Georgia with Ted Kennedy. Deep down and dirty on the darkest side of shame. The politics of mystery and blood on the hands of Dean Rusk. Jimmy Carter's Law Day speech and why it was shrouded in secrecy by persons unknown. Derby Day in the Governor's Mansion and the strangling of the Sloat Diamond. From the Commonwealth of Virginia Anti-Sodomy Statute, 1792. If any person shall carnally know in any manner any brute animal, or carnally know any male or female person by the anus, or by and with the mouth, or voluntarily submit to such carnal knowledge, he or she shall be guilty of a felony and shall be confined in the penitentiary not less than one year nor more than three years. One of the most difficult problems for a journalist covering a presidential campaign is getting to know the candidates well enough to make confident judgments about them, because it is just about impossible for a journalist to establish a personal relationship with any candidate who has already made the big leap from long shot to serious contender. 
The problem becomes more and more serious as the stakes get higher. And by the time a candidate has survived enough primaries to convince himself and his staff that they will all be eating their lunches in the White House mess for the next four years, he is long past the point of having either the time or the inclination to treat any journalist who doesn't already know him personally as anything but just another face in the campaign press corps. There are many complex theories about the progressive stages of a presidential campaign. But for the moment, let's say there are three. Stage one is the period between the decision to run for president and the morning after the New Hampshire primary, when the field is still crowded, the staff organizations are still loose and relaxed, and most candidates are still hungry for all the help they can get. Especially media exposure, so they can get their names in the Gallup poll. Stage two is the winnowing out, the separating of the sheep from the goats, when the two or three survivors of the early primaries begin looking like long-distance runners with a realistic shot at the party nomination. And stage three begins whenever the national media, the public opinion polls, and Mayor Daly of Chicago decide that a candidate has picked up enough irreversible momentum to begin looking like at least a probable nominee and a possible next president. This three-stage breakdown is not rooted in any special wisdom or scientific analysis, but it fits both the 1972 and 1976 Democratic campaigns well enough to make the point that any journalist who doesn't get a pretty firm personal fix on a candidate while he's still in stage one might just as well go with his or her instincts all the way to Election Day in November. Because once a candidate gets to stage two, his whole lifestyle changes drastically. At that point, he becomes a public figure, a serious contender, and the demands on his time and energy begin escalating to the level of madness. He wakes up every morning to face a split-second, 18-hour-a-day schedule of meetings, airports, speeches, press conferences, motorcades, and handshaking. Instead of rambling off-the-cuff talks over a drink or two with reporters from small-town newspapers, he is suddenly flying all over the country in his own chartered jet full of syndicated columnists and network TV stars. Cameras and microphones follow him everywhere he goes, and instead of pleading long and earnestly for the support of 15 amateur political activists gathered in some English professor's living room in Keene, New Hampshire, he is reading the same cliché-riddled speech often three or four times in a single day, to vast auditoriums full of people who either laugh or applaud at all the wrong times and who may or may not be supporters. And all the fat cats, labor leaders, and big-time Pauls who couldn't find the time to return his phone calls when he was desperately looking for help a few months ago are now ringing his phone off the hook within minutes after his arrival in whatever Boston, Miami, or Milwaukee hotel his managers had booked him into that night. But they are not calling to offer their help and support. They just want to make sure he understands that they don't plan to help or support anybody else until they get to know him a little better. It is a very mean game that these high-rolling, cold-hearted hustlers play. The President of the United States may no longer be the most powerful man in the world but he is still close enough to be sure that nobody else in the world is going to cross him by accident. And anybody who starts looking like he might get his hands on that kind of power had better get comfortable, right from the start, with the certain knowledge that he is going to have to lean on some very mean and merciless people just to get himself elected. The power of the presidency is so vast that it is probably a good thing in retrospect that only a very few people in this country understood the gravity of Richard Nixon's mental condition during his last year in the White House. There were moments in that year when even his closest friends and advisors were convinced that the President of the United States was so crazy with rage and booze and suicidal despair that he was only two martinis away from losing his grip entirely and suddenly locking himself in his office long enough to make that single telephone call that would have launched enough missiles and bombers to blow the whole world off its axis. Or at least kill a hundred million people. The sudden hellish reality of a nuclear war with either Russia or China or both 
was probably the only thing that could have salvaged Nixon's presidency after the Supreme Court ruled that he had to yield up the incriminating tapes that he knew would finish him off. Would the action-starved generals at the Strategic Air Command headquarters have ignored an emergency order from their commander-in-chief? And how long would it have taken Pat Buchanan or General Haig to realize that the boss had finally flipped? Nixon spent so much time alone that nobody else in the White House would have given his absence a second thought until he failed to show up for dinner. And by that time, he could have made enough phone calls to start wars all over the world. A four-star general commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps, with three wars and 35 years of fanatical devotion to duty, honor, and country in his system, would hack off his own feet and eat them, rather than refuse to obey a direct order from the President of the United States, even if he thought the President was crazy. The key to all military thinking is a concept that nobody who ever wore a uniform with even one stripe on it will ever forget. You don't salute the man. You salute the uniform. Once you've learned that, you're a soldier. And soldiers don't disobey orders from people they have to salute. If Nixon's tortured mind had bent far enough to let him think he could save himself by ordering a full-bore Marine airborne invasion of Cuba, he would not have given the boom-boom order to some closet pacifist general who might be inclined to delay the invasion long enough to call Henry Kissinger for official reassurance that the president was not insane. No West Pointer with four stars on his hat would take that kind of risk anyway. By the time word got back to the White House or to Kissinger that Nixon had given the order to invade Cuba, the whole Caribbean would be a sea of fire. Fidel Castro would be in a submarine on his way to Russia, and the sky above the Atlantic would be streaked from one horizon to the other with the vapor trails of a hundred panic-launched missiles. Right. But it was mainly a matter of luck that Nixon's mental disintegration was so obvious and so crippling that by the time he came face to face with his final option, he was no longer able to even recognize it. When the going got tough, the politician who worshipped toughness above all else turned into a whimpering, gin-soaked vegetable. But it is still worth wondering how long it would have taken Haig and Kissinger to convince all those SAC generals out in Omaha to disregard a doomsday phone call from the President of the United States because a handful of civilians in the White House said he was crazy. Ah... But we are wandering off into wild speculation again, so let's chop it off right here. We were talking about the vast powers of the presidency and all the treacherous currents surrounding it. Not to mention all the riptides, ambushes, Judas goats, fools, and ruthless, dehumanized thugs that will sooner or later have to be dealt with by any presidential candidate who still feels strong on his feet when he comes to that magic moment for the leap from stage two to stage three. But there will be plenty of time for that later on, and plenty of other journalists to write about it. But not me. The most active and interesting phase of a presidential campaign is stage one, which is as totally different from the sturm and drang of stage three as a guerrilla-style war among six or eight gypsy nations is totally different from the bloody, hunkered-down trench warfare that paralyzed and destroyed half of Europe during World War I. Athens, Alabama, AP. The Lady in Tribble, who had said she would marry entertainer Elvis Presley on Saturday confirmed Sunday that the ceremony did not take place. Mrs. Tribble, a 42-year-old widow with four children, was asked in a telephone interview why the wedding did not take place. She replied, This is the Sabbath day, and I don't talk about things like this on the Lord's Day. Well, that's fair enough, I guess. Jimmy Carter had said that he won't talk about his foreign policy until the day he delivers his inaugural address. Everybody had a right to their own quirks and personal convictions, as long as they don't try to lay them on me. But just for the pure, mean-spirited hell of it, 
I am going to call a lady in Tribble when the sun comes up in about three hours and ask her the same question the AP reporter insulted her faith by asking on the Sabbath. By Mrs. Tribble's own logic, I should get a perfectly straight answer from her on Tuesday, which, according to my calendar, is not a religious holiday of any kind. So, in just a few hours, I should have the answer from a lady and herself to the question regarding her mysterious non-marriage to Elvis Presley. And after I talk to Aladian, I'm going to call my old friend Pat Cadell, who is Jimmy Carter's pollster and one of the two or three main wizards in Carter's Brain Trust, and we will have another one of our daily philosophical chats. When I read Mrs. Tribble's quote to Pat earlier tonight, in the course of a more or less bare-knuckled telephone talk, he said he didn't know any woman named Aladian in Athens, Alabama. And besides that, he didn't see any connection between her and the main topic of our conversation tonight, which was Jimmy Carter, who was always the main topic when I talked to Cadell. And we've been talking, arguing, plotting, haggling, and generally whipping on each other almost constantly ever since this third-rate, low-rent campaign circus hit the public roads about four months ago. That was before Pat went to work for Jimmy but long after I'd been cited in about 33 dozen journals all over the country as one of Carter's earliest and most fervent supporters. Everywhere I went for at least the past year, from Los Angeles to Austin, Nashville, Washington, Boston, Chicago, and Key West, I've been publicly hammered by friends and strangers alike for saying that I like Jimmy Carter. I have been jeered by large crowds for saying this. I have been mocked in print by liberal pundits and other Gucci people. I have been called a brain-damaged geek by some of my best and oldest friends. My own wife threw a knife at me on the night of the Wisconsin primary when the midnight radio stunned us both with a news bulletin from a CBS station in Los Angeles saying that earlier announcements by NBC and ABC regarding Mo Udall's narrow victory over Carter in Wisconsin were not true and that late returns from the rural districts were running so heavily in Carter's favor that CBS was now calling him the winner. Sandy likes Mo Udall, and so do I for that matter. I also like Jerry Jeff Walker, the scofflaw king of New Orleans, and a lot of other people I don't necessarily believe should be president of the United States. The immense concentration of power in that office is just too goddamn heavy for anybody with good sense to turn his back on. Or her back. Or its back. At least not as long as whatever lives in the White House has the power to fill vacancies on the U.S. Supreme Court. Because anybody with that kind of power can use it, like Nixon did, to pack crowd the court of final appeal in this country with the same kind of lame, vindictive yo-yos who recently voted to sustain the Commonwealth of Virginia's anti-sodomy statutes. And anybody who thinks that 6-3 to three vote against sodomy is some kind of abstract legal gibberish that doesn't really affect them had better hope they never get busted for anything the Bible or any local vice squad cop calls an unnatural sex act. Because unnatural is defined by the laws of almost every state in the Union as anything but a quick and dutiful hump in the classic missionary position, for purposes of procreation only. Anything else is a felony crime, and people who commit felony crimes go to prison! Which won't make much difference to me. I took that fatal dive off the straight and narrow path so long ago that I can't remember when I first became a felon. But I have been one ever since, and it's way too late to change now. In the eyes of the law, my whole life has been one long and sinful felony. I have sinned repeatedly, as often as possible, and just as soon as I can get away from this goddamn Calvinist typewriter, I am going to get right after it again. God knows I hate it, but I can't help myself after all these criminal years. Like Waylon Jennings says, the devil made me do it the first time. The second time, I done it on my own. Right. And the third time, I did it because of brain damage. And after that, well, I figured that anybody who was already doomed to a life of crime and sin might as well learn to love it. Anything worth all that risk and energy almost has to be beyond the reach of any kind of redemption except the power of pure love. And this flash of twisted wisdom brings us back, strangely enough, 
to politics. Pat Cadell and the 1976 presidential campaign, and not incidentally to the fact that any journal on any side of Wall Street that ever quoted me as saying, I like Jimmy Carter, was absolutely accurate. I have said it many times to many people, and I will keep on saying it until Jimmy Carter gives me some good reason to change my mind, which might happen about two minutes after he finishes reading this article. But I doubt it. I have known Carter for more than two years, and I have probably spent more private, human time with him than any other journalist on the 76 campaign trail. The first time I met him, at about 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning in 1974, at the back door of the governor's mansion in Atlanta, I was about two degrees on the safe side of berserk, raving and babbling at Carter and his whole bemused family about some hostile bastard wearing a Georgia State Police uniform who had tried to prevent me from coming through the gate at the foot of the long, tree-shaded driveway leading up to the mansion. I had been up all night, in the company of serious degenerates, and when I rolled up to the gatehouse in the backseat of a taxi I'd hailed in downtown Atlanta, the trooper was not amused by the sight and sound of my presence. I was trying to act calm, but after about 30 seconds, I realized it wasn't working. The look on his face told me I was not getting through to the man. He stared at me, saying nothing, while I explained from my crouch in the back seat of the cab that I was late for breakfast with the governor and Ted Kennedy. Then, he suddenly stiffened and began shouting at the cab driver, What kind of dumb shit are you trying to pull, buddy? Don't you know where you are? Before the cabbie could answer, the trooper smacked the flat of his hand down on the hood so hard that the whole cab rattled. You, shut this engine. Then he pointed at me. You, out of the cab. Let's see some identification. He reached out for my wallet and motioned for me to follow him into the gatehouse. The cabbie started to follow, but the trooper waved him back. Stay right where you are, good buddy. I'll get to you. The look on my driver's face said we were both going to jail, and it was my fault. It wasn't my day to come out here, he whined. This guy told me he was invited for breakfast with the governor. The trooper was looking at the press cards in my wallet. I was already pouring sweat, and just as he looked over at me, I realized I was holding a can of beer in my hand. You always bring your own beer when you have breakfast with the governor, he asked. I shrugged and dropped it in a nearby wastebasket. You, he shouted. What do you think you're doing? The scene went on for another 20 minutes. There were many phone calls, a lot of yelling, and finally the trooper reached somebody in the mansion who agreed to locate Senator Kennedy and ask if he knew some guy named Thompson. I got him down here. He's all beard up and wants to come up there for breakfast. Jesus, I thought. That's all Kennedy needs to hear. Right in the middle of breakfast with the governor of Georgia, some nervous old darky shuffles in from the kitchen to announce that the trooper down at the gatehouse is holding some drunkard who says he's a friend of Senator Kennedy's and he wants to come in and have breakfast. Which was, in fact, a lie. I had not been invited for breakfast with the governor, and up to that point, I had done everything in my power to avoid it. Breakfast is the only meal of the day that I tend to view with the same kind of traditionalized reverence that most people associate with lunch and dinner. I like to eat breakfast alone, and almost never before noon. Anybody with a terminally jangled lifestyle needs at least one psychic anchor every 24 hours, and mine is breakfast. In Hong Kong, Dallas, or at home, and regardless of whether or not I have been to bed, Breakfast is a personal ritual that can only be properly observed alone and in a spirit of genuine excess. The food factor should always be massive. Four Bloody Marys, two grapefruits, a pot of coffee, Rangoon crepes, a half pound of either sausage, bacon, or corned beef hash with diced chilies, a Spanish omelet or eggs benedict, a quart of milk, a chopped lemon for random seasoning, and something like a slice of key lime pie, two margaritas, and six lines of the best cocaine for dessert. Right. And there should also be two or three newspapers, all mail and messages, a telephone, a notebook for planning the next 24 hours, and at least one source of good music. All of which should be dealt with outside in the warmth of a hot sun, and preferably stone naked. 
It is not going to be easy for those poor bastards out in San Francisco who have been waiting all day in a condition of extreme fear and anxiety for my long and finely reasoned analysis of the meaning of Jimmy Carter to come roaring out of my faithful mojo wire and across 2,000 miles of telephone line to understand why I am sitting here in a Texas motel full of hookers and writing at length on the meaning of breakfast. But like almost everything else worth understanding, the explanation for this is deceptively quick and basic. After more than 10 years of trying to deal with politics and politicians in a professional manner, I have finally come to the harsh understanding that there is no way at all. Not even for a doctor of chemotherapy with total access to the whole spectrum of legal and illegal drugs, the physical constitution of a mule shark, and a brain as rare and sharp and original as the Sloat Diamond, to function as a political journalist without abandoning the whole concept of a decent breakfast. I have worked like 12 bastards for more than a decade to be able to have it both ways. But the conflict is too basic and too deeply rooted in the nature of both politics and breakfast to ever be reconciled. It is one of those very few great forks in the road of life that cannot be avoided, like a Jesuit priest who is also a practicing nudist with a $200 a day smack habit wanting to be the first naked pope, or Pope Naked the First, if we want to use the language of the church or a vegetarian pacifist with a 44 Magnum fetish who wants to run for president without giving up his membership in the National Rifle Association or his New York City pistol permit that allows him to wear twin six guns on Meet the Press, Face the Nation, and all of his press conferences. There are some combinations that nobody can handle. Shooting bats on the wing with a double-barreled 410 and a head full of Jimson weed is one of them. And another is the idea that it is possible for a freelance writer with at least four close friends named Jones to cover a hopelessly scrambled presidential campaign better than any six-man team of career political journalists on the New York Times or the Washington Post and still eat a three-hour breakfast in the sun every morning. But I had not made the final decision on that morning when I rolled up to the gatehouse of the governor's mansion in Atlanta to have breakfast with Jimmy Carter and Ted Kennedy. My reason for being there at that hour was simply to get my professional schedule back in phase with Kennedy's political obligations for that day. He was scheduled to address a crowd of establishment heavies who would convene at the University of Georgia Law School at 10.30 in the morning to officially witness the unveiling of a huge and prestigious oil portrait of former Secretary of State Dean Rusk. And his tentative schedule for Saturday called for him to leave the governor's mansion after breakfast and make the 60-mile trip to Athens by means of the governor's official airplane. So, in order to hook up with Kennedy and make the trip with him, I had no choice but to meet him for breakfast at the mansion, where he had spent the previous night at Carter's invitation. Oddly enough, I had also been invited to spend Friday night in a bedroom at the governor's mansion. I had come down from Washington with Kennedy on Friday afternoon, and since I was the only journalist traveling with him that weekend, Governor Carter had seen fit to include me when he invited the Kennedy party to overnight at the mansion instead of a downtown hotel. But I am rarely in the right frame of mind to spend the night in the house of a politician. At least, not if I can spend it anywhere else. And on the previous night, I figured I would be a lot happier in a room at the Regency Hyatt House than I would in the Georgia governor's mansion, which may or may not have been true, but regardless of all that, I still had to be at the mansion for breakfast if I wanted to get any work done that weekend, and my work was to stay with Ted Kennedy. The scene at the gate had unhinged me so thoroughly that I couldn't find the door I'd been told to knock on when I finally got out of my cab at the mansion. And by the time I finally got inside, I was in no shape at all to deal with Jimmy Carter and his whole family. I didn't even recognize Carter when he met me at the door. All I knew was that a middle-aged man wearing Levi's was taking me into the dining room, where I insisted on sitting down for a while until the tremors passed. One of the first things I noticed about Carter, after I'd calmed down a bit, was the relaxed and confident way he handled himself with Ted Kennedy. 
The contrast between the two was so stark that I am still surprised whenever I hear somebody talking about the eerie resemblance between Carter and John F. Kennedy. I have never noticed it, except every once in a while in some carefully staged photograph, and if there was ever a time when it seems like any such resemblance should have been impossible to miss, it was that morning in Atlanta when I walked into the dining room and saw Jimmy Carter and Ted Kennedy sitting about six feet apart at the same table. Kennedy, whose presence usually dominates any room he walks into, was sitting there looking stiff and vaguely uncomfortable in his dark blue suit and black shoes. He glanced up as I entered and smiled faintly, then went back to staring at a portrait on the wall on the other side of the room. Paul Kirk, his executive wizard, was sitting next to him, wearing the same blue suit and black shoes. And Jimmy King, his executive advance man, was off in a distant corner yelling into a telephone. There were about 15 other people in the room, most of them laughing and talking. And it took me a while to notice that nobody was talking to Kennedy which is a very rare thing to see, particularly in any situation involving other politicians or even politically conscious people. Kennedy was obviously not in a very gregarious mood that morning, and I didn't learn why until an hour or so later when I found myself in one of the Secret Service cars with King, Kirk, and Kennedy running at top speed on the highway to Athens. The mood in the car was ugly. Kennedy was yelling at the SS driver for missing a turnoff that meant we'd be late for the unveiling. When we finally got there and I had a chance to talk privately with Jimmy King, he said Carter had waited until the last minute, just before I got to the mansion, to advise Kennedy that a sudden change in his own plans made it impossible for him to lend Teddy his plane for the trip to Athens. That was the reason for the tension I half noticed when I got to the mansion. King had been forced to get on the phone immediately and locate the Secret Service detail and get two cars out to the mansion immediately. By the time they arrived, it was obvious that we would not get to Athens in time for the unveiling of Rusk's portrait, which was fine with me, but Kennedy was scheduled to speak and he was very unhappy. I refused to participate in any ceremony honoring a warmonger like Rusk, so I told King I would look around on the edge of the campus for a bar and then meet them for lunch at the cafeteria for the Law Day luncheon. He was happy enough to see me go because in the space of three or four minutes, I had insulted a half dozen people. There was a beer parlor about ten minutes away, and I stayed there in relative peace until it was time for the luncheon. There was no way to miss the campus cafeteria. There was a curious crowd of about 200 students waiting to catch a glimpse of Ted Kennedy, who was signing autographs and moving slowly up the concrete steps toward the door as I approached. Jimmy King saw me coming and waited by the door. Well, you missed the unveiling, he said with a smile. You feel better? Not much, I replied. They should have run the bloodthirsty bastard up a flagpole by his heels. King started to smile again, but his mouth suddenly froze, and I looked to my right just in time to see Dean Rusk's swollen face about 18 inches away from my own. King reached out to shake his hand. Congratulations, sir, he said. We're all very proud of you. Balls, I muttered. After Rusk had gone inside, King stared at me and shook his head sadly. Why can't you give the old man some peace, he said. He's harmless now. Jesus, you'll get us in trouble yet. Don't worry, I said. He's deaf as a rock. Maybe so, King replied. But some of those people with him can hear okay. One of the women over there at the ceremony asked me who you were, and I said you were an undercover agent. But she was still pissed off about what you said. You should have Senator Kennedy teach him some manners, she told me. Not even a government agent should be allowed to talk like that in public. Like what, I said? That stuff about the blood on his hands? King laughed. Yeah, that really jolted her. Jesus, Hunter, you gotta remember, these are genteel people. He nodded solemnly. And this is their turf. Dean Rusk is a goddamn national hero down here. What are his friends supposed to think when the senator comes down from Washington to deliver the eulogy at the unveiling of Rusk's portrait and he brings some guy with him who starts asking people why the artist didn't paint any blood on the hands? Don't worry, I said. 
Just tell them it's part of my deep cover. Hell, nobody connects me with Kennedy anyway. I've been careful to stay a safe distance away from you bastards. You think I want to be seen at a ceremony honoring Dean Rusk? Don't kid yourself, he said as we walked inside. They know you're with us. You wouldn't be here if they didn't. This is a very exclusive gathering, my boy. We're the only ones on the guest list without some kind of very serious title. They're all either judges or state senators or the right honorable this, the right honorable that. I looked around the room and indeed, there was no mistaking the nature of the crowd. This was not just a bunch of good old boys who all happened to be alumni of the University of Georgia Law School. These were the honored alumni, the ranking 150 or so who had earned, stolen, or inherited enough distinction to be called from the lists and invited to the unveiling of Rusk's portrait, followed by a luncheon with Senator Kennedy, Governor Carter, Judge Crater, and numerous other hyper-distinguished guests whose names I forget. And Jimmy King was right. This was not a natural habitat for anybody wearing dirty white basketball shoes, no tie, and nothing except Rolling Stone to follow his name on the guest list in that space reserved for titles. If it had been a gathering of distinguished alumni from the University of Georgia Medical School, the title space on the guest list would have been in front of the names, and I would have fit right in. Hell, I could even have joined a few conversations, and nobody would have given a second thought to any talk about blood on the hands. Right, but this was law day in Georgia, and I was the only doctor in the room. So, I had to be passed off as some kind of undercover agent, traveling for unknown reasons with Senator Kennedy. Not even the Secret Service agents understand my role in the entourage. All they knew was that I had walked off the plane from Washington with Teddy, and I had been with them ever since. Nobody gets introduced to a Secret Service agent. They are expected to know who everybody is. And if they don't know, they act like they do and hope for the best. It is not my want to take undue advantage of the Secret Service. We have gone through some heavy times together, as it were. And ever since I wandered into a room in the Baltimore Hotel in New York one night during the 1972 campaign and found three SS agents smoking a joint, I have felt pretty much at ease around them. So it seemed only natural down in Georgia to ask one of the four agents in our detail for the keys to the trunk of his car so I could lock my leather satchel in a safe place instead of carrying it around with me. Actually, the agent had put the bag in the trunk on his own rather than give me the key. But when I sat down at our table in the cafeteria and saw that the only available beverage was iced tea, I remembered that one of the things in my satchel was a quart of wild turkey, and I wanted it. On the table in front of me and everyone else was a tall glass of iced tea that looked to be the same color as bourbon. Each glass had a split slice of lemon on its rim. So I removed the lemon poured the tea into Paul Kirk's water glass, and asked one of the agents at the next table for the key to the trunk. He hesitated for a moment, but one of the law school deans, or maybe Judge Crater, was already talking into the mic up there at the speaker's table, so the path of least disturbance was to give me the key, which he did. And I thought nothing of it until I got outside and opened the trunk. Kazart! If your life ever gets dull... Check out the trunk of the next SS car you happen to see. You won't need a key. They open just as easily as any other trunk when a six-foot whip steel is properly applied. But open the bugger carefully, because those gentlemen keep about 69 varieties of instant death inside. Jesus! I was literally staggered by the massive weaponry in the back of that car. There were machine guns, gas masks, hand grenades cartridge belts, tear gas canisters, ammo boxes, bulletproof vests, chains, saws, and probably a lot of other things. But all of a sudden I realized that two passing students had stopped right next to me on the sidewalk, and I heard one of them say, God Almighty, look at that stuff! So I quickly filled my glass with wild turkey, put the bottle back in the trunk, and slammed it shut just like you'd slam any other trunk. And that was when I turned around to see Jimmy Carter coming at me with his head down, his teeth bared, and his eyes so wildly dilated that he looked like a springtime bat. What? 
No, that was later in the day, on my third or fourth trip to the trunk with the iced tea glass. I've been sitting here in a frozen, bewildered stupor for 50 or 55 minutes, trying to figure out where that last image came from. My memories of that day are extremely vivid for the most part, and the more I think back on it now, the more certain I am that whatever I might have seen coming at me in that kind of bent-over, fast-swooping style of the springtime bat was not Governor Carter. Probably, it was a hunchbacked student on his way to final exams in the School of Landscaping. Or maybe just trying to walk fast and tie his shoes at the same time. Or, it could have been nothing at all. There is no mention in my notebook about anything trying to sneak up on me in a high-speed crouch while I was standing out there in the street. According to my notes, in fact, Jimmy Carter had arrived at the cafeteria not long after Kennedy. And, if he attracted any attention from the crowd that had come to see Teddy, I would probably have noticed it and made at least a small note to emphasize the contrast in style. Something like, 1209, Carter suddenly appears in slow-moving crowd behind TK. No autographs, no bodyguards, and now a blue plastic suit instead of Levi's, slash, no recognition, no greetings, just a small sandy-haired man looking for somebody to shake hands with. That is the kind of note I would have made if I'd noticed his arrival at all. Which I didn't. Because it was not until around 10 o'clock on the night of the New Hampshire primary, almost two years later, that there was any real reason for a journalist to make a note on the time and style of Jimmy Carter's arrival for any occasion at all and especially not in a crowd that had come to rub shoulders with big-time heavies like Ted Kennedy and Dean Rusk. He is not an imposing figure in any way, and even now, with his face on every TV screen in the country at least five nights a week, I'd be tempted to bet $100 to anybody else's 500 that Jimmy Carter could walk by himself and in a normal noonday crowd from one end of Chicago's huge O'Hare airport to the other, without being recognized by anybody. Or at least not by anybody who had never met him personally, or who had not seen him anywhere except on TV. Because there is nothing about Carter that would make him any more noticeable than anyone else you might pass in one of those long and crowded corridors in O'Hare. He could pass for a fuller brush man on any street in America. But if Jimmy Carter had decided, 15 years ago, to sign on as a brush and gym crack salesman for the Fuller people, he would be president of the Fuller Brush Company today, and every medicine chest in the country would be loaded with Carter Fuller brushes. And if he had gone into the heroin business, every respectable household between Long Island and Los Angeles would have at least one resident junkie. Ah, but that is not what we need to be talking about right now, is it? The only thing I remember about the first hour or so of that luncheon was a powerful sense of depression with the life I was drifting into. According to the program, we were in for a long run of speeches, remarks, comments, etc., on matters connected with the law school. Carter and Kennedy were the last two names on the list of speakers, which meant there was no hope of leaving early. I thought about going back to the beer parlor and watching a baseball game on TV, but King warned me against it. We don't know how long this goddamn thing is going to last, he said, and that's a hell of a long walk from here, isn't it? I knew what he was getting at. Just as soon as the program was over, the SS caravan would rush us out to the Athens airport where Carter's plane was waiting to fly us back to Atlanta. Another big dinner banquet was scheduled for 6.30 that night, and immediately after that, a long flight back to Washington. Nobody would miss me if I wanted to go to the beer parlor, King said, but nobody would miss me when the time came to leave for the airport either. One of the constant nightmares of traveling with politicians is the need to keep them in sight at all times. Every presidential campaign has its own fearful litany of horror stories about reporters, and occasionally even a key staff member who thought they had plenty of time to run across the street for a quick beer instead of hanging around in the rear of some grim auditorium, half listening to the drone of a long familiar speech, only to come back in 20 minutes to find the auditorium empty and no sign of the press bus, the candidate, or anybody who can tell him where they went. These stories are invariably set in places like Butte, 
Buffalo, or Ice Pick, Minnesota on a night in the middle of March. The temperature is always below zero, there's usually a raging blizzard to keep cabs off the street, and just as the victim remembers that he has left his wallet in his overcoat on the press bus, his stomach erupts with a sudden attack of ptomaine poisoning. And then, while crawling around on his knees in some ice-covered alley and racked with fits of projectile vomiting, he is grabbed by vicious cops and whipped on the shins with a nightstick then locked in the drunk tank of the local jail and buggered all night by winos. These stories abound, and there's just enough truth in them to make most campaign journalists so fearful of a sudden change in the schedule that they will not even go looking for a bathroom until the pain becomes unendurable, and at least three reliable people have promised to fetch them back to the fold at the first sign of any movement that could signal an early departure. The closest I ever came to getting left behind was during the California primary in 1972, when I emerged from a bathroom in the Salinas Railroad Depot and realized that the caboose car of McGovern's victory train was about a hundred yards further down the tracks than it had been only three minutes earlier. George was still standing outside the platform waving to the crowd, but the train was moving. And as I started my sprint through the crowd, running over women, children, cripples, and anything else that couldn't get out of my way, I thought I saw a big grin on McGovern's face as the train began picking up speed. I am still amazed that I caught up with the goddamn thing without blowing every valve in my heart, or even missing the iron ladder when I made my last second leap and being swept under the train and chopped in half by the wheels. Ever since then... I have not been inclined to take many risks while traveling in strange territory with politicians. Even the very few who might feel a bit guilty about leaving me behind would have to do it anyway, because they are all enslaved by their schedules, and when it comes to a choice between getting to the airport on time or waiting for a journalist who has wandered off to seek booze, they will shrug and race off to the airport. This is particularly true when you travel with Kennedy, who moves at all times with a speedy, split-second precision on a schedule that nobody except a perfectly organized presidential candidate would even try to keep pace with. When he's traveling with a detail of Secret Service agents, the caravan stops for nothing and waits for nobody. The SS agents assigned to Kennedy are hypersensitive about anything that might jack up the risk factor, and they move on the theory that safety increases with speed. There was no need for King and Kirk to warn me that the SS detail would have a collective nervous breakdown at the prospect of taking Senator Kennedy and the governor of Georgia through the streets of downtown Athens, or any other city for that matter, to search for some notoriously criminal journalist who might be in any one of the half-dozen bars and beer parlors on the edge of the campus. So there was nothing to do except sit there in the university cafeteria, slumped in my chair at a table right next to Dean Rusk's, and drink one tall glass after another of straight wild turkey until the Law Day luncheon ceremonies were finished. After my third trip out to the trunk, the SS driver apparently decided that it was easier to just let me keep the car keys instead of causing a disturbance every 15 or 20 minutes by passing them back and forth which made a certain kind of fatalistic sense, because I'd already had plenty of time to do just about anything I wanted to with the savage contents of his trunk, so why start worrying now? We had, after all, been together for the better part of two days, and the agents were beginning to understand that there was no need to reach for their weapons every time I started talking about the blood on Dean Rusk's hands, or how easily I could reach over and cut off his ears with my steak knife. Most Secret Service agents have led a sheltered life, and they tend to get edgy when they hear that kind of talk from a large stranger in their midst who has managed to stash an apparently endless supply of powerful whiskey right in the middle of their trunk arsenal. That is not one of your normal, everyday situations in the SS life, and especially not when this drunkard who keeps talking about taking a steak knife to the head of a former Secretary of State has a red flag on his file in the Washington SS headquarters in addition to having the keys to the SS car in his pocket. Carter was already speaking when I came back from my fourth or fifth trip out to the car. I'd been careful all along to keep the slice of lemon on the rim of the glass, so it looked like all the other iced tea glasses in the room. But Jimmy King was beginning to get nervous about the smell. 
God damn it, Hunter. This whole end of the room smells like a distillery, he said. Balls, I said. That's blood you're smelling. King winced, and I thought I saw Rusk's head start to swing around on me, but apparently he thought better of it. For at least two hours, he'd been hearing all this ugly talk about blood coming over his shoulder from what he knew was the Kennedy table right behind him. But why would a group of Secret Service agents and Senator Kennedy's personal staff be talking about him like that? And why was this powerful stench of whiskey hanging around his head? Were they all drunk? Not all, but I was rapidly closing the gap and the others had been subjected to the fumes for so long that I could tell by the sound of their laughter that even the SS agents were acting a little weird. Maybe it was a contact drunk of some kind, acting in combination with the fumes and fiendish drone of the speeches. We were trapped in that place, and nobody else at the table liked it any better than I did. I'm still not sure when I began listening to what Carter was saying, but at some point about ten minutes into his remarks, I noticed a marked difference in the style and tone of the noise coming from the speaker's table, and I found myself listening for the first time all day. Carter had started off with a few quiet jokes about people feeling honored to pay 10 or $12 a head to hear Kennedy speak. But the only way he could get people to listen to him was to toss in a free lunch along with his remarks. The audience laughed politely a few times, but after he'd been talking for about 15 minutes, I noticed a general uneasiness in the atmosphere of the room, and nobody was laughing anymore. At that point, we were all still under the impression that Carter's remarks would consist of a few minutes of friendly talk about the law school, a bit of praise for Rusk, an introduction to Kennedy, and that would be it. But we were wrong, and the tension in the room kept increasing as more and more people realized it. Very few, if any of them, had supported Carter when he won the governorship, and now that he was just about finished with his four-year term and barred by law from running again, they expected him to bow out gracefully and go back to raising peanuts. If he had chosen that occasion to announce that he decided to run for president in 1976, the reaction would almost certainly have been a ripple of polite laughter, because they would know he was kidding. Carter had not been a bad governor, but so what? We were, after all, in Georgia, and besides that, the South already had one governor running for president. Back in the spring of 1974, George Wallace was a national power. He had rattled the hell out of that big cage called the Democratic National Committee in 1972, and when he said he planned to do it again in 76, he was taken very seriously. So I would probably have chuckled along with the others if Carter had said something about running for president at the beginning of his remarks that day, but I would not have chuckled if he'd said it at the end because it was a king hell bastard of a speech, and by the time it was over, he had rung every bell in the room. Nobody seemed to know exactly what to make of it, but they knew it was sure as hell not what they'd come there to hear. I have heard hundreds of speeches by all kinds of candidates and politicians, usually against my will and for generally the same reasons I got trapped into hearing this one but I have never heard a sustained piece of political oratory that impressed me any more than the speech Jimmy Carter made on that Saturday afternoon in May 1974. It ran about 45 minutes, climbing through five very distinct gear changes while the audience muttered uneasily and raised their eyebrows at each other, and one of the most remarkable things about the speech is that it is such a rare piece of oratorical artwork that it remains vastly impressive, even if you don't necessarily believe Carter was sincere and truthful in all the things he said. Viewed purely in the context of rhetorical drama and political theater, it ranks with General Douglas MacArthur's Old Soldiers Never Die address to the Congress in 1951, which still stands as a masterpiece of insane bullshit, if nothing else. There were, however, a lot of people who believed every word and sigh of MacArthur's speech, and they wanted to make him president, just as a lot of people who were still uncertain about Jimmy Carter would want to make him president if he could figure out some way to deliver a contemporary version of his 1974 Law Day speech on network TV. Or hell, 
even the same identical speech. A national audience might be slightly puzzled by some of the references to obscure judges, grade school teachers, and backwoods Georgia courthouses, but I think the totality of the speech would have the same impact today as it did two years ago. But there's not much chance of it happening. And that brings up another remarkable aspect of the Law Day speech. It had virtually no impact at all when he delivered it, except on the people who heard it. And most of them were more stunned and puzzled by it than impressed. They had not come there to hear lawyers denounced as running dogs of the status quo. And there is still some question in my own mind, and in Carter's too, I suspect, about what he came there to say. There was no written text of the speech, no press to report it, no audience hungry to hear it, and no real reason for giving it, except that Jimmy Carter had a few serious things on his mind that day, and he figured it was about time to unload them, whether the audience liked it or not. Which gets to another interesting point of the speech. Although Carter himself now says, that was probably the best speech I ever made, he has yet to make another one like it not even to the extent of lifting some of the best images and ideas of incorporation into his current speeches. And his campaign staff attached so little importance to it that Carter's only tape recording of his Law Day remarks got lost somewhere in the files and, until about two months ago, the only existing tape of the speech was the one I'd had copied off the original before it was lost. I've been carrying the bastard around with me for two years, playing it in some extremely unlikely situations for people who would look at me like I was finally over the hump in determinal brain damage when I'd say they were going to have to spend the next 45 minutes listening to a political speech by some ex-governor of Georgia. It was not until I showed up in New Hampshire and Massachusetts for the 76 primaries and started playing my tape of the Law Day speech for a few friends, journalists, and even some of Carter's top staff people who'd never heard it that Pat Cadell noticed that almost everybody who heard the speech was as impressed by it as I was. But even now, after Cadell arranged to dub 50 tape copies off of my copy, nobody in Carter's brain trust has figured out what to do with them. I am not quite sure what I would do with them myself, if I were Carter, because it is entirely possible that the very qualities that made the Law Day speech so impressive for me would have exactly the opposite effect on Carter's new national constituency. The voice I hear on my tape is the same one all those good conservative folk out there on the campaign trail have found so appealing, but very few of them would find anything familiar in what the voice is saying. The Jimmy Carter who has waltzed so triumphantly down the middle of the road through one Democratic primary after another is a cautious, conservative, and vaguely ethereal Baptist Sunday school teacher who seems to promise, above all else, a return to normalcy, a resurrection of the national self-esteem, and a painless redemption from all the horrors and disillusion of Watergate. With President Carter's firm hand on the helm, the ship of state will once again sail a true and steady course. All the crooks and liars and thieves who somehow got control of the government during the turmoil of the 60s will be driven out of the temple once and for all, and the White House will be so overflowing with honesty, decency, justice, love, and compassion that it might even glow in the dark. It is a very alluring vision, and nobody understands this better than Jimmy Carter. The electorate feels a need to be cleansed, reassured, and revitalized. The underdogs of yesteryear have had their day, and they blew it. The radicals and reformers of the 60s promised peace, but they turned out to be nothing but incompetent troublemakers. Their plans that had looked so fine on paper led to chaos and disaster when hack politicians tried to implement them. The promise of civil rights turned into the nightmare of busing. The call for law and order led straight to Watergate. And the long struggle between the hawks and the doves caused violence in the streets and a military disaster in Vietnam. Nobody won in the end, and when the dust finally settled, extremists at both ends of the political spectrum were thoroughly discredited. And by the time the 1976 presidential campaign got underway, the high ground was all in the middle of the road.
Jimmy Carter understands this, and he has tailored his campaign image to fit the new mood almost perfectly. But back in May of 74, when he flew up to Athens to make his remarks at the Law Day ceremonies, he was not as concerned with preserving his moderate image as he is now. He was thinking more about all the trouble he'd had with judges, lawyers, lobbyists, and other minions of the Georgia establishment while he was governor. And now, with only six more months in the office, he wanted to have a few words with these people. There was not much anger in his voice when he started talking, but halfway through the speech, it was too obvious for anybody in the room to ignore. But there was no way to cut him short, and he knew it. It was the anger in his voice that first caught my attention, I think. But what sent me back out to the trunk to get my tape recorder instead of another drink was the spectacle of a Southern politician telling a crowd of Southern judges and lawyers that I'm not qualified to talk to you about law because in addition to being a peanut farmer, I'm an engineer and nuclear physicist, not a lawyer. But I read a lot, and I listen a lot, one of the sources for my understanding about the proper application of criminal justice and the system of equities is from Reinhold Niebuhr. The other source of my understanding about what's right and wrong in this society is from a friend of mine, a poet named Bob Dylan. Listening to his records about the lonesome death of Hattie Carroll and Like a Rolling Stone and the times they are a-changin', I've learned to appreciate the dynamism of change in a modern society. At first, I wasn't sure I was hearing him right, and I looked over at Jimmy King. What the hell did I just hear, I asked. King smiled and looked at Paul Kirk, who leaned across the table and whispered, he said his top two advisors are Bob Dylan and Reinhold Niebuhr. I nodded and got up to go outside for my tape recorder. I could tell by the rising anger in Carter's voice that we were in for an interesting ride. And by the time I got back, he was whipping on the crowd about judges who took bribes in return for reduced prison sentences, lawyers who deliberately cheated illiterate blacks, and cops who abused people's rights with something they called a consent warrant. I had lunch this week with the members of the Judicial Selection Committee, and they were talking about a consent search warrant, he said. I didn't know what a consent search warrant was. They said, well, that's when two policemen go to a house, one of them goes to the front door and knocks on it, and the other one runs around to the back door and yells, come in. The crowd got a laugh out of that one, but Carter was just warming up and for the next 20 or 30 minutes, his voice was the only sound in the room. Kennedy was sitting just a few feet to Carter's left, listening carefully but never changing the thoughtful expression on his face as Carter railed and bitched about a system of criminal justice that allows the rich and the privileged to escape punishment for their crimes and sends poor people to prison because they can't afford to bribe the judge. Jesus babbling Christ! The phone is ringing again, and this time I know what it is for sure. Last time it was the land commissioner of Texas threatening to have my legs broken because of something I wrote about him. But now it is the Grim Reaper. He has come for my final page, and in exactly 13 minutes that goddamn mojo wire across the room will erupt in a frenzy of beeping, and I will have to feed it again. But before I leave this filthy sweat box that is costing me $39 a day, I am going to deal with that rotten mojo machine. I have dreamed of smashing that fucker for five long years, but... Okay, okay. Twelve more minutes and... Yes. So this will have to be it. I would need a lot more time and space than I have to properly describe either the reality or the reaction to Jimmy Carter's Law Day speech which was, and still is, the heaviest and most eloquent thing I have ever heard from the mouth of a politician. It was the voice of an angry agrarian populist, extremely precise in its judgments and laced with some of the most original, brilliant, and occasionally bizarre political metaphors anybody in that room will ever be likely to hear. The final turn of the screw was another ugly example of crime and degradation in the legal profession. And this time, Carter went right to the top. Nixon had just released his own self-serving version of the White House tapes, and Carter was shocked when he read the transcripts. 
The Constitution charges us with a direct responsibility for determining what our government is and ought to be, he said. And then, after a long pause, he went on, Well, I have read parts of the embarrassing transcripts, and I have seen the proud statement of a former attorney general who protected his boss and now brags of the fact that he tiptoed through a minefield and came out, quote, clean, unquote. Another pause, and then, you know, I can't imagine somebody like Thomas Jefferson tiptoeing through a minefield on the technicalities of the law, and then bragging about being clean afterwards. Forty-five minutes later, on our way back to Atlanta in the governor's small plane, I told Carter I wanted a transcript of his speech. There is no transcript, he said. I smiled, thinking he was putting me on. The speech had sounded like a product of five or six tortured drafts. But he showed a page and a half of scrawled notes in his legal pad and said that was all he had. Jesus Christ, I said. That was one of the damnedest things I've ever heard. You mean you just winged it all the way through? He shrugged and smiled faintly. Well, he said, I had a pretty good idea what I was going to say before I came up here but I guess I was a little surprised at how it came out. Kennedy didn't have much to say about the speech. He said he'd enjoyed it, but he still seemed uncomfortable and preoccupied for some reason. Carter and I talked about the time he invited Dylan and some of his friends out to the governor's mansion after a concert in Atlanta. I really enjoyed it, he said with a big grin. It was a real honor to have him visit my home. I had already decided by then that I liked Jimmy Carter, but I had no idea that he'd made up his mind a few months earlier to run for the presidency in 1976, and if he told me his little secret that day on the plane back to Atlanta, I'm not sure I'd have taken him seriously. But if he had told me, and if I'd taken him seriously, I would probably have said that he could have my vote for no other reason except the speech I'd just heard which hardly matters because Jimmy Carter didn't mention the presidency to me that day, and I had other things on my mind. It was the first Saturday in May, Derby Day in Louisville, and I'd been harassing Jimmy King since early morning about getting us back to Atlanta in time to watch the race on TV. According to the schedule, we were due back at the governor's mansion around 3 in the afternoon, and post time for the Derby was 4.30. But I have learned to be leery of politicians' schedules. They were about as reliable as campaign promises, and when I'd mentioned to Kennedy that I felt it was very important to get ourselves back to Atlanta in time for the Derby, I could tell by the look on his face that the only thing that might cause him to go out of his way to watch the Kentucky Derby was a written guarantee from the Churchill Downs management that I would be staked down on the track at the finish line when the horses came thundering down the stretch. But Carter was definitely up for it, and he assured me that we would be back at the mansion in plenty of time for me to make all the bets I wanted before post time. We'll even try to find a mint julep for you, he said. Rosalind has some mint in the garden, and I notice you already have the main ingredient. When we got to the mansion, I found a big TV set in one of the basement guest rooms. The mint juleps were no problem but the only bet I could get was a $5 gig with Jody Powell, Carter's press secretary, which I won, and then compounded the insult by insisting that Powell pay off immediately. He had to wander around the mansion borrowing dollars and even quarters from anybody who would lend him money until he could scrape up $5. Later that night, we endured another banquet, and immediately afterward, I flew back to Washington with Kennedy, King, and Kirk. Kennedy was still in a funk about something, and I thought it was probably me. And while it was true that I had not brought any great distinction to the entourage, I'd made enough of an effort to know that it could have been worse. And just to make sure he understood that, or maybe for reasons of sheer perversity, I waited until we were all strapped into our seats and I heard the stewardess asking Teddy if she could bring him a drink. He refused, as he always does in public, and just as the stewardess finished her spiel, I leaned over the seat and said, How about some heroin? His face went stiff, and for a moment I thought it was all over for me. 
but then I noticed that King and Kirk were smiling. So I strangled the sloat and walked back to my hotel in the rain. The last crazed charge of the Liberal Brigade. The shrewdness of Richard Nixon, the deep and abiding courage of Hubert Humphrey, and all of his newfound friends. Jimmy Carter at home in Plains. One year later, the leap of faith. Special Bulletin. Beaumont, Texas, April 29th. Anarchist presidential candidate Hunter S. Thompson announced yesterday during opening ceremonies at the Beaumont Annual Stock Auction that Democratic frontrunner Jimmy Carter was the only candidate who ever lied to me twice in one day. Thompson's harsh denunciation of Carter, who was also at the auction for purposes of wrestling his own bull, came as a nasty shock to the crowd of celebrities, bull wranglers, and other politicos who were gathered to participate in ceremonies honoring Texas Land Commissioner Bob Armstrong, who followed Thompson's attack on Carter with an unexpected statement of his own, saying he would be the number two man on a Dark Horse's demo ticket with Colorado Senator Gary Hart. Armstrong also denounced Carter for consciously lying to me about the price of his bull. The Carter-owned animal, a two-year-old peanut-fed Brahmin, had been advertised at a price of $2,200. But when the front-runner showed up in Beaumont to ride his own bull, the price suddenly escalated to $7,750. And it was at this point that both Thompson and Armstrong stunned the crowd with their back-to-back -back assaults on Carter long considered a personal friend of both men. Carter, who seemed shocked by the attacks, lied to newsmen who questioned him about the reason, saying, I didn't hear what they said. The Law Day speech is not the kind of thing that would have much appeal to the mind of a skilled technician, and that kind of mind is perhaps the only common denominator among the strategists, organizers, and advisors at the staff command level of Carter's campaign. Very few of them seem to have much interest in why Jimmy wants to be president, or even in what he might do after he wins. Their job and their meal ticket is to put Jimmy Carter in the White House. That is all they know and all they need to know, and so far they are doing their job pretty well. According to political odds maker Billy the Geek, Carter is now a solid 3 to 2 bet to win the November election, up from 50 to 1 less than six months ago. This is another likely reason why Carter's brain trust is not especially concerned with how to put the Law Day speech to good use. The people most likely to be impressed, or even converted by it, are mainly the ones who make up the left-slash-liberal, humanist-slash-intellectual wing of the Democratic Party and the national press. And in the wake of Carter's genuinely awesome blitzkrieg in Pennsylvania and Texas, destroying all of his remaining opposition in less than a week. It is hard to argue with the feeling among his staff command technicians that he no longer needs any converts from the left-slash-liberal wing of the party. He got where he is without the help he repeatedly asked him for during most of 1975 and early 76. And now the problem is theirs. The train has left the station, as it were, and anybody who wants to catch up with it now is going to come up with the airfare. But I have just been reminded by a terrible screeching on the telephone that the presses will roll in a few hours, and that means there is no more time at Rolling Stone than there is in the Carter campaign for wondering why about anything. Idle speculation is a luxury reserved for people who are too rich too poor, or too crazy to get seriously concerned about anything outside their own private realities. And just as soon as I finish this goddamn wretched piece of gibberish, I'm going to flee like a rat down a pipe into one of those categories. I've maintained a wild and serious flirtation with all three of them for so long that the flirtation itself was beginning to look like reality. But I see it now for the madness it was from the start. There is no way to maintain four parallel states of being at the same time. I know from long experience that it is possible to be rich, poor, and crazy all at once. But to be rich, poor, crazy, and also a functioning political journalist at the same time is flat-out impossible. 
So the time has come to make a terminal choice. But not quite yet. We still have to finish this twisted saga of vengeance and revelation in the shade of the Georgia Pines. So, what the hell? Let's get after it. There's plenty of room at the top in this bountiful nation of ours for a rich, poor, and crazy political journalist who can sit down at a rented typewriter in a Texas motel with a heart full of hate and a head full of speed and wild turkey and lash out a capsule-slash-narrative between midnight and dawn that will explain the whole meaning and tell the whole tale of the 1976 presidential campaign. Hell yes! Let's whip on this thing! Until I got that phone call a few minutes ago, I would have said it was absolutely impossible. But now I know better. If only because I've just been reminded that until I saw Hubert Humphrey quit the race a few days ago, I was telling anybody who would listen that there was no way to cure an egg-sucking dog. So, now is the time to finish this rotten job that I somehow got myself into, and also to congratulate my old buddy Hubert for having enough sense to ignore his advisors and keep the last faint glimmer of his presidential hopes alive by crouching in the weeds and praying for a brokered convention, instead of shooting his whole wad by entering the New Jersey primary and getting pushed off the wall and cracked like Humpty Dumpty by Jimmy Carter's technicians. I am beginning to sense a distinctly pejorative drift in this emphasis on the word technician, but it is only half intentional. There is nothing wrong with technicians, in politics or anywhere else. Any presidential campaign without a full complement of first-class political technicians, or with a drastic imbalance between technicians and ideologues, will meet the same fate that doomed the Fred Harris campaign in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. But the question of balance is critical. And there is something a little scary about a presidential campaign run almost entirely by technicians that can be as successful as Carter's. Awesome is the mildest word I can think of to describe a campaign that can take an almost totally unknown ex-governor of Georgia with no national reputation, no power base in the Democratic Party, and not the slightest reluctance to tell Walter Cronkite, John Chancellor, and anyone else who asks that the most important thing in my life is Jesus Christ, and to have him securely positioned after only nine of 32 primaries as an almost prohibitive favorite to win the presidential nomination of the nation's majority political party and an even bet to win the November election against a relatively popular GOP president who has managed somehow to convince both big labor and big business that he has just rescued the country from economic disaster. If the presidential election were held tomorrow, I would not bet more than three empty beer cans on Gerald Ford's chances of beating Jimmy Carter in November. What? No, cancel that bet. The screech on the telephone just informed me that Time has just released a poll on the day after the Texas primary saying Carter would beat Ford by 48% to 38% if the election were held now. Seven weeks ago, according to Time via the Screech, the current figures were almost exactly reversed. I have never been much with math, but a quick shuffling of these figures seems to mean that Carter has picked up 20 points in seven weeks, and Ford has lost 20. If this is true, then it is definitely time to call Billy the Geek and get something like 10 cases of 66-proof sloat ale down on Carter, and forget those three empty beer cans. In other words, the panic is on and the last survivors of the ill-fated Stop Carter movement are out in the streets shedding their uniforms and stacking their weapons on street corners all over Washington. And now, another phone call from CBS correspondent Ed Bradley, who is covering Carter now after starting the 76 campaign with Birch Bayh, saying Bayh will announce at a press conference in Washington tomorrow that he has decided to endorse Jimmy Carter. Well... How about that, eh? Never let it be said that a wharf rat can get off a sinking ship any faster than an 87% ADA liberal. But this is no time for cruel jokes about liberals and wharf rats. Neither species has ever been known for blind courage or stubborn devotion to principle. 
so let the rotters go wherever they feel even temporarily comfortable. Meanwhile, it is beginning to look like the time has come for the rest of us to get our business straight, because the only man who's going to keep Jimmy Carter out of the White House now is Jimmy Carter. Which might happen, but it is a hard kind of thing to bet on, because there is no precedent in the annals of presidential politics for a situation like this. With more than half the primary still ahead of him, Carter is now running virtually unopposed for the Democratic nomination and, barring some queer and unlikely development, he is going to have to spend the next two months in a holding action until he can go to New York in July and pick up the nomination. Just as soon as I can get some sleep and recover from this grim and useless ordeal, I will call him and find out what he plans to do with all that time. And if I were in that nervous position... I think I would call a press conference and announce that I was off to a secret think tank on the Zondo Peninsula to finalize my plans for curing all the ills of society. Because a lot of strange things can happen to a long-shot frontrunner in two months of forced idleness, and a lot of idle minds are going to have plenty of time for brooding on all the things that still worry them about living for at least the next four years with a president who prays 25 times a day and reads the Bible in Spanish every night. Even the people who plan to vote for Jimmy Carter, if he can hang on between now and November, are going to have more time than they need to nurse any lingering doubts they might have about him. I will probably nurse a few doubts of my own between now and July, for that matter, but unless something happens to convince me that I should waste any more time than I already have brooding on the evil potential that lurks, invariably, in the mind of just about anybody whose ego has become so dangerously swollen that he really wants to be President of the United States, I don't plan to spend much time worrying about the prospect of seeing Jimmy Carter in the White House. There is not a hell of a lot I can do about it, for one thing, and for another, I have spent enough time with Carter in the past two years to feel I have a pretty good sense of his candidacy. I went down to Plains, Georgia to spend a few days with him on his own turf and to hopefully find out who Jimmy Carter really was before the campaign shroud came down on him and he started talking like a candidate instead of a human being. Once a presidential aspirant gets out on the campaign trail and starts seeing visions of himself hunkered down behind that big desk in the Oval Office, the idea of sitting down in his own living room and talking openly with some foul-mouthed, argumentative journalist carrying a tape recorder in one hand and a bottle of wild turkey in the other is totally out of the question. But it was almost a year before the 76 New Hampshire primary when I talked to Carter at his home in Plains, and I came away from that weekend with six hours of taped conversation with him on subjects ranging all the way from the Allman Brothers, stock car racing, and our strongly conflicting views on the use of undercover agents in law enforcement, to nuclear submarines, the war in Vietnam, and the treachery of Richard Nixon. When I listened to the tapes again last week, I noticed a lot of things that I had not paid much attention to at the time. And the most obvious of these was the extremely detailed precision of his answers to some of the questions that he is now accused of being either unable or unwilling to answer. There is no question in my mind, after hearing him talk on the tapes, that I was dealing with a candidate who had already done a massive amount of research on things like tax reform, national defense, and the structure of the American political system by the time he announced his decision to run for president. Nor is there any question that there are a lot of things Jimmy Carter and I will never agree on. I had warned him before we sat down with the tape recorder for the first time that, although I appreciated his hospitality and felt surprisingly relaxed and comfortable in his home, I was also a journalist, and that some of the questions I knew I was going to ask him might seem unfriendly or even downright hostile. Because of this, I said... I wanted him to be able to stop the tape recorder by means of a remote pause button if the talk got too heavy. But he said he would just as soon not have to bother turning the tape on and off, which surprised me at the time, but now that I listen to the tapes, I realize that loose talk and bent humor are not among Jimmy Carter's vices. They are definitely among mine, however, and since I'd stayed up most of the night drinking and talking in the living room with his sons Jack and Chip Carter and their wives and then by myself in the guest room over the garage, 
I was still feeling weird around noon when we started talking seriously. And the tape of that first conversation is liberally sprinkled with my own twisted comments about rotten fascist bastards, thieving cocksuckers who peddle their asses all over Washington, and these goddamn brainless fools who refuse to serve liquor in the Atlanta airport on Sunday. It was nothing more than my normal way of talking, and Carter was already familiar with it. But there are strange and awkward pauses here and there on the tape where I can almost hear Carter gritting his teeth and wondering whether to laugh or get angry at things I wasn't even conscious of saying at the time, but which sound on the tape like random outbursts of hostility or pure madness from the throat of a paranoid psychotic. Most of the conversation is intensely rational, but every once in a while it slips over the line and all I can hear is the sound of my own voice yelling something like, Jesus Christ! What's that filthy smell? Both Carter and his wife have always been amazingly tolerant of my behavior, and on one or two occasions, they have had to deal with me in a noticeably bent condition. I've always been careful not to commit any felonies right in front of them, but other than that, I have never made much of an effort to adjust my behavior around Jimmy Carter or anyone else in his family, including his 78-year-old mother, Miss Lillian, who is the only member of the Carter family I could comfortably endorse for the presidency right now with no reservations at all. Whoops. Well, we will get to that in a moment. Right now, I have other things to deal with, and... No, what the hell? Let's get to it now, because time is running out, and so is that goddamn sloat. So now is the time to come to grips with my own Carter question. It has taken me almost a year to reach this point, and I'm still not sure how to cope with it. But I am getting there fast, thanks mainly to all the help I've been getting from my friends in the liberal community. I took more abuse from these petulant linthead bastards during the New Hampshire and Massachusetts primaries than I've ever taken from my friends on any political question since the first days of the free speech movement in Berkeley, and that was nearly 12 years ago. I felt the same way about the first wild, violent days of the FSM as I still feel about Jimmy Carter. In both cases, my initial reaction was positive, and I have lived too long on my instincts to start questioning them now. At least not until I get a good reason, and so far, nobody's been able to give me any good reason for junking my first instinctive reaction to Jimmy Carter, which was that I liked him. And if the editors of Time Magazine and the friends of Hubert Humphrey consider that bizarre, fuck them. I liked Jimmy Carter the first time I met him, and in the two years that have passed since that derby day in Georgia, I have come to know him a hell of a lot better than I knew George McGovern at this point in the 72 campaign, and I still like Jimmy Carter. He is one of the most intelligent politicians I've ever met, and also one of the strangest. I've never felt comfortable around people who talk about their feeling for Jesus, or any other deity for that matter, because they're usually none too bright. Or maybe stupid is a better way of saying it. But I've never seen much point in getting heavy with either stupid people or Jesus freaks, just as long as they don't bother me. In a world as weird and cruel as this one we have made for ourselves, I figure anybody who can find peace and personal happiness without ripping off somebody else deserves to be left alone. They will not inherit the earth, but then neither will I. And I have learned to live, as it were, with the idea that I will never find peace and happiness either. But as long as I know there's a pretty good chance I can get my hands on either one of them every once in a while, I do the best I can between high spots. And so much for all that gibberish. The bastards are taking the whole thing away from me now, and anything else I might have wanted to say about Jimmy Carter will have to wait for another time and place. At the moment, failing any new evidence that would cause me to change my mind, I would rather see Jimmy Carter in the White House than anybody else we're likely to be given a chance to vote for. And that narrows the field right down for now to Ford, Reagan, and Humphrey. Carter is the only unknown quantity of the four, and that fact alone says all I need to know. Admittedly, a vote for Carter requires a certain leap of faith, but on the evidence, I don't mind taking it. I think he is enough of an egomaniac 
to bring the same kind of intensity to the task of doing the job in a way that will allow him to stay as happy with his own mirror in the White House as he is now with his mirror in planes. There is also the fact that I have that Law Day speech to fall back on, which is a lot better reason to vote for him than anything I've seen or heard on the campaign trail. I have never thought the problem with Carter is that he is two-faced in the sense of a two-headed coin. But he is definitely a politician above all else right now, and that is the only way anybody gets into the White House. If Carter has two faces, my own feeling is that they are mounted one behind the other, but both looking in the same direction, instead of both ways at once, as the friends of Hubert Humphrey keep saying. It also occurs to me now and then that many of the people who feel so strongly about keeping Jimmy Carter out of the White House don't know him at all. And a lot of the people who accuse him of lying, dissembling, waffling, and being hazy have ever bothered to listen very carefully to what he says or to try reading between the lines now when Carter comes out with some mawkish statement like the one he's used to end so many speeches. I just want to see us once again with a government that is as honest and truthful and fair and idealistic and compassionate and filled with love as are the American people. The first time I heard him say that up in New Hampshire, I was stunned. It sounded like he had eaten some of the acid I'd been saving up to offer him the first time he mentions anything to me about bringing Jesus into my life. But after I'd heard him say the same thing five or six more times, it began to sound like something I'd heard long before I'd ever heard Jimmy Carter's name. It took me a while to dig it out of my memory, but when it finally surfaced, I recognized the words of the late, great liberal Adlai Stevenson who once lashed it all together in one small and perfect capsule when he said, In a democracy, people usually get the kind of government they deserve. Address by Jimmy Carter on Law Day, University of Georgia, Athens, Georgia, May 4, 1974. Senator Kennedy, distinguished fellow Georgians, friends of the Law School of Georgia, and personal friends of mine. Sometimes even a distinguished jurist on the Supreme Court doesn't know all of the background on acceptances of invitations. As a matter of fact, my wife was influential in this particular acceptance, but my son was even more influential. This was really an acceptance to repair my ego. There was established in 1969 the LQC Lamar Society. I was involved in the establishment of it, and I think a lot of it. As governor of Georgia, I was invited this year, along with two distinguished Americans, to make a speech at the annual meeting, which is going on now. I found out when the program was prepared that Senator Kennedy was to speak last night. They charged $10 to attend the occasion. Senator William Brock from Tennessee is speaking to the Lamar Society at noon today. I found out that they charge $7.50 for this occasion. I spoke yesterday at noon, and I asked the Lamar Society officials at the last moment how much they were charging to come to the luncheon yesterday. They said they weren't charging anything. I said, you mean they don't even have to pay for the lunch? They said, no. We're providing the lunch free. So when my son Jack came and said, Daddy, I think more of you than you thought I did. I'm paying $7 for two tickets to the luncheon. I figured that a $3.50 lunch ticket would salvage part of my ego, and that's really why I'm here today. I'm not qualified to talk to you about law, because in addition to being a peanut farmer, I'm an engineer and a nuclear physicist, not a lawyer. I was planning really to talk to you more today about politics and the interrelationship of political affairs and law than about what I'm actually going to speak on. But after Senator Kennedy's delightful and very fine response to political questions during his speech, and after his analysis of the Watergate problems, I stopped at a room on the way while he had his press conference, and I changed my speech notes. My own interest in the criminal justice system is very deep and heartfelt. Not having studied law, 
I've had to learn the hard way. I read a lot and listen a lot. One of the sources for my understanding about the proper application of criminal justice and the system of equity is from reading Reinhold Niebuhr, one of his books that Bill Gunter gave me quite a number of years ago. The other source of my understanding about what's right and wrong in this society is from a friend of mine, a poet named Bob Dylan. After listening to his records about the Ballad of Hattie Carroll and Like a Rolling Stone and The Times They Are a-Changin', I've learned to appreciate the dynamism of change in a modern society. I grew up as a landowner's son, but I don't think I ever realized the proper interrelationship between the landowner and those who worked on a farm until I heard Dylan's record, I Ain't Gonna Work on Maggie's Farm No More. So I come here speaking to you today about your subject with a base for my information founded on Reinhold Niebuhr and Bob Dylan. One of the things that Niebuhr says is that the sad duty of the political system is to establish justice in a sinful world. He goes on to say that there's no way to establish or maintain justice without law, that the laws are constantly changing to stabilize the social equilibrium of the forces and counterforces of a dynamic society, and that the law in its totality is an expression of the structure of government. Well, as a farmer who has now been in office for three years, I've seen firsthand the inadequacy of my own comprehension of what government ought to do for its people. I've had a constant learning process, sometimes from lawyers, sometimes from practical experience, sometimes from failures and mistakes that have been pointed out to me after they were made. I had lunch this week with the members of the Judicial Selection Committee, and they were talking about a consent search warrant. I said I didn't know what a consent search warrant was. They said, well, that's when two policemen go to a house. One of them goes to the front door and knocks on it, and the other one runs around to the back door and yells, come in. I have to admit that as governor, quite often I search for ways to bring about my own hopes. Not quite so stringently testing the law as that, but with a similar motivation. I would like to talk to you for a few moments about some of the practical aspects of being a governor who is still deeply concerned about the inadequacies of a system of which it is obvious that you're so patently proud. I have refrained completely from making any judicial appointments on the basis of political support or other factors, and have chosen in every instance superior court judges, quite often state judges, appellate court judges, on the basis of merit analysis by a highly competent, open, qualified group of distinguished Georgians. I'm proud of this. We've now established in the Georgia Constitution a Qualifications Commission, which for the first time can hear complaints from average citizens about the performance in office of judges and can investigate those complaints and with the status and the force of the Georgia Constitution behind them can remove a judge from office or take other corrective steps. We've now passed a constitutional amendment, which is waiting for the citizenry to approve, that establishes a uniform criminal justice court system in this state so that the affairs of the judiciary can be more orderly structured, so that workloads can be balanced, and so that over a period of time there might be an additional factor of equity, which quite often does not exist now because of the wide disparity among the different courts of Georgia. We passed this year a judge sentencing bill for non-capital cases with a review procedure. I've had presented to me by members of the Pardons and Paroles Board an analysis of some of the sentences given to people by the superior court judges of this state, which grieved me deeply and shocked me as a layman. I believe that over a period of time, the fact that a group of other judges can review and comment on the sentences meted out in the different portions of Georgia will bring some more equity to the system. We finally eliminated the unsworn statement law in Georgia, the last state to do it. This year, we analyzed in depth the structure of the drug penalties in this state. I believe in the future there will be a clear understanding of the seriousness of different crimes relating to drugs. We've finally been able to get through the legislature a law that removes alcoholism or drunkenness as a criminal offense. 
When this law goes into effect next year, I think it will create a new sense of compassion and concern and justice for the roughly 150,000 alcoholics in Georgia, many of whom escaped the consequences of what has been a crime because of some social or economic prominence and will remove a very heavy load from the criminal justice system. In our prisons, which in the past have been a disgrace to Georgia, we've tried to make substantive changes in the quality of those who administer them and to put a new realm of understanding and hope and compassion into the administration of that portion of the system of justice. Ninety-five percent of those who are presently incarcerated in prisons will be returned to be our neighbors. And now, the thrust of the entire program, as initiated under Ellis McDougall and now continued under Dr. Alt, is to try to discern in the soul of each convicted and sentenced person redeeming features that can be enhanced. We plan a career for that person to be pursued while he is in prison. I believe that the early data that we have on recidivism rates indicates the efficacy of what we've done. The GBI, which was formerly a matter of great concern to all those who were interested in law enforcement, has now been substantially changed for the better. I would put it up now in quality against the FBI, the Secret Service, or any other crime control organization in this nation. Well, does that mean that everything is all right? It doesn't to me. I don't know exactly how to say this, but I was thinking just a few moments ago about some of the things that are of deep concern to me as governor. As a scientist, I was working constantly, along with almost everyone who professes that dedication of life, to probe, probe every day of my life, for constant change for the better. It's completely anachronistic in the makeup of a nuclear physicist or an engineer or scientist to be satisfied with what we've got or to rest on the laurels of past accomplishments. It's the nature of the profession. As a farmer, the same motivation persists. Every farmer that I know of who's worth his salt or who's just average is ahead of the experiment stations and the research agronomist in finding better ways, changing ways to plant, cultivate, utilize herbicides, gather, cure, sell farm products. The competition for innovation is tremendous, equivalent to the realm of nuclear physics even. In my opinion, it's different in the case of lawyers, and maybe this is a circumstance that is so inherently true that it can't be changed. I'm a Sunday school teacher, and I've always known that the structure of law is founded on the Christian ethic that you shall love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. A very high and perfect standard. We all know the fallibility of man and the contentions in society, as described by Reinhold Niebuhr and many others, don't permit us to achieve perfection. We do strive for equality, but not with a fervent and daily commitment. In general, the powerful and the influential in our society shape the laws and have a great influence on the legislature or the Congress. This creates a reluctance to change because the powerful and the influential have carved out for themselves or have inherited a privileged position in society of wealth or social prominence or higher education or opportunity for the future. Quite often, those circumstances are circumvented at a very early age because college students, particularly undergraduates, don't have any commitment to the preservation of the way things are. But later, as their interrelationship with the present circumstances grows, they also become committed to approaching change very very slowly and very, very cautiously, and there's a commitment to the status quo. I remember when I was a child, I lived on a farm about three miles from Plains, and we didn't have electricity or running water. We lived on the railroad, Seaboard Coastline Railroad. Like all farm boys, I had a flip, a slingshot. They had stabilized the railroad bed with little white round rocks, which I used for ammunition. I would go out frequently to the railroad and gather the most perfectly shaped rocks of proper size. I always had a few in my pockets, 
and I had others cached away around the farm so that they would be convenient if I ran out of my pocket supply. One day, I was leaving the railroad track with my pockets full of rocks and hands full of rocks, and my mother came out on the front porch. This is not a very interesting story, but it illustrates a point. And she had in her hands a plate full of cookies that she had just baked for me. She called me, I am sure with love in her heart, and said, Jimmy, I've baked some cookies for you. I remember very distinctly walking up to her and standing there for 15 or 20 seconds in honest doubt about whether I should drop those rocks, which were worthless, and take the cookies that my mother had prepared for me, which between her and me were very valuable. Quite often, we have the same inclination in our everyday lives. We don't recognize that change can sometimes be very beneficial, although we fear it. Anyone who lives in the South looks back on the last 15 to 20 years with some degree of embarrassment, including myself. But think about going back to a county unit system, which deliberately cheated for generations certain white voters of this state, is almost inconceivable. To revert back or to forego the one-man, one-vote principle, we would now consider to be a horrible violation of the basic principles of justice and equality and fairness and equity. The first speech I ever made in the Georgia Senate representing the most conservative district in Georgia was concerning the abolition of 30 questions that we had so proudly evolved as a subterfuge to keep black citizens from voting and which we used with a great deal of smirking and pride for decades or generations ever since the war between the states. Questions that nobody could answer in this room but which were applied to every black citizen that came to the Sumter County Courthouse or Webster County Courthouse and said, I want to vote. I spoke in that chamber, fearful of the news media reporting it back home, but overwhelmed with a commitment to the abolition of that artificial barrier to the rights of an American citizen. I remember the thing that I used in my speech, that a black pencil salesman on the outer door of the Sumter County Courthouse could make a better judgment about who ought to be sheriff than two highly educated professors at Georgia Southwestern College. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was perhaps despised by many in this room because he shook up our social structure that benefited us and demanded simply that black citizens be treated the same as white citizens, wasn't greeted with approbation and accolades by the Georgia Bar Association or the Alabama Bar Association. He was greeted with horror. Still, once that change was made, a very simple but difficult change, no one in his right mind would want to go back to circumstances prior to that juncture in the development of our nation's society. I don't want to go on and on. I'm part of it. But the point I want to make to you is that we still have a long way to go. In every age or every year, we have a tendency to believe that we've come so far now that there's no way to improve the present system. I'm sure when the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk, they felt that was the ultimate in transportation. When the first atomic bomb was exploded, that was the ultimate development in nuclear physics and so forth. Well, we haven't reached the ultimate. But who's going to search the heart and the soul of an organization like yours or a law school or state or nation and say, what can we still do to restore equity and justice or to preserve it or to enhance it in this society? You know, I'm not afraid to make the change. I don't have anything to lose. But as a farmer, I'm not qualified to assess the characteristics of the 9,100 inmates in the Georgia prisons 50% of whom ought not to be there. They ought to be on probation or under some other supervision and assess what the results of previous court rulings might bring to bear on their lives. I was in the governor's mansion for two years, enjoying the services of a very fine cook who was a prisoner, a woman. One day, she came to me after she got over her two years of timidity and said, Governor, I would like to borrow $250 from you. I said, I'm not sure that a lawyer would be worth that much. She said, I don't want to hire a lawyer. I want to pay the judge. I thought it was a ridiculous statement for her. I felt that she was ignorant. But I found out she wasn't. 
She had been sentenced by a superior court judge in the state who still serves to seven years or $750. She had raised early in her prison career $500. I didn't lend her the money, but I had Bill Harper, my legal aide, look into it. He found the circumstances were true. She was quickly released under a recent court ruling that had come down in the last few years. I was down on the coast this weekend. I was approached by a woman who asked me to come by her home. I went by, and she showed me documents that indicated that her illiterate mother, who had a son in jail, had gone to the county surveyor in that region and had borrowed $225 to get her son out of jail. She had a letter from the Justice of the Peace that showed that her mother had made a mark on the blank sheet of paper. They paid off the $225, and she has the receipts to show it. Then... They started a five-year program trying to get back the paper she signed, without success. They went to court. The lawyer that had originally advised her to sign the paper showed up as the attorney for the surveyor. She had put up 50 acres of land near the county seat as security. When she got to court, she found that instead of signing a security deed, that she had signed a warranty deed. That case has already been appealed to the Supreme Court and she lost. Well, I know that the technicalities of the law that would permit that are probably justifiable. She didn't have a good lawyer. My heart feels and cries out that something ought to be analyzed, not just about the structure of government, judicial qualification councils, and judicial appointment committees, and eliminating the unsworn statement. Those things are important. But they don't reach the crux of the point, that now we assign punishment to fit the criminal and not the crime. You can go in the prisons of Georgia, and I don't know, it may be that poor people are the only ones who commit crimes, but I do know they are the only ones who serve prison sentences. When Ellis McDougal first went to Reedsville, he found people that had been in solitary confinement for 10 years. We now have 500 misdemeanants in the Georgia prison system. Well, I don't know the theory of law, but there's one other point I want to make just for your own consideration. I think we've made great progress in the Pardons and Paroles Board since I've been in office and since we've reorganized the government. We have five very enlightened people there now. And on occasion, they go out to the prison system to interview the inmates to decide whether or not they're worthy to be released after they serve one-third of their sentence. I think most jurors and most judges feel that when they give the sentence, they know that after a third of the sentence has gone by, they will be eligible for careful consideration. Just think for a moment about your own son or your own father or your own daughter being in prison, having served seven years of a lifetime term and being considered for a release. Don't you think that they ought to be examined and that the Pardons and Paroles Board ought to look them in the eye and ask them a question and, if they are turned down, ought to give them some substantive reason why they are not released and what they can do to correct their defect? I do. I think it's just as important at their time for consideration of early release as it is even when they are sentenced. But I don't know how to bring about that change. We had an ethics bill in the state legislature this year. Half of it passed to require an accounting for contributions during a campaign. But the part that applied to people after the campaign failed. We couldn't get through a requirement for revelation of payments or gifts to office holders after they are in office. The largest force against that ethics bill was the lawyers. Some of you here tried to help get a consumer protection package passed without success. The regulatory agencies in Washington are made up not of people to regulate industries, but of representatives of the industries that are regulated. Is that fair and right and equitable? I don't think so. I'm only going to serve four years as governor, as you know. I think that's enough. I enjoy it. But I think I've done all I can in the governor's office. I see the lobbyists in the state capitol filling the halls on occasions. Good people, competent people, the most pleasant, personable, extroverted citizens of Georgia. Those are the characteristics that are required for a lobbyist. They represent good folks. But I tell you that when a lobbyist goes to represent the Peanut Warehousemen's Association of the Southeast, which I belong to, 
which I helped to organize, they go there to represent the peanut warehousemen. They don't go there to represent the customers of the peanut warehousemen. When the state chamber of commerce lobbyists go there, they go there to represent the businessman of Georgia. They don't go there to represent the customers of the businessman of Georgia. When your own organization is interested in some legislation there in the Capitol, they're interested in the welfare or prerogatives or authority of the lawyers. They are not there to represent in any sort of exclusive way the client of the lawyers. The American Medical Association and its Georgia equivalent, they represent the doctors who are fine people. But they certainly don't represent the patients of a doctor. As an elected governor, I feel that responsibility. But I also know that my qualifications are slight compared to the doctors or the lawyers or the teachers to determine what's best for the client or the patient or the school child. This bothers me. And I know that if there was a commitment on the part of the cumulative group of attorneys in this state to search with a degree of commitment and fervency to eliminate many of the inequities that I've just described that I thought of this morning, our state could be transformed in the attitude of its people toward the government. Senator Kennedy described the malaise that exists in this nation. And it does. In closing, I'd like to just illustrate the point by something that came to mind this morning when I was talking to Senator Kennedy about his trip to Russia. When I was about 12 years old, I liked to read, and I had a school principal named Miss Julia Coleman. Judge Marshall knows her. She forced me pretty much to read, read, read classical books. She would give me a gold star when I read ten, and a silver star when I read five. One day, she called me in and she said, Jimmy, I think it's time for you to read War and Peace. I was completely relieved because I thought it was a book about cowboys and Indians. Well, I went to the library and checked it out, and it was 1,415 pages thick, I think, written by Tolstoy, as you know, about Napoleon's entry into Russia in the 1812 to 1815 era. He had never been defeated and was sure he could win, but he underestimated the severity of the Russian winter and the peasants' love for their land. To make a long story short, the next spring he retreated in defeat. The course of history was changed. It probably affected our own lives. The point of the book is, and what Tolstoy points out in the epilogue is, that he didn't write the book about Napoleon or the Tsar of Russia or even the generals, except on a rare occasion. He wrote it about the students and the housewives and the barbers and the farmers and the privates in the army. And the point of the book is that the course of human events, even the greatest historical events, are not determined by the leaders of a nation or a state, like presidents or governors or senators. They are controlled by the combined wisdom and courage and commitment and discernment and unselfishness and compassion and love and idealism of the common ordinary people. If that was true in the case of Russia, where they had a czar, or France, where they had an emperor, how much more true is it in our own case where the Constitution charges us with a direct responsibility for determining what our government is and ought to be? Well, I've read parts of the embarrassing transcripts, and I've seen the proud statement of a former attorney general who protected his boss and now brags on the fact that he tiptoed through a minefield and came out clean. I can't imagine somebody like Thomas Jefferson tiptoeing through a minefield on the technicalities of the law and then bragging about being clean afterwards. I think our people demand more than that. I believe that everyone in this room who is in a position of responsibility as a preserver of the law in its purest form ought to remember the oath that Thomas Jefferson and others took when they practically signed their own death warrant, writing the Declaration of Independence. To preserve justice and equity and freedom and fairness, they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Thank you very much. The Banshee screams for buffalo meat.
From Rolling Stone, number 254, December 15th, 1977. Requiem for a Crazed Heavyweight, an unfinished memoir on the life and doom of Oscar Zeta Acosta, first and last of the savage brown buffaloes. He crawled with lepers and lawyers, but he was tall on his own hind legs when he walked at night with the king. The following memoir by Dr. Thompson is the painful result of a nine-week struggle between the management and the author regarding the style, tone, length, payment, etc., but mainly the subject matter of the National Affairs Desk's contribution to this star-crossed 10th anniversary issue. And in at least momentary fairness to the management, we should note that the term star-crossed is Dr. Thompson's as are all other harsh judgments he was finally compelled to submit. We work in the dark. We do what we can. Some poet who never met Werner Erhard said that. But so what? What began as a sort of riptide commentary on the meaning of the 60s soon turned into a wild and hydra-headed screed on truth, vengeance, journalism, and the meaning, such as it is, of Jimmy Carter. But none of these things could be made to fit in the space we had available. So we were finally forced to compromise with the Doc and his people, who had all along favored a long, dangerous, and very costly piece titled The Search for the Brown Buffalo. It was Dr. Thompson's idea to have Rolling Stone finance this open-ended search for one of his friends, who disappeared under mean and mysterious circumstances in the late months of 1974 or perhaps the early months of 1975. The Brown Buffalo was the nom de plume of the Chicano attorney from East Los Angeles, who gained international notoriety as the brutal and relentless 300-pound Samoan attorney in Thompson's book, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. The Editors From Old Black Joe Nobody knows the weirdness I've seen. On the Trail of the Brown Buffalo. From Oscar Acosta, the autobiography of a brown buffalo. I walk in the night rain until the dawn of the new day. I have devised the plan, straightened out the philosophy, and set up the organization. When I have the one million brown buffaloes on my side, I will present the demands for a new nation to both the U.S. government and the United Nations. And then I'll split and write the book. I have no desire to be a politician. I don't want to lead anyone. I have no practical ego. I am not ambitious. I merely want to do what is right. Once in every century, there comes a man who has chosen to speak for his people. Moses, Mao, and Martin Luther King Jr. are examples. Who's to say that I am not such a man? In this day and age, the man for all seasons needs many voices. Perhaps that is why the gods have sent me into Riverbank, Panama, San Francisco, Alpine, and Juarez. Perhaps that is why I've been taught so many trades. Who will deny that I am unique? Well, not me, old sport. Wherever you are and in whatever shape, dead or alive or even both, eh? That's one thing they can't take away from you. Which is lucky, I think, for the rest of us. Because... And yeah, let's face it, Oscar, you were not real light on your feet in this world, and you were too goddamn heavy for most of the boats you jumped into. One of the great regrets of my life is that I was never able to introduce you to my old football buddy, Richard Nixon. The main thing he feared in this life, even worse than queers and Jews and mutants, was people who might run amok. He called them loose cannons on the deck, and he wanted them all put to sleep. That's one graveyard we never even checked, Oscar, but why not? If your classic doomed nigger style of paranoia had any validity at all, you must understand that it was not just Richard Nixon who was out to get you. But all the people who thought like Nixon and all the judges and U.S. attorneys he appointed in those weird years. Were there any of Nixon's friends among all those superior court judges you subpoenaed and mocked and humiliated when you were trying to bust the grand jury selection system in L.A.? How many of those brown beret bodyguards you called brothers were deep cover cops or informants? 
I recall being seriously worried about that when we were working on that story about the killing of Chicano journalist Ruben Salazar by an L.A. County Sheriff's deputy. How many of those bomb-throwing, trigger-happy freaks who slept on mattresses in your apartment were talking to the sheriff on a chili hall payphone every morning? Or maybe to the judges who kept jailing you for contempt of court when they didn't have anything else? Yeah, and so much for the paranoid 60s. It's time to end this bent seance, or almost closing time anyway. But before we get back to raw facts and rude lawyer's humor, I want to make sure that at least one record will show that I tried and totally failed for at least five years to convince my allegedly erstwhile Samoan attorney, Oscar Zeta Acosta, that there was no such thing as paranoia. At least not in that cultural and political war zone called East L.A., in the late 1960s, and especially not for an aggressively radical Chicano lawyer who thought he could stay up all night, every night, eating acid and throwing Molotov cocktails with the same people he was going to have to represent in a downtown courtroom the next morning. There were times, all too often I felt, when Oscar would show up in front of the courthouse at nine in the morning with a stench of fresh gasoline on his hands and a green crust of charred soap flakes on the toes of his $300 snakeskin cowboy boots. He would pause outside the courtroom just long enough to give the TV press five minutes of crazed rhetoric for the evening news. Then he would shepherd his equally crazed clients into the courtroom for their daily war circus with the judge. When you get into bear baiting on that level, paranoia is just another word for ignorance. They really are out to get you. The odds on his being dragged off to jail for contempt were about 50-50 on any given day, which meant he was always in danger of being seized and booked with a pocket full of bennies or black beauties at the property desk. After several narrow escapes, he decided it was necessary to work in the courtroom as part of a three-man defense team. One of his associates was usually a well-dressed, well-mannered young Chicano whose only job was to carry at least 100 milligrams of pure speed at all times and feed Oscar whenever he signaled. The other was not so well-dressed or mannered. His job was to stay alert and be one step ahead of the bailiffs when they made a move on Oscar, at which point he would reach out and grab any pills, powders, shivs, or other evidence he was handed, then sprint like a human bazooka for the nearest exit. This strategy worked so well for almost two years that Oscar and his people finally got careless. They had survived another long day in court, on felony arson charges this time, for trying to burn down the Biltmore Hotel during a speech by then-Governor Ronald Reagan, and they were driving back home to Oscar's headquarters pad in the barrio, and maybe running 60 or 65 in a 50-mile-per-hour speed zone, Oscar later admitted, when they were suddenly jammed to a stop by two LAPD cruisers. They acted like we just robbed a bank, said Frank, looking right down the barrel of a shotgun. They made us all lie face down on the street, and then they searched the car and... Yes, that's when they found the drugs. Twenty or thirty white pills that the police quickly identified as illegal amphetamine tablets belonging to attorney Oscar Acosta. The fat spit for all seasons was jailed once again, this time on what the press called a high-speed drug bust. Oscar called a press conference in jail and accused the cops of planting him. But not even his bodyguards believed him until long after the attendant publicity had done them all so much damage that the whole brown power movement was effectively stalled, splintered, and discredited by the time all charges, both arson and drugs, were either dropped or reduced to small print on the back of the blotter. I'm not even sure myself how the cases were finally disposed of. Not long after the high-speed drug bust, as I recall, two of his friends were charged with murder one for allegedly killing a smack dealer in the barrio. And I think Oscar finally copped on the drug charge and pled guilty to something like possession of ugly pills in a public place. But by that time, his deal had already gone down. None of the respectable Chicano Pauls in East L.A. had ever liked him anyway and that high-speed drug bust was all they needed to publicly denounce everything left of huevos rancheros and start calling themselves Mexican-American again. The trial of the Biltmore Five 
was no longer a do-or-die cause for La Raza, but a shameful crime that a handful of radical dope fiends had brought down on the whole community. The mood on Whittier Boulevard turned sour overnight, and the sight of a brown beret was suddenly as rare as a cash client for Oscar Zeta Acosta, the ex-Chicano lawyer. The entire ex-Chicano political community went as public as possible to make sure that the rest of the city understood that they had known all along that this dope addict Rata, who had somehow been one of their most articulate and certainly their most radical, popular, and politically aggressive spokesman for almost two years, was really just a self-seeking publicity dope freak who couldn't even run a bar tab at the Silver Dollar Cafe, much less rally friends or a following. There was no mention in the Mexican-American press about Acosta's surprisingly popular campaign for sheriff of L.A. County a year earlier, which had made him a minor hero among politically hip Chicanos all over the city. No more of that dilly-dong bullshit on Whittier Boulevard. Oscar's drug bust was still alive on the evening news when he was evicted from his apartment on three days' notice and his car was either stolen or towed away from its customary parking place on the street in front of his driveway. His offer to defend his two friends on what he later assured me were absolutely valid charges of first-degree murder were publicly rejected. Not even for free, they said. A dope-addled clown was worse than no lawyer at all. It was dumb gunsel thinking but Oscar was in no mood to offer his help more than once. So, he beat a strategic retreat to Mazatlan, which he called his other home, to lick his wounds and start writing the great Chicano novel. It was the end of an era! The fireball Chicano lawyer was on his way to becoming a half-successful writer, a cult figure of sorts, then a fugitive, a freak, and finally, either a permanently missing person or an undiscovered corpse. Oscar's fate is still a mystery, but every time his case seems to be finally closed, something happens to bring him back to life. And one of them just happened again, but it came in a blizzard of chaos that caused a serious time warp in my thinking. My nerves are still too jangled for the moment to do anything but lay back and let it blow over. The Flash Man Cometh Queer News from Coconut Grove Murder Madness and the Battle of Biscayne Bay. The death of a cigarette boat and a $48,000 misunderstanding. Race Ipsa Loquitor. A screech owl the size of a chow killed two of my peacocks on the front porch. The county attorney called the cops on me for interfering with the work of a labor crew painting yellow stripes on the Woody Creek Road. The antique winch-powered crossbow that Stedman sent over from England was seized and destroyed by sheriff's deputies, and a man named Drake from Miami spent all afternoon at the Hotel Jerome, demanding my phone number from the bartenders because he claimed to have a bizarre message for me. Then, Sandy came back from the store with the mail and the latest issue of Newsweek, the one with the photo of Carolyn Kennedy rolling yawn through the door of Elaine's on that custom-built cut glass dolly from Neiman Marcus. Sandy didn't even recognize him at first. She thought it was a photo of Carolyn and Bella Abzug on the campaign trail. We went out on the porch, where there was plenty of light, to get a better look at the photos. But the sun made me blind for a moment, and just then, Tom Benton came howling into the driveway on his 880 Husqvarna. And when he saw that story in Newsweek, you know Tom, with that fine artist sigh that he has, he said, Well, I'll be fucked. That's Jan. And look at the wonderful smile on him. Wow. And look what he's done to his hair and those teeth. No wonder he moved to New York. Benton was taking off his leathers as he talked. He'd been riding up on the logging roads in the high pastures behind his house looking for a rogue bear that tore the top off his Jeep and killed his mule last week. I just want to hit him with this taser then chain him to a tree until we can go up and get him. Get him? He nodded. It's that grizzly pup that Noonan turned loose before he left town. He's about a year and a half old by now, and he's starting to act crazy. Fuck the taser, I said. It's no good beyond 15 feet. We'll need the M79 with CS grenades, then drag him down with a jeep. No, he said. 
I want to get the bugger in a van, then drive him into town and back the van right up to the side door of that restaurant where all the lawyers eat lunch. They'll love him. Wonderful, I said. Shoot him right into that private dining room where they have those bar association luncheons. Feed him a whole bucket full of acid and raw meat, then take him into town for the meeting. Benton started to laugh, then stopped and reached into one of his pockets and handed me a small envelope. Speaking of lawyers, he said, I almost forgot. There's a guy from Miami in town who says he has a message for you, from Oscar. I flinched and stepped back. What, I said? Who? Yeah, Benton said. Oscar Acosta, the brown buffalo. He shook his head. This guy has a very, very strange story. It's so strange that I wasn't even sure I should come out here and tell you. I know all those stories, I said. Hell, I wrote most of them. And besides, Oscar's dead. Tom opened two more beers and handed me one. Not according to this guy Drake, he said quietly. He says Oscar almost got killed about two months ago in Florida. They took a midnight ride out to Bimini in Drake's boat, and on the way back they got ambushed at sea and a friend of Oscar's got killed. And Drake's $48,000 cigarette boat was a total wreck. He says it was so full of bullet holes that they almost sunk in mid-ocean. Bullshit, I said. That's impossible. He shrugged. Well, that's what Solheim said. But he talked to Drake for a long time last night, and he says the guy is absolutely positive. He even had a photo. I suddenly remembered the envelope I'd been holding. Let's see what this is, I said, tearing off the end. Inside was a paperback book cover folded lengthwise, the cover of Oscar's autobiography of a brown buffalo with a picture of the author on the front and a message scrawled on the blank side. Dear Thompson, it said, please call me as soon as you can. Very urgent. Acosta might be in bad trouble. Heat! Not much time. Call me in number 353 Hotel Jerome. Thanks. Drake. Jesus, I muttered. Why the hell does he want to talk to me? He's looking for Oscar, Benton replied, and so is the Coast Guard and the DEA and the FBI and half the cops in Miami. So what, I said. He's been dead for two years. Tom shook his head. No, Drake says he's still working in and out of Florida, running a lot of white powder. I doubt it, I said. Well, Drake doesn't, he replied and he's about to turn him over, unless Oscar pays for his boat. He wants 40 grand, and he says he knows Oscar has the money. Balls, I said. We should have this bastard locked up for blackmail. He shrugged again. Hang on. You haven't heard the rest of it. Drake's talking about murder, not drugs. Murder? Yeah? Yeah? Drake says the Coast Guard came up with three bodies after that ambush, and two of them didn't have heads. Oscar ran that cigarette boat right over the top of a Boston whaler with at least two guys in it. I stared at him for a moment, then went over to the couch and sat down. Jesus Christ, I said. Let's go back and run the whole story again. I must have missed something. From Clement Robinson you are better lost than found. Which was true. The story I got from Benton was from Mike Solheim, who got it in spades from a total stranger who said his name was Drake and who showed up in Aspen one afternoon looking for me because he thought I could put him in touch with Oscar Acosta, a dead man who somehow showed up at Drake's home in Coconut Grove one night last summer and offered $5,000 in cash for a midnight ride out to Bimini and back in Drake's new $48,000 ocean racer with no questions asked. It was not the kind of business proposition that a veteran dope smuggler like Drake would have been likely to misunderstand. There are only two possible reasons for even owning a 35-foot-long bullet-shaped fiberglass hull 
with two 370 horsepower engines on the back. One is to win races in the open sea at speeds up to 90.555 miles an hour, the current world record set by the world champion cigarette racing team in 1976. And the other has to do with the virtually priceless peace of mind that comes with doing business in a boat that will outrun anything the U.S. Coast Guard can put in the water. So, there was no need for Drake to ask why these two cash-heavy Mexicans needed his boat, or even why one of them came aboard with a Uzi submachine gun. He had made this run before, and even on moonless nights, he felt he knew every bump in the water, even at 60 miles an hour. But he was not ready for what happened on the way back from Bimini this time. They were almost home, slowing down to half speed or less about a mile off the south tip of Key Biscayne, when he was suddenly blinded by spotlights coming into his face from the front and both sides, and the whole night erupted with gunfire. The Mexican with the Uzi was dead on his feet before Drake even heard the first shots. The Uzi bounced into the water, and the Mexican sat down in the cockpit with at least ten big holes in his chest. Drake felt his boat shuddering in the water as the hull started coming apart in the crossfire. We're surrounded, he screamed. They're killing us. Then he fell down and tried to hide himself under the dead man just as Oscar got his hands on both the wheel and the throttle at the same time. The big speedboat lunged forward with a roar, and the next thing Drake felt was an airborne jolt as his boat ran straight over the top of a 20-foot Boston whaler. And suddenly, there was no more shooting as he felt the boat moving toward Miami at 60 miles an hour with the cockpit six inches deep in blood-colored water and Oscar screaming in Spanish as they started coming up too fast on the lights of Dinner Key. Drake stood up and took the wheel. The boat felt like it was coming apart in his hands as he aimed for a clump of trees on the dark end of the marina. By the time he felt the jolt of a sandbar under his feet... Oscar was already going over the side with the small suitcase they'd picked up in Bimini, and that was the last time Drake saw him. The boat stayed miraculously afloat long enough for him to hump the dead man and dump his $48,000 wreck about a half mile down the beach in a place where he could drive it up under some branches and watch it sink out of sight in five feet of dark water. Drake covered the hulk as well as he could, then slogged out to Biscayne Boulevard and hitchhiked back to Coconut Grove, where he spent the next 48 hours locked in his bedroom and trembling with a fear worse than anything he'd ever felt in his life. This wild and puzzling story out of Coconut Grove was only the latest of a dozen or so brown buffalo sightings in the past two years. Everybody who knew him, as even a casual friend, has heard stories about Oscar's secret life and his high-speed criminal adventures all over the world. Ever since his alleged death-slash-disappearance in 1973, 74, or even 75, he's turned up all over the world, selling guns in Addis Ababa, buying orphans in Cambodia, smoking weed with Henry Kissinger in Acapulco, hanging around the airport bar in Lima with two or three overstuffed Pan Am flight bags on both shoulders, or hunched impatiently on the steering wheel of a silver 450 Mercedes in the nothing-to-declare lane on the Mexican side of U.S. Customs checkpoint between San Diego and Tijuana. There are not many gypsies on file at the Missing Persons Bureau. And if Oscar was not quite the classic gypsy in his own eyes or mine, it was only because he was never able to cut that high-tension cord that kept him forever attached to his childhood home and hatchery. By the time he was 20 years old, Oscar was working overtime eight days a week at learning to live and even think like a gypsy. But he never quite jumped the gap. From Oscar Acosta, The Autobiography of a Brown Buffalo, 1972. Although I was born in El Paso, Texas, I'm actually a small-town kid. A hick from the sticks. A Mexican boy from the other side of the tracks. I grew up in Riverbank, California, Post Office Box 303, population 3,969. It's the only town in the entire state whose essential numbers have remained unchanged. The sign that welcomes you as you round the curve coming in from Modesto says the city of action. We lived in a two-room shack without a floor. We had to pump our water and use kerosene if we wanted to read at night. 
but we never went hungry. My old man always bought the pinto beans and the white flour for the tortillas in 100-pound sacks, which my mother used to make dresses, sheets, and curtains. We had two acres of land which we planted every year with corn, tomatoes, and yellow chiles for the hot sauce. Even before my father woke us, my old ma was busy at work making the tortillas at 5 a.m. while he chopped the logs we'd hauled up from the river on the weekends. Riverbank is divided into three parts, and in my corner of the world, there were only three kinds of people, Mexicans, Okies, and Americans, Catholics, Holy Rollers, and Protestants, peach pickers, cannery workers, and clerks. We lived on the west side, within smelling distance of the world's largest tomato paste cannery. The west side is still enclosed by the Santa Fe railroad tracks to the east, the Modesto Oakdale Highway to the north, and the Irrigation Canal to the south. Within that concentration, only Mexicans were safe from the neighborhood dogs, who responded only to Spanish commands. Except for Bob Witt and Emmett Brown, both friends of mine who could cuss in better Spanish than I, I never saw a white person walking the dirt roads of our neighborhood. The Lawn of Fire and another ice pick for Richard Nixon for old time's sake. Slow fade out for brown power and a salute to Crazy Ed. Poison fat goes to Mazatlan. Libel lawyers go to the mattresses. Fear of the plastic fork and a twisted compromise. Oscar Zeta Acosta, despite any claims to the contrary was a dangerous thug who lived every day of his life as a stalking monument to the notion that a man with a greed for the truth should expect no mercy and give none. And that was the difference between Oscar and a lot of the merciless geeks he liked to tell strangers he admired. Class acts like Benito Mussolini and Fatty Arbuckle. When the great scorer comes to write against Oscar's name, one of the first few lines in the ledger will note that he usually lacked the courage of his consistently monstrous convictions. There was more mercy, madness, dignity, and generosity in that overweight, overworked, and always overindulged brown cannonball of a body than most of us will meet in any human package even three times Oscar's size for the rest of our lives, which are all running noticeably leaner on the high side since that rotten, fat spick disappeared. He was a drug-addled brute and a genuinely fiendish adversary in court or on the street, but it was none of these things that finally pressured him into death or a disappearance so finely plotted that it amounts to the same thing. What finally cracked the brown buffalo was the bridge he refused to build between the self-serving elegance of his instincts and the self-destructive carnival of his reality. He was a Baptist missionary at a leper colony in Panama before he was a lawyer in Oakland in East L.A., or a radical chic author in San Francisco and Beverly Hills. But whenever things got tense, or when he had to work close to the bone, he was always a missionary. And that was the governing instinct that ruined him for anything else. He was a preacher in the courtroom, a preacher at the typewriter, and a flat-out awesome preacher when he cranked his head full of acid. That's LSD-25, folks, a certified dangerous drug that is no longer fashionable due to reasons of extreme and unnatural heaviness. The CIA was right about acid. Some of their best and brightest operatives went over the side in the name of top-secret research on a drug that was finally abandoned as a far too dangerous and unmanageable thing to be used as a public weapon. Not even the sacred minnock of national security could justify the hazards of playing with a thing too small to be seen and too big to control. The professional spook mentality was far more comfortable with things like nerve gas and neutron bombs. But not the brown buffalo. He ate LSD-25 with a relish that bordered on worship. When his brain felt bogged down in the mundane nuts and bolts horrors of the law or some dead-end manuscript, he would simply take off in his hot rod Mustang for a week on the road and a few days of what he called walking with the king. Oscar used acid like other lawyers use Valium, 
a distinctly unprofessional and occasionally nasty habit that shocked even the most liberal of his colleagues and frequently panicked his clients. I was with him one night in L.A. when he decided that the only way to meaningfully communicate with a judge who'd been leaning on him in the courtroom was to drive out to the man's home in Santa Monica and set his whole front lawn on fire after soaking it down with ten gallons of gasoline. And then, instead of fleeing into the night like some common lunatic vandal, Oscar stood in the street and howled through the flames at a face peering out from a shattered upstairs window, delivering one of his Billy Sunday-style sermons on morality and justice. The nut of his flame-enraged text, as I recall, was this mind-bending chunk of eternal damnation from Luke 11.46, a direct quote from Jesus Christ. And he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be born, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. The lawn of fire was Oscar's answer to the Ku Klux Klan's burning cross, and he derived the same demonic satisfaction from doing it. Did you see his face, he shouted as we screeched off at top speed toward Hollywood? That corrupt old fool, I know he recognized me, but he'll never admit it. No officer of the court would set a judge's front yard on fire. The whole system would break down if lawyers could get away with crazy shit like this. I agreed. It is not my want to disagree with even a criminally insane attorney on questions of basic law. But in truth... It never occurred to me that Oscar was either insane or a criminal, given the generally fascist Nixonian context of those angry years. In an era when the vice president of the United States held court in Washington to accept payoffs from his former vassals in the form of big wads of $100 bills, and when the president himself routinely held secretly tape-recorded meetings with his top aides in the Oval Office to plot illegal wiretaps, political burglaries, and other gross felonies in the name of a silent majority, it was hard to feel anything more than a flash of high, nervous humor at the sight of some acid-bent lawyer setting fire to a judge's front yard at four o'clock in the morning. I might even be tempted to justify a thing like that. But of course, it would be wrong. And my attorney was not a crook, and to the best of my knowledge, his mother was just as much a saint as Richard Nixon's. Indeed! And now, as an almost perfect tribute to every ice pick ever wielded in the name of justice, I want to enter into the permanent record at this point as a strange but unchallenged fact that Oscar Z. Acosta was never disbarred from the practice of law in the state of California, and ex-president Richard Nixon was. There are some things, apparently, that not even lawyers will tolerate. And in a naturally unjust world where the image of justice is honored for being blind, even a blind pig will find an acorn once in a while. Or maybe not, because Oscar was eventually hurt far worse by professional ostracism than Nixon was hurt by disbarment. The great banshee screamed for them both at almost the same time, for entirely different reasons, but with ominously similar results except that Richard Nixon got rich from his crimes and Oscar Acosta got killed. The wheels of justice grind small and queer in this life, and if they seem occasionally unbalanced or even stupid and capricious in their grinding, my own midnight guess is that they were probably fixed from the start. And any judge who can safely slide into full pension retirement without having to look back on anything worse in the way of criminal vengeance than a few scorched lawns? is a man who got off easy. There is, after all, considerable work and risk, and even a certain art, to the torching of a half-acre lawn without also destroying the house or exploding every car in the driveway. It would be a lot easier to simply make a funeral pyre of the whole place and leave the lawn for dilettantes. That's how Oscar viewed arson. Anything worth doing is worth doing well, and I'd watched enough of his fiery work to know he was right. If he was a king hell pyromaniac, he was also a gut politician and occasionally a very skilled artist in the style and tone of his torchings. Like most lawyers with an IQ higher than 60, Oscar learned one definition of justice in law school and a very different one in the courtroom. 
He got his degree at some night school on Post Street in San Francisco while working as a copy boy for the Hearst Examiner. And for a while, he was very proud to be a lawyer. For the same reasons, he'd felt proud to be a missionary and lead clarinet man in the Leper Colony Band. But by the time I first met him in the summer of 1967, he was long past what he called his puppy love trip with the law. It had gone the same way of his earlier missionary zeal. And after one year of casework at an East Oakland poverty law center, he was ready to dump Holmes and Brandeis for Huey Newton and a Black Panther style of dealing with the laws and courts of America. When he came booming into a bar called Daisy Duck in Aspen and announced that he was the trouble we'd all been waiting for, he was definitely into the politics of confrontation and on all fronts in the bars or the courts, or even the streets, if necessary. Oscar was not into serious street fighting, but he was hell on wheels in a bar brawl. Any combination of a 250-pound Mexican and LSD-25 is a potentially terminal menace for anything it can reach. But when the alleged Mexican is in fact a profoundly angry Chicano lawyer with no fear at all of anything that walks on less than three legs and a de facto suicidal conviction that he will die at the age of 33, just like Jesus Christ, you have a serious piece of work on your hands. Especially if the bastard is already 33 and a half years old with a head full of Sandoz acid, a loaded 357 Magnum in his belt, a hatchet-wielding Chicano bodyguard on his elbow at all times, and a disconcerting habit of projectile vomiting geysers of pure red blood off the front porch every 30 or 40 minutes, or whenever his malignant ulcer can't handle any more raw tequila. This was the brown buffalo in the full-crazed flower of his prime. A man indeed for all seasons, and it was somewhere in the middle of his 33rd year, in fact, when he came out to Colorado with his faithful bodyguard, Frank, to rest for a while after his grueling campaign for sheriff of Los Angeles County, which he lost by a million or so votes. But in defeat, Oscar had managed to create an instant political base for himself in the vast Chicano barrio of East Los Angeles, where even the most conservative of the old-line Mexican-Americans were suddenly calling themselves Chicanos and getting their first taste of tear gas at La Raza demonstrations, which Oscar was quickly learning to use as a fire and brimstone forum to feature himself as the main spokesman for a mushrooming brown power movement that the LAPD called more dangerous than the Black Panthers, which was probably true at the time. But in retrospect, it sounds a bit different than it did back in 1969 when the sheriff was sending out 15 or 20 helicopter sorties a night to scan the rooftops and backyards of the barrio with huge sweeping searchlights that drove Oscar and his people into fits of blind rage every time they got nailed in a pool of blazing white light with a joint in one hand and a machete in the other. But that is another and very long story. And since I've already written it once, Strange Rumblings in Aztlan, Rolling Stone, number 81, and came close to getting my throat slit in the process... I think we'll just ease off and pass on it for right now. The sad tale of Oscar's fall from grace in the barrio is still rife with bad blood and ugly paranoia. He was too stunned to fight back in the time-honored style of a professional politician. He was also broke, divorced, depressed, and so deep in public disgrace in the wake of his high-speed drug bust that not even junkies would have him for an attorney. In a word... He and his dream of one million brown buffaloes were finished in East L.A. and everywhere else where it counted for that matter. So Oscar took off once again and once again with a head full of acid. But. Peacocks can't live at this altitude. New home for ebb tide. False dawn in Otslan and a chain of bull maggots on the neck of the fat spick from Riverbank. May leeches crawl on his soul until the rivers flow up from the sea and the grass grows down into hell. Beware of 300-pound Samoan attorneys bearing gifts of LSD-25. From George Herbert, Jacula Prudentum. Follow not truth too near the heels, lest it dash out thy teeth. 
Well, it is not an easy thing to sit here and keep a straight face while even considering the notion that there is any connection at all between Oscar's sorry fate and his lifelong devotion to defending the truth at all costs. There are a lot of people still wandering around, especially in places like San Francisco and East L.A., who would like nothing better than to dash out Oscar's teeth with a ball-peen hammer for all the weird and costly lies he laid on them at one point or another in his frenzied assaults on the way to his place in the sun. He never denied he was a lying pig who would use any means to justify his better end. Even his friends felt the sting. Yet there were times when he took himself as seriously as any other Bush League Mao or Moses, and in moments like these, he was capable of rare insights and a naive sort of grace in his dealings with people that often touched on nobility. At its best, the Brown Buffalo Shuffle was a match for Muhammad Ali's. After I'd known him for only three days, he made me a solemn gift of a crude wooden idol that I am still not sure he didn't occasionally worship in secret when not in the presence of the dreaded white-ass cabancos. In a paragraph near the end of his autobiography, he describes that strangely touching transfer far better than I can. I opened my beat-up suitcase and took out my wooden idol. I had him wrapped in a bright red and yellow cloth. A San Blas Indian had given him to me when I left Panama. I called him Ebb Tide. He was made of hard mahogany, an 18-inch god without eyes, without a mouth, and without a sexual organ. Perhaps the sculptor had the same hang-up about drawing the body from the waist down as I'd had in Miss Rollins' fourth grade class. Ebb Tide was my oldest possession, a string of small, yellowed wild pig's fangs hung from its neck. Ebb Tide still hangs on a nail just above my living room window. I can see him from where I sit now, scrawling these goddamn final desperate lines before my head can explode like a ball of magnesium tossed into a bucket of water. I have never been sure exactly what kind of luck Ebb Tide was bringing down on me over the years, but I've never taken the little bastard down or even thought about it, so he must be paying his way. He is perched just in front of the peacock perch outside, and right now there are two high blue reptilian heads peering over his narrow wooden shoulders. Does anybody out there believe that? No? Well, peacocks can't live at this altitude anyway, like Doberman pinchers, sea snakes, and gun-toting Chicano missionaries with bad acid breath. From Carl Sandburg. Why does a hearse horse snicker, calling a lawyer away? Things were not going well in San Francisco or L.A. at that grim point in Oscar's time either. To him, it must have seemed like open season on every brown buffalo west of the Continental Divide. The only place he felt safe was down south on the warm foreign soil of the old country. But when he fled back to Mazatlan this time... It was not just to rest, but to brood, and to plot what would be his final crazed leap for the great skyhook. It would also turn out to be an act of such monumental perversity, not even that gentle presence of ebb tide could change my sudden and savage decision that the treacherous bastard should have his nuts ripped off with a plastic fork, and then fed like big meat grapes to my peacocks. The move he made this time was straight out of Jekyll and Hyde, the brown buffalo suddenly transmogrified into the form of a rabid hyena. And the bastard compounded his madness by hiding out in the low-rent bowels of Mazatlan like some half-mad leper gone over the brink after yet another debilitating attack of stringworts and herpes simplex lesions. This ugly moment came just as my second book, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, was only a week or so away from going to press. We were in the countdown stage, and there is no way for anybody who hasn't been there to understand the tension of having a new book almost on the presses but not quite there. The only thing that stood between me and publication was a last-minute assault on the very essence of the story by the publisher's libel lawyers. The book was malignant from start to finish, they said, 
with grievous libels that were totally indefensible. No publisher in his right mind would risk the nightmare of doomed litigation that a book like this was certain to drag us all into. Which was true on one level, but on another, it seemed like a harmless joke because almost every one of the most devastating libels they cited involved my old buddy, Ozzy Acosta, a fellow author, prominent Los Angeles attorney, and an officer of many courts. Specifically, they advised, We have read the above manuscript as requested. Our principal legal objection is to the description of the author's attorney as using and offering for sale dangerous drugs as well as indulging in other criminal acts while under the influence of such drugs. Although this attorney is not named, he is identified with some detail. Consequently, this material should be deleted as libelous. In addition, we have the following specific comments. Page 3. The author's attorney's attempt to break and enter and threats sick to bomb a salesman's residence is libelous and should be deleted. Page 4. This page suggests that the author's attorney was driving at an excessive speed while drunk, all of which is libelous and should be deleted. Page 6. The incident in which the author's attorney advised the author to drive at top speed is libelous and should be deleted. The same applies to the attorneys being party to a fraud at the hotel. Page 31. The statement that the author's attorney will be disbarred is libelous and should be deleted. Page 40. The incident in which the author and his attorney impersonated police officers is libelous and should be deleted. Page 41. The reference to the attorney's blank, deleted at the insistence of Rolling Stone's attorney, being a junkie and shooting people is libelous and should be deleted unless it may be proven true. Page 48. The incident in which the author's attorney offers heroin for sale is libelous and should be deleted. We do not advise blank to allow any material in this manuscript noted above as libelous to remain based upon expectancy of proving that it is true by the author's testimony. Inasmuch as the author admits being under the influence of illegal drugs at most, if not all times, proof of truth would be extremely difficult through him. Balls, I told them. We'll just have Oscar sign a release. He's no more concerned about this libel bullshit than I am. And besides, truth is an absolute defense against libel anyway. Jesus, you don't understand what kind of a monster we're dealing with. You should read the parts I left out. But the libel wizards were not impressed, especially since we were heaping all this libelous abuse on a fellow attorney. Unless we got a signed release from Oscar the book would not go to press. Okay, I said, but let's do it quick. He's down in Mazatlan now. Send the goddamn thing by Air Express and he'll sign it and ship it right back. From T.S. Eliot, The Wasteland. I think we are in Rat's Alley, where the dead men lost their bones. Indeed. So... They sent the release off at once, and Oscar refused to sign it, but not for any reason a New York libel lawyer could possibly understand. He was, as I'd said, not concerned at all by the libels. Of course they were all true, he said, when I finally reached him by telephone at his room in the Hotel Sinaloa. The only thing that bothered him, bothered him very badly, was the fact that I'd repeatedly described him as a 300-pound Samoan. What kind of journalist are you, he screamed at me. Don't you have any respect for the truth? I can sink that whole publishing house for defaming me, trying to pass me off as one of those waterhead South Sea mongrels. The libel lawyers were stunned into paranoid silence. Was it either some kind of arcane legal trick, they wondered, or was this dope-addled freak really crazy enough to insist on having himself formally identified for all time with one of the most depraved and degenerate figures in American literature. Should his angry threats and demands conceivably be taken seriously, was it possible that a well-known practicing attorney 
might not only freely admit to all these heinous crimes, but insist that every foul detail be documented as the absolute truth. Why not, Oscar answered. And the only way he'd sign the release, he added, was in exchange for a firm guarantee from the lawyers that both his name and a suitable photograph of himself be prominently displayed on the book's dust cover. They had never had to cope with a thing like this, a presumably sane attorney who flatly refused to release any other version of his clearly criminal behavior except the abysmal naked truth. The concession he was willing to make had to do with his identity throughout the entire book as a 300-pound Samoan. But he could grit his teeth and tolerate that, he said, only because he understood that there was no way to make that many changes at that stage of the deadline without tearing up half the book. In exchange, however, he wanted a formal letter guaranteeing that he would be properly identified on the book jacket. The lawyers would have no part of it. There was no precedent anywhere in the law for a bizarre situation like this. But as the deadline pressures mounted and Oscar refused to bend, it became more and more obvious that the only choice except compromise was to scuttle the book entirely. And if that happened, I warned them, I had enough plastic forks to mutilate every libel lawyer in New York. That seemed to settle the issue in favor of a last-minute compromise. And Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas was finally sent to the printer with Oscar clearly identified on the back as the certified living model for the monstrous 300-pound Samoan attorney who would soon be a far more public figure than any of us would have guessed at the time. From Emerson, Society and Solitude Alcohol, hashish, prussic acid, strychnine, our weak dilutions. The surest poison is time. The libel lawyers have never understood what Oscar had in mind, and at the time I didn't understand it myself. One of the darker skills involved in the kind of journalism I normally get involved with has to do with ability to write the truth about criminals without getting them busted. And, in the eyes of the law, any person committing a crime is criminal whether it's a hell's angel laying an oil slick on a freeway exit to send a pursuing motorcycle cop crashing over the high side, a presidential candidate smoking a joint in his hotel room, or a good friend who happens to be a lawyer, an arsonist, and a serious drug abuser. The line between writing truth and providing evidence is very, very thin, but for a journalist working constantly among highly paranoid criminals, it is also the line between trust and and suspicion. And that is the difference between having free access to the truth and being treated like a spy. There is no such thing as forgiveness on that level. One fuck-up will send you straight back to sports writing. If you're lucky. In Oscar's case, my only reason for describing him in the book as a 300-pound Samoan instead of a 250-pound Chicano lawyer was to protect him from the wrath of the L.A. cops and the whole California legal establishment, he was constantly at war with. It would not serve either one of our interests, I felt, for Oscar to get busted or disbarred because of something I wrote about him. I had my reputation to protect. The libel lawyers understood that much. What worried them was that I hadn't protected my attorney well enough to protect also the book publisher from a libel suit, just in case my attorney was as crazy as he appeared to be in the manuscript they'd just vetoed. Or maybe he was crazy like a fox, they hinted. He was, after all, an attorney, who presumably worked just as hard and for just as many long years as they had to earn his license to steal. And it was inconceivable to them that one of their own kind, as it were, would give all that up on what appeared to be a whim. No, they said, it must be a trap. Not even a brown power lawyer could afford to laugh at the risk of almost certain disbarment. Indeed. And they were at least half right, which is not a bad average for lawyers, because Oscar Z. Acosta, Chicano lawyer, very definitely could not afford the shit rain of suicidal publicity that he was doing everything possible to bring down on himself. 
There are a lot of nice ways to behave like a criminal, but hiring a camera to have yourself photographed doing it in the road is not one of them. It would have taken a reputation as formidable as Melvin Belly's to survive the kind of grossly illegal behavior that Oscar was effectively admitting by signing that libel release. He might as well have burned his lawyer's license on the steps of the Superior Court building in downtown L.A. That is what the Ivy League libel lawyers in New York could not accept. They knew what that license was worth, at least to them. It averaged out to about $150 an hour, even for a borderline psychotic, as long as he had the credentials. And Oscar had them, not because his father and grandfather had gone to Yale or Harvard Law. He would paid his dues at night school, the only Chicano in his class, and his record in the courtroom was better than that of most of his colleagues who called him a disgrace to their venal profession. Which may have been true, for whatever it's worth. But what none of us knew at the time of the great madness that came so close to making fear and loathing in Las Vegas incurably unfit for publication was that we were no longer dealing with O.Z. Acosta, attorney at law, but with Zeta, the king of brown buffaloes. Last train for the top of the mountain. Last leap for the great sky hook. Good riddance to bad rubbish. He was ugly and vicious, and he sold little babies to sand niggers. Mutant rumors on the weird grapevine. Wild ghosts on the Bimini Run. Lights in Fat City. No end to the story, and no grave for the brown buffalo. In retrospect, it is hard to know exactly when Oscar decided to quit the law just as finely as he once quit being a Baptist missionary. But it was obviously a lot earlier than even his few close friends realized until long after he'd already made the move in his mind to a new and higher place. The crazy attorney whose suicidal behavior so baffled the New York libel lawyers was only the locust-like shell of a 36-year-old neo-prophet who was already long overdue for his gig at the top of the mountain. There was no more time to be wasted in the company of lepers and lawyers. The hour had finally struck for the fat spick from Riverbank to start acting like that one man in every century chosen to speak for his people. None of this terminal madness was easy to see at the time, not even for me, and I knew him as well as anyone. But not well enough, apparently, to understand the almost desperate sense of failure and loss that he felt when he was suddenly confronted with the stark possibility that he had never really been chosen to speak for anybody, except maybe himself. And even that was beginning to look like a halfway impossible task in the short time he felt he had left. I'd never taken his burning bush trip very seriously, and I still have moments of doubt about how seriously he took it himself. They are very long moments sometimes, and as a matter of fact, I think I feel one coming on right now. We should have castrated that brain-damaged thief, that shyster, that blasphemous freak. He was ugly and greasy, and he still owes me thousands of dollars. The truth was not in him, goddammit. He was put on this earth for no reason at all except to shit in every nest he could con his way into, but only after robbing them first and selling the babies to sand niggers. If that treacherous fistfucker ever comes back to life, he'll wish we'd had the good sense to nail him up on a frozen telephone pole for his 33rd birthday present. Do not come back, Oscar! Wherever you are, stay there. There's no room for you here anymore. Not after all this maudlin gibberish I've written about you. And besides, we have Werner Erhard now. So burrow deep, you bastard, and take all that poison fat with you. Kazart! And how's that for a left-handed whip song? Never mind. There is no more time for questions. Or answers either, for that matter. And I was never much good at this kind of thing anyway. From William Shakespeare, King Henry VI. The first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. Well, 
so much for whip songs. Nobody laughed when Big Bill sat down to play. He was not into filigree when it came to dealing with lawyers. And neither am I at this point. That last outburst was probably unnecessary, but what the hell? Let them drink Drano if they can't take a joke. I'm tired of wallowing around in this goddamn thing. What began as a quick and stylish epitaph for my allegedly erstwhile 300-pound Samoan attorney has long since gone out of control. Not even Oscar would have wanted an obituary with no end, at least not until he was legally dead, and that will take four more years. Until then, and probably for many years afterward, the weird grapevine will not wither for lack of bulletins, warnings, and other twisted rumors of the latest brown buffalo sightings. He will be seen at least once in Calcutta buying nine-year-old girls out of cages on the white slave market, and also in Houston, tending bar at a roadhouse on South Main that was once the Blue Fox. Or perhaps once again on the midnight run to Bimini, standing tall on his own hind legs in the cockpit of a 50-foot black cigarette boat with a silver Uzi in one hand and a magnum of smack in the other, always running 90 miles an hour with no lights and howling Old Testament gibberish at the top of his bleeding lungs. It might even come to pass that he will suddenly appear on my porch in Woody Creek on some moonless night when the peacocks are screeching with lust. Maybe so. And that is one ghost who will always be welcome in this house, even with a head full of acid and a chain of bull maggots around his neck. Oscar was one of God's own prototypes, a high-powered mutant of some kind who was never even considered for mass production. He was too weird to live and too rare to die. And as far as I'm concerned, that's just about all that needs to be said about him right now. I was tempted for a while to call that poor bastard Drake down in Coconut Grove to check a little deeper into that savage tale about Oscar and the Battle of Biscayne Bay, the one that ended with at least one murder and the total destruction of Drake's $48,000 cigarette boat. But I just don't think I need it right now. Nobody needs it, in fact. But then nobody really needed Oscar Zeta Acosta either, or Rolling Stone, or Jimmy Carter, or the Hindenburg or even the Slope Diamond. Jesus! Is there no respect in this world for the perfectly useless dead? Apparently not. And Oscar was a lawyer, however reluctant he might have been at the end to admit it. He had a lawyer's cynical view of the truth, which he felt was not nearly as important to other people as it was to him. And he was never more savage and dangerous than when he felt he was being lied to. He was never much interested in the concept of truth. He had no time for what he called dumb Anglo-abstracts. From Lord Byron. Condemned to drudge, the meanest of the mean, and furbish falsehoods for a magazine. The truth to Oscar was a tool, and even a weapon, that he was convinced he could not do without, if only because anybody who had more of it than he did would sooner or later try to beat on him with it. Truth was power, as tangible to Oscar as a fistful of hundred-dollar bills or an ounce of pure LSD-25. His formula for survival in a world full of rich gabaccio fascists was a kind of circle that began at the top with the idea that truth would bring him power, which would buy freedom, to crank his head full of acid so he could properly walk with the king which would naturally put him even closer to more and finer truths. Indeed, the full circle. Oscar believed it, and that was what finally croaked him. I tried to warn the greedy bastard, but he was too paranoid to pay any attention, because he was actually a stupid, vicious quack with no morals at all and the soul of a hammerhead shark. We are better off without him. Sooner or later, he would have had to be put to sleep anyway. So the world is a better place, now that he's at least out of sight, if not certifiably dead. He will not be missed. Except, perhaps, in Fat City, where every light in the town went dim when we heard that he'd finally cashed his check. From Voltaire One owes respect to the living, to the dead, one owes only the truth.
The Hoodlum Circus, and The Statutory Rape of Bass Lake. From Hell's Angels, A Strange and Terrible Saga, Random House, 1966. A quote from Fat D, a Richmond Hell's Angel. Man, when you were 15 or 16 years old, did you ever think you'd end up as a Hell's Angel? How did I get screwed up with you guys anyway? Christ! I got out of the army and came back to Richmond, started riding a bike around, wearing my chinos and clean sports shirts, even a crash helmet. And then I met you guys. I started getting grubbier and grubbier, dirtier and dirtier. I couldn't believe it. Then I lost my job, started spending all my time either going on a run or getting ready for one. Christ! I still can't believe it. A quote from a hell's angel sunk in philosophy. What do you mean by that word right? The only thing we're concerned about is what's right for us. We got our own definition of right. According to Frenchy, the run would take off at 8 a.m. from the El Adobe, a tavern on East 14th Street in Oakland. Until the autumn of 1965, the El Adobe was the unofficial headquarters of the Oakland chapter and a focal point for all Hells Angels activity in Northern California. But in October, it was demolished to make way for a parking lot, and the Angels moved back to the Sinners Club. Early weather forecasts said the whole state would be blazing hot that day, but dawn in San Francisco was typically foggy. I overslept, and in the rush to get moving, I forgot my camera. There was no time for breakfast, but I ate a peanut butter sandwich while loading the car. Sleeping bag and beer cooler in back, tape recorder in front, and under the driver's seat an unloaded Luger. I kept the clip in my pocket, thinking it might be useful if things got out of hand. Press cards are nice things to have, but in riot situations, a pistol is the best kind of safe conduct pass. By the time I left my apartment, it was almost eight, and somewhere on the fog-shrouded Bay Bridge between San Francisco and Oakland, I heard the first radio bulletin. The Sierra community of Bass Lake is bracing this morning for a reported invasion of the notorious Hells Angels motorcycle gang. Heavily armed police and sheriff's deputies are stationed on all roads leading to Bass Lake. Madeira County Sheriff Marlon Young reports helicopters and other emergency forces standing by. Neighboring law enforcement agencies, including the Kern County Sheriff's Canine Patrol, have been alerted and are ready to move. Recent reports say the Hells Angels are massing in Oakland and San Bernardino. Stay tuned for further details. Among those who made a point of staying tuned that morning were several thousand unarmed taxpayers en route to spend the holiday in the vicinity of Bass Lake and Yosemite. They had just got underway, most of them still irritable and sleepy from last-minute packing and hurrying the children through breakfast, when their car radios crackled a warning that they were headed right into the vortex of what might soon be a combat zone. They had read about Laconia and other Hells Angels outbursts, but in print, the menace had always seemed distant, terrifying to be sure, and real in its way. But with none of that sour stomach fright that comes with the realization that this time, it's you. Tomorrow's newspapers won't be talking about people being beaten and terrorized 3,000 miles away, but right exactly where you and your family are planning to spend the weekend. The bridge was crowded with vacationers getting an early start. I was running late by 20 or 30 minutes, and when I got to the toll plaza at the Oakland end of the bridge, I asked the gatekeeper if any Hells Angels had passed through before me. The dirty sons of bitches are right over there, he said with a wave of his hand. I didn't know what he was talking about until some 200 yards past the gate when I suddenly passed a large cluster of people and motorcycles grouped around a gray pickup truck with a swastika painted on the side. They seemed to materialize out of the fog, and the sight was having a bad effect on traffic. There are 17 eastbound toll gates on the bridge, and traffic coming out of them is funneled into only three exits, with everyone scrambling for position in a short, high-speed run between the toll plaza and the traffic dividers about a half mile away. 
This stretch is hazardous on a clear afternoon, but in the fog of a holiday morning and with a dread spectacle suddenly looming beside the road, the scramble was worse than usual. Horns sounded all around me as cars swerved and slowed down. Heads snapped to the right. It was the same kind of traffic disruption that occurs near a serious accident, and many a driver went off on the wrong ramp that morning after staring too long at the monster rally that, if he'd been listening to his radio, he'd been warned about just moments before. And now here it was, in the stinking tattooed flesh. The Menace I was close enough to recognize the Gypsy Jokers, about twenty of them, milling around the truck while they waited for late-running stragglers. They were paying no attention to the traffic, but their appearance alone was enough to give anyone pause. Except for the colors, they looked exactly like any band of Hell's Angels. Long hair, beards, black sleeveless vests, and the inevitable low-slung motorcycles, many with sleeping bags lashed to the handlebars and girls sitting lazily on the little pillion seats. The outlaws are very comfortable with their inaccessibility. It saves them a lot of trouble with bill collectors, revenge seekers, and routine police harassment. They are as insulated from society as they want to be, but they have no trouble locating each other. When Sonny flies to Los Angeles, Otto meets him at the airport. When Terry goes to Fresno, he quickly locates the chapter president, Ray, who exists in some kind of mysterious limbo and can only be found by means of a secret phone number, which changes constantly. The Oakland Angels find it convenient to use Barger's number, checking now and then for messages. Some use various saloons where they are well known. An angel who wants to be reached will make an appointment either to meet somewhere or to be at a certain phone at a designated time. One night, I tried to arrange a contact with a young angel named Roger, a one-time disc jockey. It proved to be impossible. He had no idea where he might be from one day to the next. They don't call me Roger the Lodger for nothing, he said. I just make it wherever I can. It's all the same. Once you start worrying about it, you get hung up. And that's the end, man. You're finished. If he'd been killed that night, he'd have left no footprints in life, no evidence, and no personal effects but his bike, which the others would have raffled off immediately. Hell's angels don't find it necessary to leave wills, and their deaths don't require much paperwork. A driver's license expires, a police record goes into the dead file, a motorcycle changes hands and usually a few personal cards will be taken out of wallets and dropped into waste baskets. Because of their gypsy style of life, their network has to be functional. A lost message can lead to serious trouble. An angel who might have fled will be arrested. A freshly stolen bike will never reach the buyer. A pound of marijuana might miss a crucial connection. Or at the very least... A whole chapter will never get word of a run or a big party. The destination of a run is kept secret as long as possible, hopefully to keep the cops guessing. The chapter presidents will figure it out by long-distance telephone, then each will tell his people the night before the run, either at a meeting or by putting the word with a handful of bartenders, waitresses, and plugged-in chicks who are known contacts. The system is highly efficient, but it has never been leak-proof. And by 1966, the Angels had decided that the only hope was to keep the destination a secret until the run was actually underway. Barger tried it once, but the police were able to track the outlaws by radioing ahead from one point to another. Radio tracking is only a device to give the cops an edge, a sense of confidence and control. Which it does, as long as no lapses occur. But it is safe to predict that on one of these crowded holidays, a convoy of angels is going to disappear like a blip shooting off the edge of a radar screen. All it will take is one of those rare gigs the outlaws are forever seeking. A ranch or a big farm with a friendly owner. A piece of rural turf beyond the reach of the fuzz, where they can all get drunk and naked and fall on each other like goats in the rut until they all pass out from exhaustion. It would be worth buying a police radio just to hear the panic. Group of 80 just passed through Sacramento, going north on U.S. 50. 
No violence. Thought to be headed for Lake Tahoe area. 50 miles north in Placerville, the police chief gives his men a pep talk and deploys them with shotguns on both sides of the highway, south of the city limits. Two hours later, they are still waiting, and the dispatcher in Sacramento relays an impatient demand for a report on Placerville's handling of the crisis. The chief nervously reports no contact and asks if his restless troops can go home and enjoy the holiday. The dispatcher, sitting in the radio room at Highway Patrol Headquarters in Sacramento, says to sit tight while he checks around. And moments later, his voice squawks out of the speaker. Schwein! You lie! Where are they? Don't call me no swine, says the Placerville chief. They never got here. The dispatcher checks all over Northern California with no result. Police cars scream up and down the highways, checking every bar. Nothing. Eighty of the state's most vicious hoodlums are roaming around drunk somewhere between Sacramento and Reno, hungry for rape and pillage. It will be another embarrassment for California law enforcement to simply lose the buggers a whole convoy right out on a main highway. Heads will surely roll. By now, the outlaws are far up a private road, having left the highway at a sign saying, Owl Farm, no visitors. They are beyond the reach of the law unless the owner complains. Meanwhile, another group of 50 disappears in the same vicinity. Police search parties stalk the highway, checking for traces of spittle, grime, and blood. The dispatcher still rages over his mic. The duty officer's voice cracks as he answers urgent queries from radio newsmen in San Francisco and Los Angeles. I'm sorry, that's all I can say. They seem to have, uh... Our information is that they, uh... They disappeared. Yes, uh, they're gone. The only reason it hasn't happened is that the Hells Angels have no access to private property in the boondocks. One or two claim to have relatives with farms, but there are no stories of the others being invited out for a picnic. The Angels don't have much contact with people who own land. They are city boys, economically and emotionally as well as physically. For at least one generation and sometimes two, they come from people who never owned anything at all, not even a car. The Hells Angels are very definitely a lower-class phenomenon, but their backgrounds are not necessarily poverty-stricken. Despite some grim moments, their parents seem to have had credit. Most of the outlaws are the sons of people who came to California either just before or during World War II. Many have lost contact with their families, and I have never met an angel who claimed to have a hometown in any sense that people who use that term might understand it. Terry the Tramp, for instance, is from Detroit, Norfolk, Long Island, Los Angeles, Fresno, and Sacramento. As a child, he lived all over the country, not in poverty, but in total mobility. Like most of the others, he has no roots. He relates entirely to the present, the moment, the action. His longest bout with stability was a three-year hitch in the Coast Guard after finishing high school. Since then, he has worked half-heartedly as a tree trimmer, mechanic, bit actor, laborer, and hustler of various commodities. He tried college for a few months, but quit to get married. After two years, two children, and numerous quarrels, the marriage ended in divorce. Now, after two hugely publicized rape arrests, he refers to himself as an eligible bachelor. Despite his spectacular rap sheet, he estimates his total jail time at about six months, 90 days for trespassing and the rest for traffic offenses. Terry is one of the most arrest-prone of all the angels. Cops are offended by the very sight of him. In one stretch covering 1964 and 65, he paid roughly $2,500 to bail bondsmen, lawyers, and traffic courts. Like most of the other angels, he blames the cops for making him a full-time outlaw. At least half the Hell's Angels are war babies, but that is a very broad term. There are also war babies in the Peace Corps, in corporate training programs, and fighting in Vietnam. 
World War II had a lot to do with the Hells Angels' origins, but you have to stretch the war theory pretty thin to cover both Dirty Ed in his early 40s and Clean Cut from Oakland, who was 20 years younger. Dirty Ed is old enough to be Clean Cut's father, which is not likely, though he's planted more seeds than he cares to remember. It is easy enough to trace the Hells Angels' mystique, and even their name and their emblems, back to World War II and Hollywood. But their genes and real history go back a lot further. World War II was not the original California boom, but a rebirth of a thing that began in the 30s and was already tapering off when the war economy made California a new Valhalla. In 1937, Woody Guthrie wrote a song called Do Re Mi. The chorus goes like this. California is a Garden of Eden, a paradise for you and for me. But believe it or not, you won't think it's so hot if you ain't got the do-re-mi. The song expressed the frustrated sentiments of more than a million Okies, Arkies, and Hillbillies who made a long trek to the Golden State and found it was just another hard dollar. By the time these gentlemen arrived, the westward movement was already beginning to solidify. The California way of life was the same old game to musical chairs. But it took a while for this news to filter back east, and meanwhile, the gold rush continued. Once here, the newcomers hung on for a few years, breeding prolifically, until the war started. Then they either joined up or had their pick of jobs on a booming labor market. Either way, they were Californians when the war ended. The old way of life was scattered back along Route 66, and their children grew up in a new world. The Linkhorns had finally found a home. Nelson Algren wrote about them in A Walk on the Wild Side, but that story was told before they crossed the Rockies. Dove Linkhorn, son of Crazy Fitz, went to hustle for his fortune in New Orleans. Ten years later, he would have gone to Los Angeles. Algren's book opens with one of the best historical descriptions of American white trash ever written. He traces the Linkhorn ancestry back to the first wave of bonded servants to arrive on these shores. These were the dregs of society from all over the British Isles. Misfits, criminals, debtors, social bankrupts of every type and description. All of them willing to sign oppressive work contracts with future employers in exchange for ocean passage to the New World. Once here... They endured a form of slavery for a year or two, during which they were fed and sheltered by the boss, and when their time of bondage ended, they were turned loose to make their own way. A story called Barn Burning by William Faulkner is another white trash classic. It provides the dimensions of humanity that Algren's description lacks. In theory, and in the context of history, the setup was mutually advantageous. Any man desperate enough to sell himself into bondage in the first place had pretty well shot his wad in the old country, so a chance for a foothold on a new continent was not to be taken lightly. After a period of hard labor and wretchedness, he would then be free to seize whatever he might in a land of seemingly infinite natural wealth. Thousands of bonded servants came over, but by the time they earned their freedom, the coastal strip was already settled. The unclaimed land was west, across the Alleghenies. So, they drifted into the new states, Kentucky and Tennessee. Their sons drifted onto Missouri, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. Drifting became a habit. With dead roots in the old world and none in the new, the Linkhorns were not of a mind to dig in and cultivate things. Bondage, too, became a habit, but it was only the temporary kind. They were not pioneers, but sleazy rearguard camp followers of the original westward movement. By the time the Linkhorns arrived anywhere, the land was already taken. So they worked for a while and moved on. Their world was a violent, boozing limbo between the pits of despair and the big rock candy mountain. They kept drifting west, chasing jobs, rumors, homestead grabs, or the luck of some front-running kin. They lived off the surface of the land, like army worms, stripping it of whatever they could before moving on. It was a day-to-day -day existence, and there was always more land to the west. 
Some stayed behind, and their lineal descendants are still there. In the Carolinas, Kentucky, West Virginia, and Tennessee. There were dropouts along the way. Hillbillies, Okies, Arkies. They're all the same people. Texas is a living monument to the breed. So is Southern California. Algren called them fierce, craving boys with a feeling of having been cheated. Freebooters, armed and drunk. A legion of gamblers, brawlers, and whorehoppers. Blowing into town in a junk Model A with bald tires, no muffler, and one headlight. Looking for quick work with no questions asked and preferably no tax deductions. Just get the cash. Fill up at a cut-rate gas station and hit the road with a pint on the seat and Eddie Arnold on the radio moaning good backcountry tunes about home sweet home, that bluegrass sweetheart still waiting, and roses on mama's grave. Algren left the link horns in Texas, but anyone who drives the western highways knows they didn't stay there either. They kept moving until one day in the late 1930s, they stood on the spine of a scrub oak California hill and looked down on the Pacific Ocean. The end of the road. Things were tough for a while, but no tougher than they were in a hundred other places. And then came the war. Fat city. Big money even for Linkhorns. When the war ended, California was full of veterans looking for ways to spend their separation bonuses. Many decided to stay on the coast, and while their new radios played hillbilly music, they went out and bought big motorcycles. Not knowing exactly why, but in the booming, rootless atmosphere of those times... It seemed like the thing to do. They were not all Linkhorns, but the forced democracy of four war years had erased so many old distinctions that even Linkhorns were confused. Their pattern of intermarriage was shattered, their children mixed freely and without violence. By 1950, many Linkhorns were participating in the money economy. They owned decent cars and even houses. Others, however broke down under the strain of respectability and answered the call of the genes. There is a story about a Linkhorn who became a wealthy car dealer in Los Angeles. He married a beautiful Spanish actress and bought a mansion in Beverly Hills. But after a decade of opulence, he suffered from soaking sweats and was unable to sleep at night. He began to sneak out of the house through the servant's entrance and run a few blocks to a gas station where he kept a hopped-up 37 Ford with no fenders and spent the rest of the night hanging around honky-tonk bars and truck stops, dressed in dirty overalls and a crusty green T-shirt with a Bardall emblem on the back. He enjoyed cadging beers and belting whores around when they spurned his crude propositions. One night, after long haggling... He bought several mason jars full of home whiskey, which he drank while driving at high speed through the Beverly Hills area. When the old Ford finally threw a rod, he abandoned it and called a taxi, which took him to his own automobile agency. He kicked down a side door, hot-wired a convertible waiting for tune-up, and drove out to Highway 101, where he got in a drag race with some hoodlums from Pasadena. He lost and it so enraged him that he followed the other car until it stopped for a traffic light, where he rammed it from the rear at 70 miles an hour. The publicity ruined him, but influential friends kept him out of jail by paying a psychiatrist to call him insane. He spent a year in a rest home, and now, according to the stories, he has a motorcycle dealership near San Diego. People who know him say he's happy. Although his driver's license has been revoked for numerous violations, his business is verging on bankruptcy, and his new wife, a jaded ex-beauty queen from West Virginia, is a half-mad alcoholic. It would not be fair to say that all motorcycle outlaws carry Linkhorn jeans, but nobody who has ever spent time among the inbred Anglo-Saxon tribes of Appalachia would need more than a few hours with the Hells Angels to work up a very strong sense of deja vu. There is the same sulking hostility toward outsiders, the same extremes of temper and action, and even the same names, sharp faces, and long-boned bodies that never look quite natural unless they are leaning on something. Most of the angels are obvious Anglo-Saxons, but the Linkhorn attitude is contagious. 
The few outlaws with Mexican or Italian names not only act like the others, but somehow look like them. Even Chinese Mel from Frisco and Charlie, a young Negro from Oakland, have the Linkhorn gait and mannerisms. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. The funeral of Mother Miles. A quote from Dr. Johnson. He who makes a beast of himself gets rid of the pain of being a man. A quote from an account of the death of John Dillinger. The neighborhood suddenly exploded with excited, morbid crowds. Hysterical women surged forward in a frenzy, screeching in almost sexual ecstasy, scratching and fighting the agents and police in their attempt to reach the body. One fat-breasted woman with stringy red hair broke through the cordon and dipped her handkerchief in the blood, clutched it to her sweaty dress, and waddled off down the street. Toward Christmas, the action slowed down, and the angels dropped out of the headlines. Tiny lost his job, Sonny got involved in a long jury trial on the attempted murder charge, and the El Adobe was demolished by the Wreckers Ball. The angels drifted from one bar to another, but they found it harder to establish a hangout than to maintain one. In San Francisco, it was just as slow. Frenchy spent three months in General Hospital when a can of gasoline blew up on him, and Puff went to jail after a fracas with two cops who raided an angel birthday party. Winter is always slow for the outlaws. Many have to go to work to stay eligible for next summer's unemployment insurance. It is too cold for big outdoor parties, and the constant rain makes riding an uncomfortable hazard. It seemed like a good time to get some work done, so I dropped off the circuit. Terry came by now and then to keep me posted. One day, he showed up with a broken arm, saying he'd wrecked his bike. His old lady had left him, and the niggers had blown up his house. I'd heard about the house from Barger's wife, Elsie, who was handling the communications post at their home in Oakland. During one of the sporadic flare-ups between the Hells Angels and the Oakland Negroes, somebody had thrown a homemade bomb through the window of the house that Terry was renting in East Oakland. The fire destroyed the house and all of Marilyn's paintings. She was a pretty little girl about 19 with long blonde hair and a respectable family in one of the valley towns. She'd been living with Terry for nearly six months, covering the walls with her artwork, but she had no stomach for bombs. The divorce was effected soon after they moved to another dwelling. I came back one night and she was gone, said Terry. All she left was a note. Dear Terry, fuck it. And that was that. Nothing else happened until January, when Mother Miles got snuffed. He was riding his bike through Berkeley when a truck came out of a side street and hit him head on, breaking both legs and fracturing his skull. He hung in a coma for six days, then died on a Sunday morning, less than 24 hours before his 30th birthday, leaving a wife, two children, and his righteous girlfriend, Anne. Miles had been president of the Sacramento chapter. His influence was so great that in 1965, he moved the whole club down to Oakland, claiming the police had made life intolerable for them by constant harassment. The outlaws simply picked up and moved, not questioning Miles' wisdom. His real name was James, but the angels called him Mother. I guess it was because he was kind of motherly, said Gut. Miles was great, great people. He took care of everybody. He worried. You could always depend on him. I knew Miles in a distant kind of way. He didn't trust writers, but there was nothing mean about him, and once he decided I wasn't going to get him locked up somehow, he was friendly. He had the build of a pot-bellied stevedore, with a round face and a wide, flaring beard. I never thought of him as a hoodlum. He had the usual Hells Angels police record, drunk, disorderly, fighting, vagrancy, loitering, petty larceny, and a handful of ominous suspicion of charges that had never gone to trial. But he wasn't plagued by the same demons that motivate some of the others. He wasn't happy with the world, but he didn't brood about it, and his appetite for revenge didn't extend beyond specific wrongs done to the angels or to him personally. 
You could drink with Miles without wondering when he was going to swing on somebody or lift your money off the bar. He wasn't that way. Booze seemed to make him more genial. Like most of the Angels' leaders, he had a quick mind and a quality of self-control which the others relied on. When I heard he'd been killed, I called Sonny to ask about the funeral. But by the time I finally got hold of him, the details were already on the radio and in the newspapers. Miles' mother was arranging for the funeral in Sacramento. The outlaw caravan would form at Barger's house at 11 on Thursday morning. The angels had gone to plenty of funerals for their own people. But until this one, they had never tried to run the procession for 90 miles along a major highway. There was also a chance that the Sacramento police would try to keep them out of town. The word went out on Monday and Tuesday by telephone. This was not going to be any Jay Gatsby funeral. The angels wanted a full-dress rally. Miles' status was not the point. The death of any angel requires a show of strength by the others. It is a form of affirmation, not for the dead, but the living. There are no set penalties for not showing up because none are necessary. In the cheap loneliness that is the overriding fact of every outlaw's life, a funeral is a bleak reminder that the tribe is smaller by one. The circle is one link shorter. The enemy jacks up the odds just a little bit more. And defenders of the faith need something to take off the chill. A funeral is a time for counting the loyal, for seeing how many are left. There is no question about skipping work, going without sleep, or riding for hours in a cold wind to be there on time. Early Thursday morning, the bikes began arriving in Oakland. Most of the outlaws were already in the Bay Area, or at least within 50 or 60 miles. But a handful of Satan's slaves rode all a Wednesday night, 500 miles from Los Angeles, to join the main caravan. Others came from Fresno and San Jose and Santa Rosa. There were hangmen, misfits, presidents, night riders, crossmen, and some with no colors at all. A hard-faced little man whom nobody spoke to wore an olive drab bombardier's jacket with just the word loner on the back, written in small, blue-inked letters that looked like a signature. I was crossing the Bay Bridge when a dozen gypsy jokers came roaring past, ignoring the speed limit as they split up to go around me on both sides of the car. Seconds later, they disappeared up ahead in the fog. The morning was cold and bridge traffic was slow, except for motorcycles. Down in the bay, there were freighters lined up, waiting for open piers. The procession rolled at exactly 11, 150 bikes and about 20 cars. A few miles north of Oakland, at the Carquinez Bridge, the outlaws picked up a police escort assigned to keep them under control. A highway patrol car led the caravan all the way to Sacramento. The lead angels rode two abreast in the right lane holding a steady 65 miles an hour. At the head, with Barger, was the scruffy Praetorian guard. Magoo, Tommy, Jimmy, Skip, Tiny, Zorro, Terry, and Charger Charlie, the child molester. The spectacle disrupted traffic all along the way. It looked like something from another world. Here was the scum of the earth the lowest form of animals, an army of unwashed gang rapists, being escorted toward the state capitol by a highway patrol car with a flashing yellow light. The steady pace of the procession made it unnaturally solemn. Not even Senator Murphy could have mistaken it for a dangerous run. There were the same bearded faces, the same earrings, emblems, swastikas, and grinning death's heads flapping in the wind, but this time... There were no party clothes, no hamming it up for the squares. They were still playing the role, but all the humor was missing. The only trouble en route came when the procession was halted after a filling station owner complained that somebody had stolen 14 quarts of oil at the last gas stop. Barger quickly took up a collection to pay the man off, muttering that whoever stole the oil was due for a chain whipping later on. The angels assured each other that it must have been a punk in one of the cars at the rear of the caravan, some shithead without any class. In Sacramento, there was no sign of harassment. 
Hundreds of curious spectators lined the route between the funeral home and the cemetery. Inside the chapel, a handful of Jim Miles' childhood friends and relatives waited with his body, a hired minister, and three nervous attendants. They knew what was coming. Mother Miles' people, hundreds of thugs, wild brawlers, and bizarre-looking girls in tight Levi's, scarves, and waist-length platinum-colored wigs. Miles' mother, a heavy middle-aged woman in a black suit, wept quietly in a front pew facing the open casket. At 1.30, the outlaw caravan arrived. The slow rumble of motorcycle engines rattled glass in the mortuary windows. Police tried to keep traffic moving as TV cameras followed Barger and perhaps a hundred others toward the door of the chapel. Many outlaws waited outside during the service. They stood in quiet groups, leaning against the bikes and killing time with lazy conversation. There was hardly any talk about Miles. In one group, a pint of whiskey made the rounds. Some of the outlaws talked to bystanders, trying to explain what was happening. Yeah, the guy was one of our leaders, said an angel to an elderly man in a baseball cap. He was good people. Some punk ran a stop sign and snuffed him. We came to bury him with the colors. Inside the pine-paneled chapel, the minister was telling his weird congregation that the wages of sin is death. He looked like a Norman Rockwell druggist and was obviously repelled by the whole scene. Not all the pews were full, but standing room in the rear was crowded all the way back to the door. The minister talked about sin and justification, pausing now and then as if he expected a rebuttal from the crowd. It's not my business to pass judgment on anybody, he continued, nor is it my business to eulogize anybody. But it is my business to speak out a warning that it will happen to you. I don't know what philosophy some of you have about death, but I know the scriptures tell us that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Jesus didn't die for an animal. He died for a man. What I say about Jim won't change anything, but I can preach the gospel to you, and I have a responsibility to warn you that you will all have to answer to God. The crowd was shifting and sweating. The chapel was so hot that it seemed like the devil himself was waiting in one of the anterooms, ready to claim the wicked just as soon as the sermon was over. How many of you, asked the minister, how many of you... Asked yourselves on the way up here, who is next? At this point, several angels in the pews rose and walked out, cursing quietly at a way of life they had long ago left behind. The minister ignored these mutinous signs and launched into a story about a Philippian jailer. Holy shit, mumbled Tiny. He'd been standing quietly in the rear for about 30 minutes, pouring sweat and eyeing the minister as if he meant to hunt him down later in the day and extract all his teeth. Tiny's departure caused five or six others to leave. The minister sensed he was losing his audience, so he brought the Philippine story to a quick end. There was no music as the crowd filed out. I passed by the casket and was shocked to see Mother Miles clean-shaven, lying peacefully on his back in a blue suit, white shirt, and a wide maroon tie. His Hell's Angels jacket, covered with exotic emblems, was mounted on a stand at the foot of the casket. Behind it were 13 wreaths, some bearing names of other outlaw clubs. I barely recognized Miles. He looked younger than 29 and very ordinary, but his face was calm, as though he were not at all surprised to find himself there in a box. He wouldn't have liked the clothes he was wearing, but since the angels weren't paying for the funeral, the best they could do was make sure the colors went into the casket before it was sealed. Barger stayed behind with the pallbearers to make sure the thing was done right. After the funeral, more than 200 motorcycles followed the hearse to the cemetery. Behind the angels rode all the other clubs, including a half dozen East Bay Dragons, and according to a radio commentator... Dozens of teenage riders who looked so solemn that you'd think Robin Hood had just died. The Hell's Angels knew better. 
Not all of them had read about Robin Hood, but they understood that the parallel was complimentary. Perhaps the younger outlaws believed it, but there is room in their margin for one or two friendly illusions. Those who are almost 30, or more than that, have been living too long with their own scurvy image to think of themselves as heroes. They understand that heroes are always good guys, and they have seen enough cowboy movies to know that good guys win in the end. The myth didn't seem to include Miles, who was one of the best. But all he got in the end was two broken legs, a smashed head, and a tongue lashing from the preacher. Only his Hell's Angels identity kept him from going to the grave as anonymously as any ribbon clerk. As it was, his funeral got nationwide press coverage. Life had a picture of the procession entering the cemetery. TV newscasts gave the funeral a solemn priority. And the Chronicle headline said, Hell's Angels Bury Their Own, Black Jackets, and an Odd Dignity. Mother Miles would have been pleased. Moments after the burial, the caravan was escorted out of town by a phalanx of police cars with sirens howling. The brief truce was ended. At the city limits, the angels screwed it on and roared back to Richmond across the bay from San Francisco, where they held an all-night wake that kept police on edge until long after dawn. On Sunday night, there was a meeting in Oakland to confirm Miles' successor, Big Al. It was a quiet affair, but without the grimness of the funeral. The banshee's wail that had seemed so loud on Thursday was already fading away. After the meeting, there was a beer party at the Sinners Club, and by the time the place closed... They had already set the date for the next run. The angels would gather in Bakersfield on the first day of spring. Remembered line from a long-forgotten poem. All my life my heart has sought a thing I cannot name. Months later, when I rarely saw the angels, I still had the legacy of the big machine. 400 pounds of chrome and deep red noise to take out on the coast highway and cut loose at 3 in the morning when all the cops were lurking over on 101. My first crash had wrecked the bike completely, and it took several months to have it rebuilt. After that, I decided to ride it differently. I would stop pushing my luck on curves, always wear a helmet, and try to keep within range of the nearest speed limit. My insurance had already been canceled, and my driver's license was hanging by a thread. So it was always at night, like a werewolf, that I would take the thing out for an honest run down the coast. I would start in Golden Gate Park, thinking only to run a few long curves to clear my head. But in a matter of minutes, I'd be out at the beach with the sound of the engine in my ears, the surf booming up on the seawall, and a fine empty road stretching all the way down to Santa Cruz. Not even a gas station in the whole 70 miles. The only public light along the way is an all-night diner down around Rockaway Beach. There was no helmet on those nights, no speed limit, and no cooling it down on the curves. The momentary freedom of the park was like the one unlucky drink that shoves a wavering alcoholic off the wagon. I would come out of the park near the soccer field and pause for a moment at the stop sign wondering if I knew anyone parked out there on the midnight humping strip. Then into first gear, forgetting the cars and letting the beast wind out. 35, 45, then into second and wailing through the light at Lincoln Way, not worried about green or red signals, but only some other werewolf loony who might be pulling out too slowly to start his own run. Not many of these, and with three lanes on a wide curve, a bike coming hard has plenty of room to get around almost anything. Then into third, the boomer gear, pushing 75 and the beginning of a wind scream in the ears, a pressure on the eyeballs like diving into water off a high board. Bent forward, far back on the seat, and a rigid grip on the handlebars as the bike starts jumping and wavering in the wind. Tail lights far up ahead, coming closer, faster, and suddenly, zap! going past and leaning down for a curve near the zoo where the road swings out to sea. 
The dunes are flatter here, and on windy nights, sand blows across the highway, piling up in thick drifts, as deadly as any oil slick. Instant loss of control, a crashing, cartwheeling slide, and maybe one of those two-inch notices in the paper the next day. An unidentified motorcyclist was killed last night when he failed to negotiate a turn on Highway 1. Indeed! But no sand this time, so the lever goes up and to fourth, and now there's no sound except wind. Screw it all the way over, reach through the handlebars to raise the headlight beam. The needle leans down on a hundred, and wind-burned eyeballs strain to see down the center line, trying to provide a margin for the reflexes. But with the throttle screwed on, there is only the barest margin and no room at all for mistakes. It has to be done right. And that's when the strange music starts, when you stretch your luck so far that fear becomes exhilaration and vibrates along your arms. You can barely see at a hundred. The tears blow back so fast that they vaporize before they get to your ears. The only sounds are wind and a dull roar floating back from the mufflers. You watch the white line and try to lean with it, howling through a turn to the right, then to the left, and down the long hill to Pacifica. Letting off now, watching for cops, but only until the next dark stretch and another few seconds on the edge. The edge. There is no honest way to explain it, because the only people who really know where it is are the ones who have gone over. The others, the living, are those who pushed their control as far as they felt they could handle it, and then pulled back, or slowed down or did whatever they had to when it came time to choose between now and later. But the edge is still out there. Or maybe it's in. The association of motorcycles with LSD is no accident of publicity. They are both a means to an end. To the place of definitions. Welcome to Las Vegas. When the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. From Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, Random House, 1972. We were somewhere around Barstow on the edge of the desert when the drugs began to take hold. I remember saying something like, I feel a bit lightheaded. Maybe you should drive. And suddenly... There was a terrible roar all around us, and the sky was full of what looked like huge bats, all swooping and screeching and diving around the car, which was going about a hundred miles an hour with the top down to Las Vegas. And a voice was screaming, Holy Jesus! What are these goddamn animals? Then it was quiet again. My attorney had taken his shirt off and was pouring beer on his chest, to facilitate the tanning process. What the hell are you yelling about, he muttered, staring up at the sun with his eyes closed and covered with wraparound Spanish sunglasses. Never mind, I said. It's your turn to drive. I hit the brakes and aimed the great red shark toward the shoulder of the highway. No point mentioning those bats, I thought. The poor bastard will see them soon enough. It was almost noon, and we still had more than a hundred miles to go. They would be tough miles. Very soon, I knew, we would both be completely twisted. But there was no going back and no time to rest. We would have to ride it out. Press registration for the fabulous Mint 400 was already underway, and we had to get there by four to claim our soundproof suite. A fashionable sporting magazine in New York had taken care of the reservations, along with this huge red Chevy convertible we just rented off a lot on the Sunset Strip. And I was, after all, a professional journalist. So I had an obligation to cover the story, for good or ill. The sporting editors had also given me $300 in cash, most of which was already spent on extremely dangerous drugs. The trunk of the car looked like a mobile police narcotics lab. We had two bags of grass, 75 pellets of mescaline, five sheets of high-powered blotter acid, a salt shaker half full of cocaine, and a whole galaxy of multicolored uppers, downers, screamers, laughers, and also a quart of tequila, 
a quart of rum, a case of Budweiser, a pint of raw ether, and two dozen amels. All this had been rounded up the night before, in a frenzy of high-speed driving all over Los Angeles County. From Topanga to Watts, we picked up everything we could get our hands on. Not that we needed all that for the trip, but once you get locked into a serious drug collection, the tendency is to push it as far as you can. The only thing that really worried me was the ether. There's nothing in the world more helpless and irresponsible and depraved than a man in the depths of an ether binge. And I knew we'd get into that rotten stuff pretty soon, probably at the next gas station. We had sampled almost everything else, and now, yes, it was time for a long snort of ether, and then do the next hundred miles in a horrible, slobbering sort of spastic stupor. The only way to keep alert on ether is to do up a lot of animals. Not all at once, but steadily. Just enough to maintain the focus at 90 miles an hour through Barstow. Man, this is the way to travel, said my attorney. He leaned over to turn the volume up on the radio, humming along with the rhythm section and kind of moaning the words. One toke over the line, sweet Jesus. One toke over the line. One toke? You poor fool. Wait till you see those goddamn bats. I could barely hear the radio, slumped over on the far side of the seat, grappling with a tape recorder turned all the way up on Sympathy for the Devil. That was the only tape we had, so we played it constantly, over and over, as a kind of demented counterpoint to the radio, and also to maintain our rhythm on the road. A constant speed is good for gas mileage, and for some reason, that seemed important at the time. Indeed! On a trip like this, one must be careful about gas consumption. Avoid those quick bursts of acceleration that drag blood to the back of the brain. My attorney saw the hitchhiker long before I did. Let's give this boy a lift, he said. And before I could mount any argument, he was stopped, and this poor Oki kid was running up to the car with a big grin on his face, saying... Hot damn! I never rode in a convertible before! Is that right, I said. Well, I guess you're about ready, eh? The kid nodded eagerly as we roared off. We're your friends, said my attorney. We're not like the others. Oh, Christ, I thought. He's gone around the bend. No more of that talk, I said sharply, or I'll put the leeches on you. He grinned seemed to understand. Luckily, the noise in the car was so awful between the wind and the radio and the tape machine that the kid in the back seat couldn't hear a word we were saying. Or could he? How long can we maintain, I wondered. How long before one of us starts raving and jabbering at this boy? What will he think then? This same lonely desert was the last known home of the Manson family. Will he make that grim connection when my attorney starts screaming about bats and huge manta rays coming down on the car? If so, well, we'll just have to cut his head off and bury him somewhere. Because it goes without saying that we can't turn him loose. He'll report us at once to some kind of outback Nazi law enforcement agency, and they'll run us down like dogs. Jesus, did I say that? Or just think it? Was I talking? Did they hear me? I glanced over at my attorney, but he seemed oblivious, watching the road, driving our great red shark along at a hundred and ten or so. There was no sound from the back seat. Maybe I'd better have a chat with this boy, I thought. Perhaps if I explain things, he'll rest easy. Of course. I leaned around in the seat and gave him a fine, big smile, admiring the shape of his skull. By the way, I said, there's one thing you should probably understand. He stared at me, not blinking. Was he gritting his teeth? Can you hear me, I yelled. He nodded. That's good, I said, because I want you to know that we're on our way to Las Vegas to find the American dream. I smiled. That's why we rented this car. It was the only way to do it. Can you grasp that? 
He nodded again, but his eyes were nervous. I want you to have all the background, I said, because this is a very ominous assignment with overtones of extreme personal danger. Hell, I forgot all about this beer. You want one? He shook his head. How about some ether, I said. What? Never mind. Let's get right to the heart of this thing. You see, about 24 hours ago, we were sitting in the polo lounge of the Beverly Hills Hotel, in the patio section, of course, and we were just sitting there under a palm tree when this uniformed dwarf came up to me with a pink telephone and said, This must be the call you've been waiting for all this time, sir. I laughed and ripped open a beer can that foamed all over the back seat while I kept talking. And you know, he was right. I'd been expecting that call, but I didn't know who it would come from. Do you follow me? The boy's face was a mask of pure fear and bewilderment. I blundered on. I want you to understand that this man at the wheel is my attorney. He's not just some dingbat I found on the strip. Shit, look at him. He doesn't look like you or me, right? That's because he's a foreigner. I think he's probably Samoan. But it doesn't matter, does it? Are you prejudiced? Oh, hell no, he blurted. I didn't think so, I said. Because in spite of his race, this man is extremely valuable to me. I glanced over at my attorney, but his mind was somewhere else. I whacked the back of the driver's seat with my fist. This is important, goddammit! This is a true story! The car swerved sickeningly, then straightened out. Keep your hands off my fucking neck, my attorney screamed. The kid in the back looked like he was ready to jump right out of the car and take his chances. Our vibrations were getting nasty, but why? I was puzzled, frustrated. Was there no communication in this car? Had we deteriorated to the level of dumb beasts? Because my story was true, I was certain of that, and it was extremely important, I felt, for the meaning of our journey to be made absolutely clear. We had actually been sitting there in the polo lounge for many hours, drinking Singapore slings with mezcal on the side and beer chasers. And when the call came, I was ready. The dwarf approached our table cautiously, as I recall, and when he handed me the pink telephone, I said nothing, merely listened. And then I hung up, turning to face my attorney. That was headquarters, I said. They want me to go to Las Vegas at once and make contact with a Portuguese photographer named Lacerda. He'll have the details. All I have to do is check my suite and he'll seek me out. My attorney said nothing for a moment. Then he suddenly came alive in his chair. God, hell, he exclaimed. I think I see the pattern. This one sounds like real trouble. He tucked his khaki undershirt into his white rayon bell-bottoms and called for more drink. You're going to need plenty of legal advice before this thing is over, he said, and my first advice is that you should rent a very fast car with no top and get the hell out of L.A. for at least 48 hours. He shook his head sadly. This blows my weekend, because naturally I'll have to go with you. And we'll have to arm ourselves. Why not, I said. If a thing like this is worth doing at all, it's worth doing right. We'll need some decent equipment and plenty of cash on the line. If only for drugs and a super sensitive tape recorder for the sake of a permanent record. What kind of story is this, he asked. The Mint 400, I said. It's the richest off-the-road race for motorcycles and dune buggies in the history of organized sport. A fantastic spectacle in honor of some fat-back grocero named Del Webb, who owns the luxurious Mint Hotel in the heart of downtown Las Vegas. At least that's what the press release says. My man in New York just read it to me. Well, he said, as your attorney, I advise you to buy a motorcycle. How else can you cover a thing like this righteously? No way, I said. Where can we get hold of a Vincent Black Shadow? What's that? A fantastic bike, I said. 
The new model is something like 2,000 cubic inches, developing 200 brake horsepower at 4,000 revolutions per minute on a magnesium frame with two styrofoam seats and a total curb weight of exactly 200 pounds. That sounds about right for this gig, he said. It is, I assured him. The fucker's not much for turning, but it's pure hell on the straightaway. It'll outrun the F-111 until takeoff. Takeoff, he said. Can we handle that much torque? Absolutely, I said. I'll call New York for some cash. Strange Medicine on the Desert A Crisis of Confidence I'm still vaguely haunted by our hitchhiker's remark about how he'd never rode in a convertible before. Here's this poor geek, living in a world of convertibles, zipping past him on the highways all the time, and he's never even ridden in one. It made me feel like King Farouk. I was tempted to have my attorney pull into the next airport and arrange some kind of simple common law contract whereby we could just give the car to this unfortunate bastard. Just say, here, sign this and the car's yours. Give him the keys and then use the credit card to zap off on a jet to some place like Miami and rent another huge fire apple red convertible for a drug-addled top speed run across the water all the way out to the last stop in Key West and then trade the car off for a boat. Keep moving! But this manic notion passed quickly. There was no point in getting this harmless kid locked up and besides, I had plans for this car. I was looking forward to flashing around Las Vegas in the bugger, maybe do a bit of serious drag racing on the strip, pull up to that big stoplight in front of the Flamingo and start screaming at the traffic. All right, you chicken shit wimps, you pansies, when this goddamn light flips green, I'm gonna stomp down on this thing and blow every one of you gutless punks off the road. Right. Challenge the bastards on their own turf. Come screeching up to the crosswalk, bucking and skidding with a bottle of rum in one hand and jamming the horn to drown out the music. Glazed eyes insanely dilated behind tiny black, gold-rimmed greaser shades, screaming gibberish. A genuinely dangerous drunk reeking of ether and terminal psychosis. Revving the engine up to a horrible high-pitched chattering whine, waiting for the light to change. How often does a chance like that come around? To jangle the bastards right down to the core of their spleens. Old elephants limp off to the hills to die. Old Americans go out to the highway and drive themselves to death with huge cars. But our trip was different. It was a classic affirmation of everything right and true and decent in the national character. It was a gross physical salute to the fantastic possibilities of life in this country, but only for those with true grit. And we were chock full of that. My attorney understood this concept despite his racial handicap, but our hitchhiker was not an easy person to reach. He said he understood, but I could see in his eyes that he didn't. He was lying to me. The car suddenly veered off the road and we came to a sliding halt in the gravel. I was hurled against the dashboard. My attorney was slumped over the wheel. What's wrong, I yelled. We can't stop here. This is back country. My heart, he groaned. Where's the medicine? Oh, I said. The medicine, yes, it's right here. I reached into the kit bag for the animals. The kid seemed petrified. Don't worry, I said. This man has a bad heart. Angina pectoris. But we have the cure for it. Yes. Here they are. I picked four amyls out of the tin box and handed two of them to my attorney. He immediately cracked one under his nose, and I did likewise. He took a long snort and fell back on the seat, staring straight up at the sun. Turn up the fucking music, he screamed. My heart feels like an alligator. Volume, clarity, bass. We must have bass. He flailed his naked arms at the sky. What's wrong with us? Are we goddamn old ladies? 
I turned both the radio and the tape machine up full bore. You scurvy shyster bastard, I said. Watch your language. You're talking to a doctor of journalism. He was laughing out of control. What the fuck are we doing out here on this desert, he shouted. Somebody call the police. We need help. Pay no attention to this swine, I said to the hitchhiker. He can't handle the medicine. Actually, we're both doctors of journalism, and we're on our way to Las Vegas to cover the main story of our generation. And then I began laughing. My attorney hunched around to face the hitchhiker. The truth is, he said, we're going to Vegas to croak a skag baron named Savage Henry. I've known him for years, but he ripped us off. And you know what that means, right? I wanted to shut him off, but we were both helpless with laughter. What the fuck were we doing out here on this desert when we both had bad hearts? Savage Henry has cashed his check, my attorney snarled at the kid in the back seat. We're going to rip his lungs out. And eat them, I blurted. That bastard won't get away with this. What's going on in this country when a scum sucker like that can get away with sandbagging a doctor of journalism? Nobody answered. My attorney was cracking another ammo, and the kid was climbing out of the back seat, scrambling down the trunk lid. Thanks for the ride, he said. Thanks a lot. I like you guys. Don't worry about me. His feet hit the asphalt, and he started running back towards Baker. Out in the middle of the desert, not a tree in sight. Wait a minute, I yelled. Come back and get a beer. But apparently he couldn't hear me. The music was very loud, and he was moving away from us at good speed. Good riddance, said my attorney. We had a real freak on our hands. That boy made me nervous. Did you see his eyes? He was still laughing. Jesus, he said. This is good medicine. I opened the door and reeled around to the driver's side. Move over, I said. I'll drive. We have to get out of California before that kid finds a cop. Shit, that'll be ours, said my attorney. He's a hundred miles from anywhere. So are we, I said. Let's turn around and drive back to the polo lounge, he said. They'll never look for us there. I ignored him. Open the tequila, I yelled as the wind scream took over again. I stomped on the accelerator as we hurtled back onto the highway. Moments later... He leaned over with a map. There's a place up ahead called Mezcal Springs, he said. As your attorney, I advise you to stop and take a swim. I shook my head. It's absolutely imperative that we get to the Mint Hotel before the deadline for press registration, I said. Otherwise, we might have to pay for our suite. He nodded. But let's forget that bullshit about the American dream, he said. The important thing is the great Samoan dream. He was rummaging around in the kit bag. I think it's about time to chew up a blotter, he said. That cheap mescaline wore off a long time ago, and I don't know if I can stand the smell of that goddamn ether any longer. I like it, I said. We should soak a towel with the stuff and then put it down on the floorboard by the accelerator so the fumes will rise up in my face all the way to Las Vegas. He was turning the tape cassette over. The radio was screaming, power to the people, right on. John Lennon's political song, Ten Years Too Late. That poor fool should have stayed where he was, said my attorney. Punks like that just get in the way when they try to be serious. Speaking of serious, I said, I think it's about time to get into the ether and the cocaine. Forget ether, he said. Let's save it for soaking down the rug in the suite. But here's this. You're half of the sunshine blotter. Just chew it up like baseball gum. I took the blotter and ate it. My attorney was now fumbling with the salt shaker containing the cocaine, opening it, spilling it, then screaming and grabbing at the air as our fine white dust blew up and out across the desert highway. A very expensive little twister rising up from the great red shark. Oh, Jesus, he moaned. Did you see what God just did to us? God didn't do that, I shouted. You did it. You're a fucking narcotics agent. I was onto your stinking act from the start, you pig. 
You better be careful, he said. And suddenly he was waving a fat black 357 Magnum at me. One of those snub-nosed Colt Pythons with the beveled cylinder. Plenty of vultures out here, he said. They'll pick your bones clean before morning. You whore, I said. When we get to Las Vegas, I'll have you chopped into hamburger. What do you think the drug bund will do when I show up with a Samoan narcotics agent? They'll kill us both, he said. Savage Henry knows who I am. Shit, I'm your attorney. He burst into wild laughter. You're full of acid, you fool. It'll be a goddamn miracle if we can get to the hotel and check in before you turn into a wild animal. Are you ready for that? Checking into a Vegas hotel under a phony name with intent to commit capital fraud and a head full of acid? He was laughing again. Then he jammed his nose down toward the salt shaker, aiming the thin green roll of a $20 bill straight into what was left of the powder. How long do we have, I said. Maybe 30 more minutes, he replied. As your attorney, I advise you to drive at top speed. Las Vegas was just up ahead. I could see the strip hotel skyline looming up through the blue desert ground haze. The Sahara, the Landmark, the Americana, and the ominous Thunderbird. A cluster of gray rectangles in the distance, rising out of the cactus. Thirty minutes. It was going to be very close. The objective was the big tower of the Mint Hotel downtown, and if we didn't get there before we lost all control, there was also the Nevada State Prison upstate in Carson City. I'd been there once, but only for a talk with the prisoners, and I didn't want to go back, for any reason at all. So there was really no choice. We would have to run the gauntlet and acid be damned, go through all the official gibberish, get the car into the hotel garage, work out on the desk clerk, deal with the bellboy, sign in for the press passes, all of it bogus, totally illegal, a fraud on its face, but of course, it would have to be done. Kill the body, and the head will die. This line appears in my notebook for some reason. Perhaps some connection with Joe Frazier? Is he still alive? Still able to talk? I watched that fight in Seattle, horribly twisted about four seats down the aisle from the governor. A very painful experience in every way. A proper end to the 60s. Tim Leary, a prisoner of Eldridge Cleaver in Algeria. Bob Dylan clipping coupons in Greenwich Village. Both Kennedys murdered by mutants. Owsley folding napkins on Terminal Island, and finally, Cassius slash Ali belted incredibly off his pedestal by a human hamburger, a man on the verge of death. Joe Frazier, like Nixon, had finally prevailed for reasons that people like me refused to understand. At least not out loud. But that was some other era, burned out and long gone from the brutish realities of this foul year of our Lord, 1971. A lot of things had changed in those years. And now, I was in Las Vegas as the motorsports editor of this fine, slick magazine that had sent me out here in the Great Red Shark for some reason that nobody claimed to understand. Just check it out, they said, and we'll take it from there. Indeed! Check it out! But when we finally arrived at the Mint Hotel, my attorney was unable to cope artfully with the registration procedure. We were forced to stand in line with all the others, which proved to be extremely difficult under the circumstances. I kept telling myself, be quiet, be calm, say nothing, speak only when spoken to, name, rank, and press affiliation, nothing else. Ignore this terrible drug. Pretend it's not happening. There is no way to explain the terror I felt when I finally lunged up to the clerk and began babbling. All my well-rehearsed lines fell apart under that woman's stony glare. Hi there, I said. My name is, uh, Raul Duke. Yes, on the list, that's for sure. Free lunch, final wisdom, total coverage. Why not? I have my attorney with me, and I realize, of course, that his name is not on the list, but we must have that suite, yes, this man is actually my driver. We brought this red shark all the way from the strip, and now it's time for the desert, right? Yes, just check the list and you'll see. Don't worry, 
What's the score here? What's next? The woman never blinked. Your room's not ready yet, she said. But there's somebody looking for you. No, I shouted. Why? We haven't done anything yet. My legs felt rubbery. I gripped the desk and sagged toward her as she held out the envelope, but I refused to accept it. The woman's face was changing, swelling, pulsing, horrible green jowls and fangs jutting out, the face of a moray eel, deadly poison. I lunged backwards into my attorney, who gripped my arm as he reached out to take the note. I'll handle this, he said to the moray woman. This man has a bad heart, but I have plenty of medicine. My name is Dr. Gonzo. Prepare our suite at once. We'll be in the bar. The woman shrugged as he led me away. In a town full of bedrock crazies, nobody even notices an acid freak. We struggled through the crowded lobby and found two stools at the bar. My attorney ordered two Cuba Libres with beer and mezcal on the side. Then he opened the envelope. Who's Lacerda, he asked. He's waiting for us in a room on the 12th floor. I couldn't remember. Lacerda? The name rang a bell, but I couldn't concentrate. Terrible things were happening all around us. Right next to me, a huge reptile was gnawing on a woman's neck. The carpet was a blood-soaked sponge. Impossible to walk on it. No footing at all. Order some golf shoes, I whispered. Otherwise, we'll never get out of this place alive. You notice these lizards don't have any trouble moving around in this muck. That's because they have claws on their feet. Lizards, he said. If you think we're in trouble now, wait till you see what's happening in the elevators. He took off his Brazilian sunglasses, and I could see he'd been crying. I just went upstairs to see this man Lacerda, he said. I told him we knew what he was up to. He says he's a photographer, but when I mentioned Savage Henry, well, that did it. He freaked. I could see it in his eyes. He knows we're on to him. Does he understand we have magnums, I said? No, but I told him we had a Vincent Black Shadow. That scared the piss out of him. Good, I said. But what about our room and the golf shoes? We're right in the middle of a fucking reptile zoo, and somebody's giving booze to these goddamn things. It won't be long before they tear us to shreds. Jesus, look at the floor. Have you ever seen so much blood? How many have they killed already? I pointed across the room to a group that seemed to be staring at us. Holy shit! Look at that bunch over there! They've spotted us! That's the press table, he said. That's where you have to sign in for your credentials. Shit, let's get it over with. You handle that, and I'll get the room. Backdoor beauty. And finally, a bit of serious drag racing on the strip. Sometime around midnight, my attorney wanted coffee. He had been vomiting fairly regularly as we drove around the strip, and the right flank of the whale was badly streaked. We were idling at a stoplight in front of the silver slipper beside a big blue Ford with Oklahoma plates. Two hoggish-looking couples in the car, probably cops from Muskogee using the drug conference to give their wives a look at Vegas. They looked like they'd just beaten Caesar's Palace for about $33 at the blackjack tables, and now they were headed for the circus circus to whoop it up. But suddenly, they found themselves next to a white Cadillac convertible, all covered with vomit and a 300-pound Samoan and a yellow fishnet t-shirt yelling at them. Hey there! You folks want to buy some heroin? No reply. No sign of recognition. They'd been warned about this kind of crap. Just ignore it. Hey, honkies, my attorney screamed. God damn it, I'm serious. I want to sell you some pure fucking smack. He was leaning out of the car very close to them, but still nobody answered. I glanced over very briefly and saw four middle American faces frozen with shock, staring straight ahead. We were in the middle lane. A quick left turn would be illegal. We would have to go straight ahead when the light changed, then escape at the next corner. I waited, tapping the accelerator nervously. My attorney was losing control. Cheap heroin, he was shouting. This is the real stuff. You won't get hooked. God damn it. I know what I have here. He whacked on the side of the car, as if to get their attention. 
but they wanted no part of us. You folks never talked to a vet before, said my attorney. I just got back from Vietnam. This is skag, folks, pure skag. Suddenly the light changed and the Ford bolted off like a rocket. I stomped on the accelerator and stayed right next to them for about 200 yards, watching for cops in the mirror while my attorney kept screaming at them, Shoot! Fuck! Skag! Blood! Heroin! Rape! Cheap! Communist! Jab it right into your fucking eyeballs! We were approaching the circus circus at high speed, and the Oklahoma car was veering left, trying to muscle into the turn lane. I stomped the whale into passing gear, and we ran fender to fender for a moment. He wasn't up to hitting me. There was horror in his eyes. The man in the back seat lost control of himself, lunging across his wife and snarling wildly, You dirty bastards! Pull over and I'll kill you! God damn you! You bastards! He seemed ready to leap out the window and into our car, crazy with rage. Luckily, the Ford was a two-door. He couldn't get out. We were coming up to the next stoplight, and the Ford was still trying to move left. We were both running full bore. I glanced over my shoulder and saw that we'd left the other traffic far behind. There was a big opening to the right. So I mashed on the brake, hurling my attorney against the dashboard, and in the instant the Ford surged ahead, I cut across his tail and zoomed into a side street. A sharp right turn across three lanes of traffic. But it worked. We left the Ford stalled in the middle of the intersection, hung in the middle of a screeching left turn. With a little luck, he'd be arrested for reckless driving. My attorney was laughing as we careened in low gear with the lights out through a dusty tangle of back streets behind the desert inn. Jesus Christ, he said. Those Okies were getting excited. That guy in the back seat was trying to bite me. Shit. He was frothing at the mouth. He nodded solemnly. I should have maced the fucker. A criminal, psychotic, total breakdown. You never know when they're likely to explode. I swung the whale into a turn that seemed to lead out of the maze. But instead of skidding, the bastard almost rolled. Holy shit, my attorney screamed. Turn on the fucking lights! He was clinging to the top of the windshield, and suddenly... He was doing the big spit again, leaning over the side. I refused to slow down until I was sure nobody was following us, especially that Oklahoma Ford. Those people were definitely dangerous, at least until they calmed down. Would they report that terrible quick encounter to the police? Probably not. It had happened too fast, with no witnesses, and the odds were pretty good that nobody would believe them anyway. The idea that two heroin pushers in a white Cadillac convertible would be dragging up and down the strip, abusing total strangers at stoplights, was prima facie absurd. Not even Sonny Liston ever got that far out of control. We made another turn and almost rolled again. The Coupe de Ville is not your ideal machine for high-speed cornering in residential neighborhoods. The handling is very mushy. Unlike the Red Shark which had responded very nicely to situations requiring the quick four-wheel drift. But the whale, instead of cutting loose at the critical moment, had a tendency to dig in, which accounted for that sickening here-we-go sensation. At first, I thought it was only because the tires were soft, so I took it into the Texaco station next to the Flamingo and had the tires pumped up to 50 pounds each which alarmed the attendant until I explained that these were experimental tires. But 50 pounds each didn't help the cornering, so I went back a few hours later and told him I wanted to try 75. He shook his head nervously. Not me, he said, handing me the air hose. Here, they're your tires, you do it. What's wrong, I asked. You think they can't take 75? He nodded, moving away as I stooped to deal with the left front. You're damn right, he said. Those tires want 28 in the front and 32 in the rear. Hell, 50's dangerous, but 75 is crazy. They'll explode. I shook my head and kept filling the left front. I told you, I said. Sandoz Laboratories designed these tires. They're special. I could load them up to 100. 
God Almighty, he groaned. Don't do that here. Not today, I replied. I want to see how they corner with 75. He chuckled. You won't even get to the corner, mister. We'll see, I said, moving around to the rear with the air hose. In truth, I was nervous. The two front ones were tighter than snare drums. They felt like teak wood when I tapped on them with the rod. But what the hell, I thought. If they explode, so what? It's not often that a man gets a chance to run terminal experiments on a virgin Cadillac and four brand new $80 tires. For all I knew, the thing might start cornering like a Lotus Elan. If not, all I had to do was call the VIP agency and have another one delivered. Maybe threaten them with a lawsuit because all four tires had exploded on me while driving in heavy traffic. Demand an Eldorado next time with four Michelin tens and put it all on the card. Charge it to the St. Louis Browns. As it turned out, the whale behaved very nicely with the altered tire pressures. The ride was a trifle rough. I could feel every pebble on the highway, like being on roller skates in a gravel pit. But the thing began cornering in a very stylish manner, very much like driving a motorcycle at top speed in a hard rain. One slip and zang! Over the high side, cartwheeling across the landscape with your head in your hands. About 30 minutes after our brush with the Okies, we pulled into an all-night diner on the Tonopah Highway, on the outskirts of a mean skag ghetto called North Las Vegas, which is actually outside the city limits of Vegas proper. North Vegas is where you go when you fucked up once too often on the Strip and when you're not even welcome in the cut-rate downtown places around Casino Center. This is Nevada's answer to East St. Louis, a slum and a graveyard, Last stop before permanent exile to Eli or Winnemucca. North Vegas is where you go if you're a hooker turning 40 and the syndicate men on the strip decide you're no longer much good for business out there with the high rollers. Or if you're a pimp with bad credit at the Sands. Or what they call in Vegas a hophead. This can mean almost anything from a mean drunk to a junkie. But in terms of commercial acceptability... It means you're finished in all the right places. The big hotels and casinos pay a lot of muscle to make sure the high rollers don't have even momentary hassles with undesirables. Security in a place like Caesar's Palace is super tense and strict. Probably a third of the people on the floor at any given time are either shills or watchdogs. Public drunks and known pickpockets are dealt with instantly hustled out to the parking lot by Secret Service-type thugs and given a quick, impersonal lecture about the cost of dental work and the difficulties of trying to make a living with two broken arms. The high side of Vegas is probably the most closed society west of Sicily, and it makes no difference in terms of the day-to-day -day lifestyle of the place whether the man at the top is Lucky Luciano or Howard Hughes. In an economy where Tom Jones can make $75,000 a week for two shows a night at Caesars, the palace guard is indispensable, and they don't care who signs their paychecks. A gold mine like Vegas breeds its own army, like any other gold mine. Hired muscle tends to accumulate in fast layers around the money power poles, and big money in Vegas is synonymous with the power to protect it. So, once you get blacklisted on the Strip, for any reason at all, you either get out of town or retire to nurse your act along on the cheap in the shoddy limbo of North Vegas. Out there with the gunsels, the hustlers, the drug cripples, and all the other losers. North Vegas, for instance, is where you go if you need to score smack before midnight with no references. But if you're looking for cocaine and you're ready up front with some bills and the proper code words, you want to stay on the strip and get next to a well-connected hooker, which will take at least one bill for starters. And so much for all that. We didn't fit the mold. There is no formula for finding yourself in Vegas with a white Cadillac full of drugs and nothing to mix with properly. The Fillmore style never quite caught on here. 
People like Sinatra and Dean Martin are still considered far out in Vegas. The underground newspaper here, the Las Vegas Free Press, is a cautious echo of the people's world, or maybe the National Guardian. A week in Vegas is like stumbling into a time warp, a regression to the late 50s, which is wholly understandable when you see the people who come here, the big spenders from places like Denver and Dallas, along with National Elks Club conventions, no niggers allowed, and the All-West Volunteers Sheep Herders Rally. These are people who go absolutely crazy at the sight of an old hooker stripping down to her pasties and prancing out on the runway to the big beat sound of a dozen 50-year-old junkies kicking out the jams on September song. It was sometime around three when we pulled into the parking lot of the North Vegas Diner. I was looking for a copy of the Los Angeles Times for news of the outside world, but a quick glance at the newspaper racks made a bad joke of that notion. They don't need the times in North Vegas. No news is good news. Fuck newspapers, said my attorney. What we need right now is coffee. I agreed, but I stole a copy of the Vegas Sun anyway. It was yesterday's edition, but I didn't care. The idea of entering a coffee shop without a newspaper in my hands made me nervous. There was always the sports section... Get wired on the baseball scores and pro football rumors. Bart Starr beaten by thugs in Chicago Tavern. Packers seek trade. Namath quits Jets to be governor of Alabama. And a speculative piece on page 46 about a rookie sensation named Harrison Fire out of Grambling. Runs the 109 flat, 344 pounds and still growing. This man fire has definite promise, says the coach. Yesterday, before practice, he destroyed a Greyhound bus with his bare hands. And last night, he killed a subway. He's a natural for color TV. I'm not one to play favorites, but it looks like we'll have to make room for him. Indeed. There's always room on TV for a man who can beat people to jelly in nine flats. But not many of these were gathered on this night in the North Star Coffee Lounge. We had the place to ourselves, which proved to be fortunate because we'd eaten two more pellets of mescaline on the way over, and the effects were beginning to manifest. My attorney was no longer vomiting or even acting sick. He ordered coffee with the authority of a man long accustomed to quick service. The waitress had the appearance of a very old hooker who had finally found her place in life. She was definitely in charge here, and she eyed us with obvious disapproval as we settled onto our stools. I wasn't paying much attention. The North Star Coffee Lounge seemed like a fairly safe haven from our storms. There are some you go into, in this line of work, that you know will be heavy. The details don't matter. All you know for sure is that your brain starts humming with brutal vibes as you approach the front door. Something wild and evil is about to happen, and it's going to involve you. But there was nothing in the atmosphere of the North Star to put me on my guard. The waitress was passively hostile, but I was accustomed to that. She was a big woman, not fat, but large in every way. Long, sinewy arms and a brawler's jawbone. A burned-out caricature of Jane Russell. Big head of dark hair face slashed with lipstick, and a 48 double E chest that was probably spectacular about 20 years ago when she might have been a mama for the Hells Angels chapter in Burdu. But now, she was strapped up in a giant pink elastic brassiere that showed like a bandage through the sweaty white rayon of her uniform. Probably she was married to somebody, but I didn't feel like speculating. All I wanted from her tonight was a cup of black coffee and a 29-cent hamburger with pickles and onions. No hassles, no talk. Just a place to rest and regroup. I wasn't even hungry. My attorney had no newspaper or anything else to compel his attention, so he focused out of boredom on the waitress. She was taking our orders like a robot when he punched through her crust with a demand for two glasses of ice water. With ice. My attorney drank his in one long gulp, then asked for another. I noticed that the waitress seemed tense. 
Fuck it, I thought. I was reading the funnies. About ten minutes later, when she brought the hamburgers, I saw my attorney hand her a napkin with something printed on it. He did it very casually, with no expression at all on his face. But I knew from the vibes that our peace was about to be shattered. What was that, I asked him. He shrugged, smiling vaguely at the waitress who was standing about ten feet away at the end of the counter, keeping her back to us while she pondered the napkin. Finally, she turned and stared. Then she stepped resolutely forward and tossed the napkin at my attorney. What is this? she snapped. A napkin, said my attorney. There was a moment of nasty silence. Then she began screaming. Don't give me that bullshit. I know what it means. You goddamn fat pimp bastard. My attorney picked up the napkin, looked at what he'd written then dropped it back on the counter. That's the name of a horse I used to own, he said calmly. What's wrong with you? You son of a bitch, she screamed. I take a lot of shit in this space, but I sure as hell don't have to take it off a spick pimp. Jesus, I thought. What's happening? I was watching the woman's hands, hoping she wouldn't pick up anything sharp or heavy. I picked up the napkin and read what the bastard had printed on it in careful red letters. Backdoor beauty? The question mark was emphasized. The woman was screaming again. Pay your bill and get the hell out. You want me to call the cops? I reached for my wallet, but my attorney was already on his feet, never taking his eyes off the woman. Then he reached under his shirt, not into his pocket, coming up suddenly with the Gerber Mini Magnum, a nasty silver blade which the waitress seemed to understand instantly. She froze, her eyes fixed about six feet down the aisle, and lifted the receiver off the hook of the payphone. He sliced it off, then brought the receiver back to his stool and sat down. The waitress didn't move. I was stupid with shock, not knowing whether to run or start laughing. How much is that lemon meringue pie, my attorney asked. His voice was casual as if he had just wandered into the place and was debating what to order. Thirty-five cents, the woman blurted. Her eyes were turgid with fear, but her brain was apparently functioning on some basic motor survival level. My attorney laughed. I mean the whole pie, he said. She moaned. My attorney put a bill on the counter. Let's say it's five dollars, he said. Okay. She nodded, still frozen, watching my attorney as he walked around the counter and got the pie out of the display case. I prepared to leave. The waitress was clearly in shock. The sight of the blade, jerked out in the heat of an argument, had apparently triggered bad memories. The glazed look in her eyes said her throat had been cut. She was still in the grip of paralysis when we left. Last Tango in Vegas. Fear and Loathing in the Near Room. From Rolling Stone, number 264, May 4th, 1978. Part 1. Muhammad Ali bites the bullet. Leon Spinks croaks a legend. Sting like a butterfly, float like a bee. Wild notes of a weird corner man. From Muhammad Ali, 1967. When I'm gone, boxing will be nothing again. The fans with the cigars and the hats turned down will be there, but no more housewives and little men in the street and foreign presidents. It's going to be back to the fighter who comes to town, smells a flower, visits a hospital, Blows a horn and says he's in shape. Old hat. I was the onlyest boxer in history people ask questions like a senator. Life had been good to Pat Patterson for so long that he'd almost forgotten what it was like to be anything but a free-riding, first-class passenger on a flight near the top of the world. It is a long, long way from the frost-bitten midnight streets around Chicago's Clark and Division to the deep rug hallways of the Park Lane Hotel on Central Park South in Manhattan. But Patterson had made that trip in high style, 
with stops along the way in London, Paris, Manila, Kinshasa, Kuala Lumpur, Tokyo, and almost everywhere else in the world on that circuit where the menus list no prices and you need at least three pairs of $100 sunglasses just to cope with the TV lights every time you touch down at an airport for another frenzied press conference and then a ticker tape parade along the route to the presidential palace and another princely reception. That is Muhammad Ali's world, an orbit so high a circuit so fast and strong and with rarefied air so thin that only the champ, the greatest, and a few close friends have unlimited breathing rights. Anybody who can sell his act for $5 million an hour all over the world is working a vein somewhere between magic and madness. And now, on this warm winter night in Manhattan, Pat Patterson was not entirely sure which way the balance was tipping. The main shock had come three weeks ago in Las Vegas, when he'd been forced to sit passively at ringside and watch the man whose life he would gladly have given his own to protect, under any other circumstances, take a savage and wholly unexpected beating in front of 5,000 screaming banshees at the Hilton Hotel and something like 60 million stunned spectators on national network TV. The champ was no longer the champ. A young brute named Leon Spinks had settled that matter, and not even Muhammad seemed to know just exactly what that awful defeat would mean, for himself or anyone else, not even for his new wife and children, or the handful of friends and advisors who'd been working that high white vein right beside him for so long that they acted and felt like his family. It was definitely an odd lot, ranging from solemn black Muslims like Herbert Muhammad, his manager, to shrewd white hipsters like Harold Conrad, his executive spokesman, and Irish Gene Kilroy, Ali's version of Hamilton Jordan, a sort of all-purpose administrative assistant, logistics manager, and chief troubleshooter. Kilroy and Conrad are the champ's answer to Ham and Jody. But mad dogs and wombats will roam the damp streets of Washington, babbling perfect Shakespearean English, before Jimmy Carter comes up with his version of Drew Bundini Brown, Ollie's alter ego and court wizard for so long now that he can't really remember being anything else. Carter's thin ice sense of humor would not support the weight of a zany friend like Bundini. It would not even support the far more discreet weight of a court jester like JFK's Dave Powers, whose role in the White House was much closer to Bundini Brown's deeply personal friendship with Ali than Jordan's essentially political and deceptively hard-nosed relationship with Jimmy. And even Hamilton seems to be gaining weight by geometric progressions these days, and the time may just about be right for him to have a chat with the Holy Ghost and come out as a born-again Christian. That might make the nut for a while, at least through the 1980 re-election campaign, but not even Jesus could save Jordan from a fate worse than any hell he'd ever imagined if Jimmy Carter woke up one morning and read in the Washington Post that Hamilton had pawned the great presidential seal for $500 in some fashionable Georgetown hawk shop. Eye for collateral. Indeed! And this twisted vision would seem almost too bent for print if Bundini hadn't already raised at least the raw possibility of it by once pawning Muhammad Ali's heavyweight champion of the world golden jewel-studded belt for $500. Just an overnight loan from a friend, he said later. But the word got out, and Bundini was banished from the family and the whole entourage for 18 months when the champ was told what he'd done. That heinous transgression is shrouded in a mix of jive shame and real black humor at this point. The champ, after all had once hurled his Olympic gold medal into the Ohio River in a fit of pique at some alleged racial insult in Louisville. And what was the difference between a gold medal and a jewel-studded belt? They were both symbols of a white devil's world that Ali, if not Bundini, was already learning to treat with a very calculated measure of public disrespect. What they shared, far beyond a very real friendship, was a shrewd kind of street theater sense of how far out on that limb they could go without crashing. 
Bundini has always had a finer sense than anyone else in the family about where the champ wanted to go, the shifting winds of his instincts, and he has never been worried about things like limits or consequences. That was the province of others like Conrad or Herbert. Drew B. has always known exactly which side he was on, and so has Cassius slash Muhammad. Bundini is the man who came up with float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. And ever since then, he has been as close to both Cassius Clay and Muhammad Ali as anyone else in the world. Pat Patterson, by contrast, was a virtual newcomer to the family. A 200-pound, 40-year-old black cop, he was a veteran of the Chicago Vice Squad before he hired on as Ali's personal bodyguard. And, despite the total devotion and relentless zeal he brought to his responsibility for protecting the champ at all times from any kind of danger, hassles, or even minor inconvenience, six years on the job had cost him to understand, however reluctantly, that there were at least a few people who could come and go as they pleased through the wall of absolute security he was supposed to maintain around the champ. Bundini and Conrad were two of these. They had been around for so long that they had once called the boss Cassius, or even Cash, while Patterson had never addressed him as anything but Muhammad, or Champ. He had come aboard at high tide, as it were, and even though he was now in charge of everything from carrying Ollie's money in a big roll of $100 bills to protecting his life with an ever-present chrome-plated revolver and the lethal fists and feet of a black belt with a license to kill, it had always galled him a bit to know that Muhammad's capricious instincts and occasionally perverse sense of humor made it certifiably impossible for any one bodyguard, or even four, to protect him from danger in public. His moods were too unpredictable. One minute, he would be in an almost catatonic funk, crouched in the back seat of a black Cadillac limousine with an overcoat over his head. And then, with no warning at all, he would suddenly be out of the car at a red light somewhere in the Bronx, playing stickball in the street with a gang of teenage junkies. Patterson had learned to deal with the champ's moods, but he also knew that in any crowd around the greatest, there would be at least a few who felt the same way about Ali as they had about Malcolm X or Martin Luther King. There was a time shortly after his conversion to the black Muslim religion in the mid-60s when Ali seemed to emerge as a main spokesman for what the Muslims were then perfecting as the state-of-the-art in racial paranoia, which seemed a bit heavy and not a little naive at the time, but which the white devils moved quickly to justify. Yes, but that is a very long story, and we will get to it later. The only point we need to deal with right now is that Muhammad Ali somehow emerged from one of the meanest and most shameful ordeals any prominent American has ever endured as one of the few real martyrs of that goddamn wretched war in Vietnam and a sort of instant folk hero all over the world, except in the USA. That would come later. The Sphinx disaster in Vegas had been a terrible shock to the family. They had all known it had to come sometime, but the scene had already been set, and the papers already signed for that sometime. A $16 million purse and a mind-boggling damn-the-cost television spectacle with Ali's old nemesis, Ken Norton, as the boogeyman, and one last King Hell payday for everybody. They were prepared in the back of their hearts for that one, but not for the cheap torpedo that blew their whole ship out of the water in Vegas for no payday at all. Leon Spinks crippled a whole industry in one hour on that fateful Wednesday evening in Las Vegas. The Muhammad Ali Industry which has churned out roughly $56 million in over 15 years and at least twice or three times that much for the people who kept the big engine running all this time. It would take Bill Walton 112 years on an annual NBA salary of $500,000 to equal that figure. From Angelo Dundee, Ollie's trainer. I knew it was too close for comfort. I told him to stop fooling around. He was giving up too many rounds. But I heard the decision and I thought, well, what are you going to do? That's it. I've prepared myself for this day for a long time. I conditioned myself for it. 
I was young with him, and now I feel old with him. Dundee was not the only person who was feeling old with Muhammad Ali on that cold Wednesday night in Las Vegas. Somewhere around the middle of the 15th round, a whole generation went over the hump as the last great prince of the 60s went out in a blizzard of pain, shock, and angry confusion so total that it was hard to even know how to feel, much less what to say, when the thing was finally over. The last shot came just at the final bell, when Crazy Leon whacked Ali with a savage overhand right that almost dropped the champ in his tracks and killed the last glimmer of hope for the patented miracle finish that Angelo Dundee knew was his fighter's only chance. As Muhammad wandered back to his corner about six feet in front of me, the deal had clearly gone down. The decision was anticlimactic. Leon Spinks, a 24-year-old brawler from St. Louis with only seven professional fights on his record, was the new heavyweight boxing champion of the world. And the roar of the pro Spinks crowd was the clearest message of all. That uppity nigger from Louisville had finally got what was coming to him. For 15 long years, he had mocked everything they all thought they stood for. Changing his name, dodging the draft, beating the best they could hurl at him. But now, thank God, they were seeing him finally go down. Six presidents have lived in the White House in the time of Muhammad Ali. Dwight Eisenhower was still wrapping golf balls around the Oval Office when Cassius Clay Jr. won a gold medal for the U.S. as a light heavyweight in the 1960 Olympics and then turned pro and won his first fight for money against a journeyman heavyweight named Tunney Hunsaker in Louisville on October 29th of that same year. Less than four years later and almost three months to the day after John Fitzgerald Kennedy was murdered in Dallas, Cassius Clay... The Louisville Lip, by then, made a permanent enemy of every boxing expert in the Western world by beating world heavyweight champion Sonny Liston, the meanest of the mean, so badly that Liston refused to come out of his corner for the seventh round. That was 14 years ago. Jesus! And it seems like 14 months! Why? Brain damage. The Real Story, A Memo with Nails in Both Nostrils, by Raul Duke, Sports Editor. This story is badly bogged down, and I think I know the reason. Dr. Thompson has been on it so long, in the belly of the beast, as it were, that he has lost all functional contact with his sense of humor. And where I come from, they call that condition insanity. But there are a lot of high-powered fools where I come from, and it's been about 15 years since I took any one of them seriously. And in fact, it was Thompson himself who originally made that connection between humor and sanity, which changes nothing, because we come from the same place, from the elm-shaded, white-frame highlands of Louisville, Kentucky, about halfway between the Cassius Clay residence down on South 4th Street and the homes of the men who originally launched Cassius Clay Jr. on his long, wild ride on the great roller coaster of professional boxing and paraprofessional show business. They lived out in Indian Hills or on Mockingbird Valley Road near the Louisville Country Club, and they owned every bank in the city, along with both newspapers, all the radio stations that white folks took seriously, and at least half the major distilleries and tobacco companies that funded the municipal tax base. They knew a good thing when they saw one, and in the year of our Lord 1960, the good thing they saw was an 18-year-old local Negro boxer, a big, fast, and impressively intelligent young light heavyweight named Cassius Clay Jr., who had just won a gold medal for the USA in the 1960 Olympics. So... Ten of these gents got together and made the boy an offer he couldn't refuse. They were willing to take a long risk on him, they said, just as soon as he gained a few pounds and decided to fight professionally as the new morning star among heavyweights. They would finance his move for the title in a division that Floyd Patterson and his crafty manager Custom Otto had dominated for so long by means of a new gimmick known as closed-circuit TV, 
that a whole generation of what might have been promising young heavyweight challengers had died on the vine while they waited in line for a chance to fight Patterson, who didn't really want to fight anybody. Floyd was the champ, and he used that fact as leverage, as Richard Nixon would later learn to retreat behind the odious truth that, I am, you know, the president. Indeed! And they were both right for a while. But bad karma tends to generate its own kind of poison, which, like typhoid chickens and rotten bread cast out on the waters, will usually come home to either roost, fester, or mutate very close to its own point of origin. Richard Nixon abused karma, chickens, and even bread for so long that they all came home at once and totally destroyed him. And Floyd Patterson's neurotic, anal compulsive reluctance to get in the ring with anything at all with two arms and legs under 30 was what eventually created the vacuum that hatched Sonny Liston, an aging ex-con who twice turned poor Floyd to jelly just by climbing into the ring. Hot damn! We may be approaching a heinous new record for mixed metaphors in this thing. The rats have swarmed into the belfry, and anything sane that survives will be hurled out to sea and stomped down like a dwarf in a shit rain. Why not? It was never my intention to make any real sense in this memo. The sports desk has never loved logic, mainly because there is no money in it, and pro sports without money is like a Vincent Black shadow with no gas. Dumb greed is the backbone of all sports, except maybe college wrestling, which may or may not be a good and healthy thing for some people in places like Kansas and Idaho, but not here. Those naughty little monsters can write their own stories and toss them in over the transom. If we have enough room or maybe a bad check for a half-page ad from the Shotgun News or the Billy Beer people... That's when we'll focus the whole twisted energy of the sports desk on a college wrestling feature. Utah champ Drogo pins three-armed cowboy for West Slope title in nine-hour classic. How's that for a stylish headline? Well, shucks. Let's try it again from the other side of the fence. Crippled cowboy challenger falls short in mat finals. Angry fans maul ref as match ends. Huge Drogo gains split win. Jesus! I could get a job writing sports heads for the Daily News with that kind of feel for the word count. Right? With a big salary, too. In the core of the Big Apple. But that is not what we had in mind here. Is it? No. We were talking of sport and big money. Which gets us back to pro boxing, the most shameless racket of all. It is more a spectacle than a sport, one of the purest forms of atavistic endeavor still extant in a world that only big-time politicians feel a need to call civilized. Nobody who has ever sat in a front row ringside seat less than six feet just below and away from the sickening thumps and cracks and groans of two desperate, adrenaline-crazed giants who are whipping and pounding each other like two pit bulls in a death battle will ever forget what it felt like to be there. No TV camera or any other kind will ever convey the almost four-dimensional reality of total frenzied violence of seeing, hearing, and almost feeling the sudden whack of Leon Spinks's thinly padded fist against Muhammad Ali's cheekbones so close in front of your own face that it is hard to keep from flinching and trying to duck backward, while a whole row of $200 a seat ringsiders right behind you are leaping and stomping and howling for more showers of flying sweat to fall down on them, more droplets of human blood to rain down on the sleeves and tailored shoulders of their tan cashmere sport coats. And then, with Leon still pounding and the sweat and blood still flying, some fist-flailing geek screaming over your shoulder loses his balance and cracks you between the shoulder blades with a shot that sends you reeling into a cop hanging onto the ring apron, who reacts with a vicious elbow to your chest, and the next thing you see is shoes bouncing inches in front of your face on a concrete floor. The horror! The horror! Exterminate all the brutes! Mr. Kurtz said that, but the smart money called him a joker. Ho-ho! 
Good old Kurtz. That Prussian sense of humor will zing you every time. I said that. We were sitting in a sauna at the health spa in the Las Vegas Hilton. Me and my friend Bob Arum, the sinister promoter. When all of a sudden the redwood door swung open and in comes Leon Spinks. Hi there, Leon, said Aram. Leon grinned and tossed his towel across the room at the stove full of hot rocks. What's happening, Jew boy, he replied. I heard you was too stoned to be fooling around down here with us health freaks. Aram turned beet red and moved off toward the corner. Leon laughed again and reached for his teeth. These damn things get hot, he snarled. Who needs these goddamn teeth anyway? He turned to laugh at Aram again, and right then I saw my chance. I stood up in a sort of linebacker's crouch and hooked him hard in the ribs. He fell back on the hot rocks, and I hooked him again. Oh, my God, Aram shrieked. I heard something break. Leon looked up from where he was sitting on the duckboard floor, his face warped with pain. Well, he said slowly, now we know you ain't deaf, Bob. He was leaning back on both hands, wincing with every breath as he slowly raised his eyes to glare at me. Real smart friends you got, Aram, he whispered, but this one's mine now. He winced again, every breath was painful, and he spoke very slowly. Call my brother Michael, he said to Aram. Tell him to fix a hook on this honky bastard's head and hang him up alongside the big bag for when I get well. Aram was kneeling beside him now, gently probing his ribcage, and it was just about then that I felt myself waking up. But instead of lying down in a bed, I suddenly realized that something ugly had happened. My first thought was that I'd passed out from the heat of the sauna. Indeed, a quick trip to the near room and some dim memory of violence, but only as part of a dream. Or, well, maybe not. As my head began to clear, and Aram's face came into focus, his beady eyes, his trembling hands, the sweat squirting out of his pores, I realized that I was not lying down or coming out of a faint but standing naked in the middle of a hot wooden cell and staring down like a zombie at ye gods. It was Leon Spinks. And Bob Aram, his eyes bulged out like a frog's, was massaging Leon's chest. I stared for a moment, then recoiled with shock. No, I thought, this can't be happening. But it was. I was wide awake now and I knew this hideous thing was actually happening right in front of my eyes. Aram was moaning and trembling while his hands stroked the challenger's chest. Leon was leaning back with his eyes closed, his teeth clenched, and his whole body stiff as a corpse. Neither one of them seemed to notice my recovery, from what was later diagnosed by the nervous hotel doctor as nothing more than a mild acid flashback. But I didn't learn that, until later. High risk on the low road. New boy on Queer Street. Five million dollars an hour. Five miles to the Terminal Hotel. The Devil and Pat Patterson. No nigger ever called me hippie. From George Plimpton. Shadow Box. The Near Room. When he got in trouble in the ring, Ali imagined a door swung open and inside he could see neon, orange, and green lights blinking and bats blowing trumpets and alligators playing trombones, and he could hear snakes screaming. Weird masks and actors' clothes hung on the wall, and if he stepped across the sill and reached for them, he knew that he was committing himself to destruction. It was almost midnight when Pat Patterson got off the elevator and headed down the corridor toward 905, his room right next door to the champs. They had flown in from Chicago a few hours earlier, and Muhammad had said he was tired and felt like sleeping. No midnight strolls down the block to the Plaza Fountain, he promised, 
no wandering around the hotel or causing a scene in the lobby. Beautiful, thought Patterson. No worries tonight. With Muhammad in bed and Veronica there to watch over him, Pat felt things were under control, and he might even have time for a bit of refreshment downstairs and then get a decent night's sleep for himself. The only conceivable problem was the volatile presence of Bundini and a friend who had dropped by around ten for a chat with the champ about his run for the Triple Crown. The family had been in a state of collective shock for two weeks or so after Vegas, but now it was the first week in March, and they were eager to get the big engine cranked up for the return bout with Spinks in September. No contracts had been signed yet, and every sports writer in New York seemed to be on the take from either Ken Norton or Don King, or both. But none of that mattered, said Ali, because he and Leon had already agreed on the rematch, and by the end of this year, he would be the first man in history to win the heavyweight championship of the world three times. Patterson had left them whooping and laughing at each other, but only after securing a promise from Hal Conrad that he and Bundini leave early and let the champ sleep. They were scheduled to tape a show with Dick Cavett the next day, then drive for three or four hours up into the mountains of eastern Pennsylvania to Ollie's custom-built training camp at Deer Lake. Kilroy was getting the place ready for what Patterson and all the rest of the family understood was going to be some very serious use. Ollie had announced almost immediately after losing to Spinks in Vegas, any talk of his retiring from the ring was nonsense, and that soon he'd begin training for his rematch with Leon. So the fat was in the fire. A second loss to Spinks would be even worse than the first, and the end of the line for Ali, the family, and in fact the whole Ali industry. No more paydays, no more limousines, no more sweets and crab cocktails from room service and the world's most expensive hotels. For Pat Patterson and a lot of other people, another defeat by Spinks would mean the end of a whole way of life. And worse yet, the first wave of public reaction to Ali's comeback announcement had been anything but reassuring. An otherwise sympathetic story in the Los Angeles Times described the almost universal reaction of the sporting press. There were smiles and a shaking of hands all around when the 36-year-old ex-champion said after the fight last Wednesday night, I'll be back. I'll be the first man to win the heavyweight title three times. But no one laughed out loud. A touch of this doomsday thinking had even showed up in the family. Dr. Ferdy Pacheco, who had been in the champ's corner for every fight since he first won the title from Liston, except the last one, had gone on the Tom Snyder show and said that Muhammad was finished as a fighter, that he was a shadow of his former self, and that he, Pacheco, had done everything but beg Ali to retire even before the Spinks fight. Pacheco had already been expelled from the family for his heresy, but it had planted a seed of doubt that was hard to ignore. The Doc was no quack, and he was also a personal friend. Did he know something the others didn't? Wasn't it even possible that the champ was washed up? There was no way to think that by looking at him or listening to him either. He looked sharp, talked sharp, and there was a calmness, a kind of muted intensity in his confidence, that made it sound almost understated. Pat Patterson believed, or if he didn't, there was no way that even the champ could guess it. The loyalty of those close to Muhammad Ali is so profound that it sometimes clouds their own vision, but Leon Spinks had swept those clouds away, and now it was time to get serious. No more show business. No more clowning. Now, they had come to the crunch. Pat Patterson had tried not to brood on these things, but every newspaper rack he'd come close to in Chicago, New York, or anywhere else seemed to echo the baying of hounds on a blood scent. Every media voice in the country was poised for ultimate revenge on this uppity nigger who had laughed in their faces for so long that a whole generation of sports writers had grown up in the shadow of a mocking, dancing presence that most of them had never half understood until now when it seemed almost gone. Even the rematch with Spinks, 
was bogged down in the arcane politics of big money boxing. And Pat Patterson, like all the others who had geared their lives to the fortunes of Muhammad Ali, understood that the rematch would have to be soon. Very soon. And the champ would have to be ready this time, as he had not been ready in Vegas. There was no avoiding the memory of Sonny Liston's grim fate after losing again to Ali in a fight that convinced even the experts. But Muhammad Ali was no Liston. There was magic in his head, as well as his fists and his feet. But time was not on his side this time, and the only thing more important than slashing the Gordian knot of boxing industry politics that was already menacing the reality of a quick rematch with Spinks was the absolute necessity of making sure that the champ would take this next fight as seriously as it was clearly going to be. A whole industry would be up for grabs, not to mention the fate of the family and the bizarre scenes of chaos and wild scrambling for position that had followed Spinks's first shocking upset would not be repeated if Ali lost the rematch. Nobody was ready for Spinks's stunning victory in Vegas, but every power freak and leverage monger with any real-life connection to boxing would be ready to go either way on this next one. There would be no more of this low-rent political bullshit about recognition by the World Boxing Council— WBC, or the World Boxing Association, WBA, if Ali lost the rematch with Leon. And no more big money fights for Muhammad Ali, either. They would all be pushed over the brink that was already just a few steps in front of them. And no comeback would be likely, or even possible. These things were among the dark shadows that Pat Patterson would rather not have been thinking about on that night in Manhattan as he walked down the corridor to his room in the Park Lane Hotel. The champ had already convinced him that he would indeed be the first man in history to win the first triple crown in the history of heavyweight boxing. And Pat Patterson was far from alone in his conviction that Leon Spinks would be easy prey next time for a Muhammad Ali in top condition both mentally and physically. Spinks was vulnerable. The same crazy mean style that made him dangerous also made him easy to hit. His hands were surprisingly fast, but his feet were as slow as Joe Frazier's, and it was only the crafty coaching of his trainer, the ancient Sam Solomon, that had given him the early five-round edge in Las Vegas that Ali had refused to understand until he was so far behind that his only hope was a blazing last-minute assault and a knockout or at least a few knockdowns that he was too tired, in the end, to deliver. Leon was dead on his feet in that savage 15th round, but so was Muhammad Ali. And that's why Spinks won the fight. Yes, but that is no special secret, and there will be plenty of time to deal with those questions of ego and strategy later on in this saga, if in fact we ever get there. The sun is up, the peacocks are screaming with lust, and this story is so far off the game plan that no hope of salvage exists at this time. Or at least nothing less than a sweeping all-points injunction by Judge Crater, who maintains an unlisted number so private that not even Bob Arum can reach him on short notice. So we are left with the unhurried vision of Pat Patterson finally reaching the door of his room, number 905 in the Park Lane Hotel in Manhattan, and just as he pulls the room key out of his pocket on the way to a good night's sleep, his body goes suddenly stiff as he picks up the sound of raucous laughter and strange voices in room number 904. Weird sounds from the champ's suite. Impossible! But Pat Patterson knows he's stone sober and nowhere near death. So he drops his key back in his pocket and moves one step down the hallway, listening carefully now to these sounds he hopes are not really there. Hallucinations. Bad nerves. Almost anything but the sound of a totally unknown voice and the voice of a white devil, no doubt about that, from the room where Ali and Veronica are supposed to be sleeping peacefully. Bundini and Conrad had both promised to be gone at least an hour ago. But no, not this. Not Bundini and Conrad and the voice of some stranger, too. Along with the unmistakable sound of laughter from both the champ and his wife. Not now, just when things were getting close to intolerably serious. What was the meaning? 
Pat Patterson knew what he had to do. He planted both feet in the rug in front of 904 and knocked. Whatever was going on would have to be cut short at once, and it was his job to do the cutting, even if he had to get rude with Bundini and Conrad. Well, this next scene is so strange that not even the people who were part of it can recount exactly what happened. But it went more or less like this. Bundini and I had just emerged from a strategy conference in the bathroom when we heard the sudden sound of knocking on the door. Bundini waved us all into silence as Conrad slouched nervously against the wall below the big window that looked out on the snow-covered wasteland of Central Park. Veronica was sitting fully clothed on the king-size bed, right next to Ali, who was stretched out and relaxed with the covers pulled up to his waist, wearing nothing at all except... Well, let's take it again from Pat Patterson's view from the doorway, when Bundini answered his knock. The first thing he saw when the door opened was a white stranger with a can of beer in one hand and a lit cigarette in the other, sitting cross-legged on the bureau that faced the champ's bed. A bad omen for sure, and a thing to be dealt with at once at this ominous point in time. But the next thing Pat Patterson saw turned his face into spastic wax, and caused his body to leap straight back toward the doorway like he'd just been struck by lightning. His professional bodyguard's eyes had fixed on me just long enough to be sure I was passive, and with both hands harmlessly occupied for at least a few seconds it would take him to sweep the rest of the room and see what was wrong with his five million dollars an hour responsibility. And I could tell by the way he moved into the room and the look on his face that I was suddenly back at that point where any movement at all, or even the blink of an eye, could change my life forever. But I also knew it was coming, and I recall a split second of real fear as Pat Patterson's drop-forged glance swept past me and over to the bed to Veronica and the inert lump that lay under the sheets right beside her. For an instant that frightened us all, the room was electric with absolute silence. And then the bed seemed to literally explode as the sheets flew away and a huge body with the hairy red face of the devil himself leaped up like some jack-in-the-box out of hell and uttered a wild cry that jolted us all and sent such an obvious shock through Pat Patterson that he leaped backward and shot out both elbows like Kareem coming down with a rebound. Last Tango in Vegas. Fear and Loathing in the Far Room. From Rolling Stone, number 265, May 18th, 1978. Part 2. Wild ravings of an autograph hound. A threat of public madness. The pantyhose press conference. I waited until I was sure the Muhammad Ali party was well off the plane and up the ramp before I finally stood and moved up the aisle fixing the stewardess at the door with a blind stare from behind two mirror lenses so dark that I could barely see to walk, but not so dark that I failed to notice a touch of mockery in her smile as I nodded and stepped past her. Goodbye, sir, she chirped. I hope you got an interesting story. You nasty little bitch! I hope your next flight crashes in a cannibal country. But I kept this thought to myself as I laughed bitterly, and stomped up the empty tunnel to a bank of payphones in the concourse. It was New York's LaGuardia Airport, around 8.30 on a warm Sunday night in the first week of March, and I had just flown in from Chicago, supposedly with the Muhammad Ali party. But things had not worked out that way, and my temper was hovering dangerously on the far edge of control as I listened to the sound of nobody answering the phone in Hal Conrad's West Side apartment. That swine! That treacherous lying bastard. We were almost to the ten ring limit, that point where I knew I'd start pounding on things unless I hung up quickly before we got to eleven, when suddenly a voice sounding almost as angry as I felt came booming over the line. Yeah, yeah, what is it? Conrad snapped. I'm in a hell of a hurry. Jesus, I was just about into the elevator when I had to come back and answer this goddamn... You crazy bastard, I screamed cutting into his gravelly mumbling as I slammed my hand down on the tin counter and saw a woman using the phone next to me jump like a rat had just run up her leg. 
It's me, Harold, I shouted. I'm out here at LaGuardia and my whole story's fucked. And just as soon as I find all my baggage, I'm going to get a cab and track you down and slit your goddamn throat. Wait a minute, he said. What the hell is wrong? Where's Ali? Not with you? Are you kidding, I snarled. That crazy bastard didn't even know who I was when I met him in Chicago. I made a goddamn fool of myself, Harold. He looked at me like I was some kind of autograph hound. No, said Conrad. I told him all about you, that you were a good friend of mine and you'd be on the flight with him from Chicago. He was expecting you. Bullshit, I yelled. You told me he'd be traveling alone, too. So I stayed up all night and busted my ass to get a first-class seat on that continental flight that I knew he'd be catching at O'Hare. Then I got everything arranged with the flight crew between Denver and Chicago, making sure they blocked off the first two seats so we could sit together. Jesus, Harold, I muttered, suddenly feeling very tired. What kind of sick instinct would cause you to do a thing like this to me? Where the hell is Ali? Conrad shouted, ignoring my question. I sent a car out to pick you up. Both of you. You mean all of us, I said. His wife was with him along with Pat Patterson and maybe a few others. I couldn't tell. But it wouldn't have made any difference. They all looked at me like I was weird. Some kind of psycho trying to muscle into the act, babbling about sitting in Veronica's seat. That's impossible, Conrad snapped. He knew. Well, I guess he forgot, I shouted, feeling my temper roving out on the edge again. Are we talking about brain damage, Harold? Are you saying he has no memory? He hesitated just long enough to let me smile for the first time all day. This could be an ugly story, Harold, I said. Ollie is so punch drunk that his memory's all scrambled. Maybe they should lift his license, eh? Yeah, let's croak all this talk about comebacks, Dumbo. Your memory's fucked. You're on Queer Street. And by the way, champ, what are your job prospects? You son of a bitch, Conrad muttered. Okay, to hell with all this bullshit. Just get a cab and meet us at the plaza. I should have been there a half hour ago. I thought you had us all booked into the park lane, I said. Get moving and don't worry about it, he croaked. I'll meet you at the plaza. Don't waste any time. What? I screamed. What am I doing right now? I have a Friday deadline, Harold, and this is Sunday. You call me in the middle of the goddamn night in Colorado and tell me to get on the first plane to Chicago because Muhammad Ali has all of a sudden decided he wants to talk to me after all that lame bullshit in Vegas. So I take the insane risk of dumping my whole story in a parachute bag and flying off on a 2,000-mile freakout right in the middle of a deadline crunch to meet a man in Chicago who treats me like a wino when I finally get there. And now you're talking to me, you pig fucker, about wasting time? I was raving at the top of my lungs now, drawing stares from every direction, so I tried to calm down. No need to get busted for public madness in the airport, I thought. But I was also in New York with no story and no place to work and only five days away from a clearly impossible deadline. And now, Conrad was telling me that my long overdue talk with Ali had once again gone wrong. Just get in a cab and meet me at the plaza, he was saying. I'll pull this mess together, don't worry. Well, I said, I'm already here in New York, and I definitely want to see you, Harold. So yeah, I'll be there, but... I paused a moment, fascinated by a scene that was suddenly running very vividly behind my eyeballs as I stood there at the payphone in the concourse. Let me tell you what I'm going to do at noon tomorrow if you don't pull this mess together. Not now, he said. I have to get going. Listen, I yelled. I want you to understand this, Harold, because it could do serious things to your image. Silence. What I plan to do when I wake up in the plaza at exactly 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, I said calmly, is have a few Bloody Marys and then go down to the hotel drugstore and buy some of those sheer pantyhose, along with a black wig and some shades like yours, Harold. 
Then I'll go back up to my room and call the Daily News to say they should have a photographer at the Plaza Fountain exactly at noon for a press conference with Ali and Bob Arum. And yes, that my name is Hal Conrad, the well-known boxing wizard and executive spokesman for Muhammad Ali. And then, Harold, I continued, exactly at noon I will leave my room in the plaza wearing nothing but a pair of sheer pantyhose and a wig and black shades, and I will take the elevator down to the lobby and stroll very casually outside and across the street and climb into the plaza fountain, waving a bottle of Fernet Branca in one hand and a joint in the other. And I'll be screaming, Harold, at anybody who gets in my way or even stops to stare. Bullshit, he snapped. You'll get yourself locked up. No, I said. I'll get you locked up. When they grab me, I'll say I'm Hal Conrad. And all I wanted to do was get things organized for the upcoming Ali Aram press conference. And then you'll have a new picture for your scrapbook. A front page shot in the news of famous boxing wizard Harold Conrad. I suddenly saw the whole scene in that movie behind my eyes. I would intimidate anybody in the elevator by raving and screeching at them about things like the broken spirit and fixers who steal clothes from the poor. That, followed by an outburst of deranged weeping, would get me down to the lobby where I would quickly get a grip and start introducing myself to everybody within reach and inviting them all to the press conference in the fountain. And then, when I finally climbed into the water and took a real stance for the noon lunch crowd, I could hear myself screeching, Cast out vanity! Look at me! I'm not vain! My name is Hal Conrad, and I feel wonderful! I'm proud to wear pantyhose in the streets of New York, and so is Muhammad Ali! Yes! He'll be here in just a few moments, and he'll be dressed just like me. And Bob Arum, too, I would shriek. He's not ashamed to wear pantyhose. The crowd would not be comfortable with this gig. There was not much doubt about that. A naked man in the streets is one thing, but the sight of the recently dethroned heavyweight champion of the world parading around in the fountain wearing nothing but sheer pantyhose was too weird to tolerate. Boxing was bad enough as it was, and wrestling was worse. But not even a mob of New Yorkers could handle such a nasty spectacle as this. They would be ripping up the paving stones by the time the police arrived. Stop threatening me, you drunken freak, Conrad shouted. Just get in a cab and meet me at the plaza. I'll have everything under control by the time you get there. We'll go up to his room and talk there. I shrugged and hung up the phone. Why not, I thought. It was too late to catch a turnaround flight back to Colorado, so I might as well check into the plaza and get rid of another credit card along with another friend. Conrad was trying. I knew that. But I also knew that this time he was grasping at straws because we both understood the deep and deceptively narrow-looking moat that 18 years of celebrity forced Ali to dig between his public and his private personas. It is more like a ring of moats than just one, and Ali has learned the subtler art of making each one seem like the last great leap between the intruder and himself. But there is always one more moat to get across, and not many curious strangers have ever made it that far. Some people will settle happily for a smile and joke in a hotel lobby, and others will insist on crossing two or even three of his moats before they feel comfortably private with the champ. But very few people understand how many rings there really are. My own quick guess would be nine, but Ali's quick mind and his instinct for public relations can easily make the third moat seem like the ninth. And this world is full of sporting journalists who never realized where they were until the same private thoughts and spontaneous bits of eloquence they had worked so desperately to glean from the champ in some rare flash of personal communication that none other would ever share appeared word for word in cold black type under somebody else's byline. This is not a man who needs hired pros and wizards to speak for him, but he has learned how to use them so skillfully 
that he can save himself for the rare moments of confrontation that interest him, which are few and far between, but anybody who has ever met Muhammad Ali on that level will never forget it. He has a very lonely sense of humor and a sense of himself so firmly entrenched that it seems to hover at times in that nervous limbo between egomania and genuine invulnerability. There is not much difference in his mind between a challenge inside the ring with Joe Frazier or in a TV studio with Dick Cavett. He honestly believes he can handle it all, and he has almost two decades of evidence to back him up at this point, so it takes a rare sense of challenge to get him cranked up. He had coped with everything from the white heavies of Louisville to Sonny Liston and the war in Vietnam. From the hostility of old white draft boards to the sullen enigma of the black Muslims. From the genuine menace of Joe Frazier to the puzzling threat of Ken Norton. And he has beaten every person or thing that God or even Allah ever put in his way, except perhaps Joe Frazier and the eternal mystery of women. And now... As my cab moved jerkily through the snow-black streets of Brooklyn toward the Plaza Hotel, I was brooding on Conrad's deranged plot that I felt would almost certainly cause me another nightmare of professional grief and personal humiliation. I felt like a rape victim on the way to a discussion with the rapist on the Johnny Carson show. Not even Hal Conrad's fine sense of reality could take me past moat number five, which would not be enough, because I'd made it clear from the start that I was not especially interested in anything short of at least number seven or number eight. Which struck me as far enough, for my purposes, because I understood number nine well enough to know that if Muhammad Ali was as smart as I thought he was, I would never see or even smell that last moat. Wilfred Sheed an elegant writer who wrote a whole book titled Muhammad Ali without ever crossing the sixth or seventh moat, much less the ninth, has described that misty battlefield far better than I can. But he was paid a lot better, too, which tends to bring a certain balance to situations that would otherwise be intolerable. In any case, here is Sheed recounting the agonies of merely trying to talk to the subject of his $20 per copy book. Ali moves so fast that he even outruns his own people, and no one seems to know for sure where he is. I am about to head for his training camp in the Poconos one more time when word arrives that he has broken camp for good. What? Where? Rumors of his comings and goings suddenly rival Patty Hearst's. His promoters say he's in Cleveland, and the Times says he's in New York, sparring at the Felt Forum but he hasn't been seen at either place. It is a game he plays with the world, dancing out of range, then suddenly sticking out his face and pulling it back again. Meanwhile, his elusiveness is abetted by one of the cagiest inner circles since Cardinal Richelieu. Anyone can see him publicly. I think it is his secret wish to be seen by every man, woman, and child on the planet Earth. But to see him privately is harder than getting a visa from the Chinese embassy. Well, I have beat on both those doors in my time, meeting with failure and frustration on both fronts. But I have a feeling that she never properly understood the importance of speaking Chinese, or at least having the right interpreter. And not many of these are attached to either Muhammad Ali or the Chinese embassy. But in Ali's case... I did, after all, have my old buddy Hal Conrad, whose delicate function as Muhammad Ali's not-quite-official interpreter with the world of white media, I was just beginning to understand. I have known Conrad since 1962, when I met him in Las Vegas at the second Liston-Patterson fight. He was handling the press and publicity for that cruel oddity, and I was the youngest and most ignorant sports writer ever accredited to cover a heavyweight championship fight. But Conrad, who had total control of all access to everything, went out of his way to overlook my nervous ignorance and my total lack of expense money, including me along with all big names for things like press parties, interviews with the fighters, and above all, the awesome spectacle of Sonny Liston working out on the big bag to the tune of Night Train. 
at his crowded and carpeted base camp in the Thunderbird Hotel. As the song moved louder and heavier toward a climax of big band rock and roll frenzy, Liston would step into the 200-pound bag and hook it straight up in the air, where it would hang for one long and terrifying instant, before it fell back into place at the end of a one-inch logging chain with a vicious clang and a jerk that would shake the whole room. I watched Sonny work out on that bag every afternoon for a week or so, or at least long enough to think he had to be at least nine feet tall, until one evening a day or so prior to the fight when I literally bumped into Liston and his two huge bodyguards at the door of the Thunderbird Casino, and I didn't even recognize the champ for a moment because he was only about six feet tall and with nothing but the dull, fixed stare in his eyes to make him seem different from all the other rich, mean niggers a man could bump into around the Thunderbird that week. So now, on this jangled Sunday night in New York, more than 15 years and 55,000 olive drab tombstones from Maine to California since I first realized that Sonny Liston was three inches shorter than me. It was all coming together, or maybe coming apart once again, as my cab approached the plaza and another wholly unpredictable but probably doomed and dumb encounter with the world of big-time boxing. I'd stopped for a six-pack of Ballantine Ale on the way in from the airport, and I also had a quart of old Fitzgerald that I'd brought with me from home. My mood was ugly and cynical, tailored very carefully on the long drive through Brooklyn to match my lack of expectations with regard to anything Conrad might have tried to set up with Ali. A quote from Muhammad Ali. My way of joking is to tell the truth. That's the funniest joke in the world. Indeed. And that is also as fine a definition of gonzo journalism as anything I've ever heard, for good or ill. But I was in no mood for joking when my cab pulled up to the plaza that night. I was half drunk, fully cranked, and pissed off at everything that moved. My only real plan was to get past this ordeal that Conrad was supposedly organizing with Ali then retire in shame to my $88 a night bed and deal with Conrad tomorrow. But this world does not work on real plans, mine or anyone else's. So I was not especially surprised when a total stranger wearing a serious black overcoat laid a hand on my shoulder as I was having my bags carried into the plaza. Dr. Thompson, he said. What? I spun away and glared at him just long enough to know there was no point in denying it. He had the look of a rich undertaker who had once been the light heavyweight karate champion of the Italian Navy. A very quiet presence that was far too heavy for a cop. He was on my side. And he seemed to understand my bad, nervous condition. Before I could ask anything, he was already picking up my bags and saying, with a smile as uncomfortable as my own, we're going to the park lane. Mr. Conrad is waiting for you. I shrugged and followed him outside to the long black limo that was parked with the engine running so close to the front door of the plaza that it was almost up on the sidewalk. And about three minutes later, I was face to face with Hal Conrad in the lobby of the Park Lane Hotel, more baffled than ever and not even allowed enough time to sign in and get my luggage up to the room. What took you so goddamn long? I was masturbating in the limo, I said. We took a spin out around Sheep's Head Bay, and I... Sober up, he snapped. Ollie's been waiting for you since ten o'clock. Balls, I said, as the door opened and he aimed me down the hall. I'm tired of your bullshit, Harold. And where the hell is my luggage? Fuck your luggage, he replied as we stepped in front of 904, and he knocked, saying, Open up. It's me. The door swung open, and there was Bundini, with a dilated grin on his face, reaching out to shake hands. Welcome, he said. Come right in, Doc. Make yourself at home. I was still shaking hands with Bundini when I realized where I was, standing at the foot of a king-sized bed where Muhammad Ali was laid back with the covers pulled up to his waist and his wife, Veronica, sitting next to him.
They were both eyeing me with very different expressions than I'd seen on their faces in Chicago. Muhammad leaned up to shake hands, grinning first at me and then at Conrad. Is this him, he asked. You sure he's safe? Bundini and Conrad were laughing as I tried to hide my confusion at this sudden plunge into unreality by lighting two Dunhills at once as I backed off and tried to get grounded. But my head was still whirling from this hurricane of changes, and I heard myself saying, What do you mean, is this him? You bastard! I should have you arrested for what you did to me in Chicago. Ali fell back on the pillows and laughed. I'm sorry, boss, but I just couldn't recognize you. I knew I was supposed to meet somebody, but yeah, I said. That's what I was trying to tell you. What did you think I was there for, an autograph? Everybody in the room laughed this time, and I felt like I'd been shot out of a cannon and straight into somebody else's movie. I put my satchel down on the bureau across from the bed and reached in for a beer. The pop top came off with a hiss and a blast of brown foam that dripped on the rug as I tried to calm down. You scared me, Ollie was saying. You looked like some kind of a bum or a hippie. What? I almost shouted. A bum? A hippie? I lit another cigarette or maybe two, not realizing or even thinking about the gross transgressions I was committing by smoking and drinking in the presence of the champ. Conrad told me later that nobody smokes or drinks in the same room with Muhammad Ali, and Jesus Christ, not, of all places, in the sacred privacy of his own bedroom at midnight, where I had no business being in the first place. But I was mercifully and obviously ignorant of what I was doing. Smoking and drinking and tossing off crude bursts of language are not second nature to me, but first. And my mood at that point was still so mean and jangled that it took me about ten minutes of foul-mouthed raving before I began to get a grip on myself. Everybody else in the room was obviously relaxed and getting a wonderful boot out of this bizarre spectacle, which was me. And when the adrenaline finally burned off, I realized that I'd backed so far away from the bed and into the bureau that I was actually sitting on the goddamn thing with my legs crossed in front of me like some kind of wild-eyed, dope-addled Buddha. Buddha, Buddha. But ah, fuck these wretched idols with unspellable names. Let's use Buddha. And to hell with Edmund Newman. And suddenly, I felt just fine. And why not? I was, after all, the undisputed heavyweight gonzo champion of the world, and this giggling yo-yo in the bed across the room from me was no longer the champion of anything, or at least nothing he could get a notary public to vouch for. So, I sat back on the bureau with my head against the mirror and I thought, well, shit, here I am, and it's definitely a weird place to be, but not really, and not half as weird as a lot of other places I've been. Nice view, decent company, and no real worries at all in this tight group of friends who were obviously having a good time with each other as the conversation recovered from my flaky entrance and got back on the fast break, bump and run track they were used to. Conrad was sitting on the floor with his back to the big window that looks out on the savage, snow-covered wasteland of Central Park, and one look at his face told me that he was finished working for the night. He had worked a major miracle smuggling a hyena into the House of Mirrors, and now he was content to sit back and see what happened. Conrad was as happy as a serious smoker without a serious smoke could have been right then. And so was I, for that matter, despite the crossfire of abuse and bent humor that I found myself caught in between Bundini and the bed. Ali was doing most of the talking. His mind seemed to be sort of wandering around and every once in a while taking a quick bite out of anything that caught his interest, like a good-humored wolverine. There was no talk about boxing, as I recall. We'd agreed to save that for the formal interview tomorrow morning, so this midnight gig was a bit like a warm-up for what Conrad described as the serious bullshit. There was a lot of talk about drunkards, the sacred nature of unsweetened grapefruit, and the madness of handling money, a subject I told him I'd long since mastered. How many acres do you own? 
I kept asking him whenever he started getting too high on his own riffs. Not as many as me, I assured him. I'm richer than Midas, and nine times as shrewd. Whole valleys and mountains of acres, I continued, keeping a very straight face. Thousands of cattle, stallions, peacocks, wild boar, sloats. And then the final twist. You and Fraser just never learned how to handle money. But for 20% of the nut, I can make you almost as rich as I am. I could see that he didn't believe me. Ali is a hard man to con, but when he got on the subject of his tragic loss of all privacy, I figured it was time for the frill. You really want a cure for your privacy problem, I asked him, ripping the top out of another Ballantine ale? He smiled wickedly. Sure, boss, what you got? I slid off the bureau and moved toward the door. Hang on, I told him. I'll be right back. Conrad was suddenly alert. Where the hell are you going, he snapped. To my room, I said. I have the ultimate cure for Muhammad's privacy problem. What room, he asked. You don't even know where it is, do you? More laughter. It's 10-11, Conrad said, right upstairs. But hurry back, he added. And if you run into Pat, we never heard of you. Pat Patterson, Ollie's fearfully diligent bodyguard, was known to be prowling the halls and putting a swift arm on anything human or otherwise that might disturb Ollie's sleep. The rematch with Spinks was already getting cranked up, and it was Patterson's job to make sure the champ stayed deadly serious about his new training schedule. Don't worry, I said. I just want to go up to the room and put on my pantyhose. I'll be a lot more comfortable. A sound of raucous laughter followed me down the hall as I sprinted off toward the fire exit, knowing I would have to be fast or I'd never get back in that room, tonight or tomorrow. But I knew what I wanted, and I knew where it was in my parachute bag. Yes, a spectacularly hideous, full-head, real hair, $75 movie-style Red Devil mask. A thing so fiendishly real and ugly that I still wonder, in moments like these, what sort of twisted impulse caused me to even pack the goddamn thing, much less wear it through the halls of the Park Lane Hotel and back into Muhammad Ali's suite at this unholy hour of the night. Three minutes later, I was back at the door with the mask zipped over my head and the neck flap tucked into my shirt. I knocked twice, then leaped into the room when Bundini opened the door, screaming some brainless slogan like, Death to the weird! For a second or two, there was no sound at all in the room. Then the whole place exploded in wild laughter as I pranced around, smoking and drinking through the molded rubber mouth and raving about whatever came into my head. The moment I saw the expression on Muhammad's face, I knew my mask would never get back to Woody Creek. His eyes lit up like he'd just seen the one toy he'd wanted all his life, and he almost came out of the bed after me. Okay, I said, lifting it off my head and tossing it across the room to the bed. It's yours, my man. But let me warn you that not everybody thinks this thing is real funny. Especially black people, Conrad told me later. Jesus, he said. I just about flipped when you jumped into the room with that goddamn mask on your head. That was really pushing your luck. Ollie put the mask on immediately and was just starting to enjoy himself in the mirror when, ye gods, we all went stiff as the sound of harsh knocking came through the door, along with the voice of Pat Patterson. Open up, he was shouting. What the hell is going on in there? I rushed for the bathroom, but Bundini was two steps ahead of me. Ali, still wearing the hideous mask, ducked under the covers and Conrad went to open the door. It all happened so fast that we all simply froze in position as Patterson came in like Dick Butkus on a blood scent. And that was when Muhammad came out of the bed with a wild cry and a mushroom cloud of flying sheets, pointing one long brown arm and a finger like Satan's own cattle prod, straight into Pat Patterson's face. And that, folks, was a moment that I'd just as soon not have to live through again. We were all lucky, I think, that Patterson didn't go for his gun and blow Muhammad away in that moment of madness before he recognized the body under the mask. 
It was only a split second, but it could easily have been a hell of a lot longer for all of us if Ollie hadn't dissolved in a fit of whooping laughter at the sight of Pat Patterson's face. And although Pat recovered instantly, the smile he finally showed us was uncomfortably thin. The problem, I think, was not so much the mask itself and the shock it had caused him, but why the champ was wearing the goddamn thing at all. Where had it come from and why? These were serious times, but a scene like this could have ominous implications for the future, particularly with Ali so pleased with his new toy that he kept it on his head for the next 10 or 15 minutes, staring around the room and saying with no hint of a smile in his voice that he would definitely wear it for his appearance on the Dick Cavett show the next day. This is the new me, he told us. I'll wear it on TV tomorrow and tell Cavett that I promised Veronica that I won't take it off until I win my title back. I'm going to wear this ugly thing everywhere I go, even when I get into the ring with Spinks next time. He laughed wildly and jabbed at himself in the mirror. Yes, indeed, he chuckled. They thought I was crazy before, but they ain't seen nothing yet. I was feeling a little on the crazy side myself at that point and Patterson's accusing presence soon told us it was time to go. Okay, boss, Ollie said to me on the way out. Tomorrow we get serious, right? Nine o'clock in the morning, we'll have breakfast and get real serious. I agreed and went upstairs to my room for a bit of the good smoke. Muhammad Speaks A second shot from Spinx the hippie in the wingtips. The triple greatest of all times. I was up at 8.30 the next day, but when I called Ali's suite, Veronica said he'd been up since seven and was wandering around downstairs somewhere. I found him in the restaurant, sitting at one end of a table full of cut glass and silver, dressed almost as formally as the maitre d' in a dark blue pinstripe suit and talking very seriously with a group of friends and very earnest black businessmen types who were all dressed the same way he was. It was a completely different man from the one I'd been sparring and laughing with the night before. The conversation around the table ranged from what to do about a just-received invitation to visit some new country in Africa, to a bewildering variety of endorsement offers, to book contracts, real estate, and the molecular structure of crab meat. It was mid-morning before we finally went upstairs to his suite to get serious. And what follows is a 99% verbatim transcript of our conversation for almost the next two hours. Muhammad was stretched out on the bed, still wearing his senator's suit, and balancing my tape recorder on his stomach while he talked. I was sitting cross-legged right next to him on the bed, with a bottle of Heineken in one hand, a cigarette in the other, and my shoes on the floor beside me. The room was alive with the constant comings and goings of people bearing messages, luggage, warnings about getting to the Cavett show on time, and also a very alert curiosity about me and what I was up to. The mask was nowhere in sight, but Pat Patterson was, along with three or four other very serious-looking black gentlemen who listened to every word we said. One of them actually kneeled on the floor right next to the bed with his ear about 13 inches away from the tape recorder the whole time we talked. Okay, we might as well get back to what we were talking about downstairs. You said you're definitely going to fight Sphinx again, right? I can't say I'm definitely going to fight Sphinx again. I think we are. I'm sure we are. But I might die. He might die. But as far as you're concerned, you want to. You're counting on it. Yeah, he plans to fight me. I gave him a chance, and he will give me a shot back at it. The people won't believe he's a true champion until he beats me twice. See, I had to beat Liston twice. Johansson had to beat Patterson twice, but he didn't. Randy Turpin had to beat Sugar Ray twice, but he didn't. If he can beat me twice, then people will really believe that he might possibly be the greatest. Okay, let me ask you. At what point, at what time, I was in Vegas for the fight. When did you realize that things were getting real serious? Round 12. Up to then, you still thought you had control. 
I was told that I was probably losing, but maybe I was even. I had to win the last three, and I was too tired to win the last three. Then I knew I was in trouble. But you figured you could pull it off, up until round 12. Yeah, but I couldn't, because he is confident, because he is winning, and I had to pull it off, and he was 197, and I'm 228, and that's too heavy. Didn't you tell me downstairs at breakfast that you're going to come in at 205 next time? I don't know what I'm going to come in at. 205 is really impossible. If I get to 220, I'll be happy. Just be eight pounds lighter. I'll be happy. I did pretty good at that weight to be in condition around 220, even if it's 225, 223. I could do better. Well, on a scale of 100, what kind of condition were you in for Spinks? Scale of 100, I was 80. Where should you have been? Should have been 98. Why didn't you know him better? You didn't seem ready. Why didn't anybody know him? He slipped up on the press, a 10-to-1 underdog, they called him. He hadn't gone over 10 rounds and only 7 pro fights. What can you know about him? Okay, let's get to another point. I was down there in Vegas for two weeks, and there wasn't much to do except talk and gossip, and there was a lot of talk about whether it would be better off for you to come out and zing him right away, take charge, or do what I think you did, sort of lay back and... No, you couldn't have said it was better for me to take charge. Well, there were two schools of thought. One was, you come out zooming and cracking. And the other was the sort of slow start rope-a-dope trip. No, that wouldn't be wise at my age and my weight to come out zooming and wear myself out in case I didn't knock him out. When you don't know a man, you gotta feel him out. But I know one thing. Everybody tires. That's why I laid on the ropes for four, five, or six rounds hoping he'd tire, but he didn't. We didn't know he had the stamina, and I wasn't in shape. So for me to come off bing, bing, bing real fast, I know for sure I'm going to tire, but I don't know for sure I'm going to stop him. But after I tire, then I'm in trouble. How long could you have gone if he came out zinging right away from the start? I could have zinged about six rounds. So you would have died after six. No, I wouldn't have died after six. I would have just slowed down and been on defense. But nobody can tell me how to come out or how I should have come out. I did the best thing for my condition. This may be an odd question, but I want to ask you anyway. At the press conference after the fight, I remember Leon saying, I just wanted to beat this nigger. And it seems to me it was done with a smile. But when I heard that, I felt the whole room get tense. No, that's okay. I say the same things. We black people talk about each other that way, in a humorous way. Ah, nigga, be quiet. Ah, uh, uh, I can whop that nigga. Nigga, you crazy. Those are our expressions. If you say it, I'll slap you. The white man can't call me nigger like they do. So it was a joke. It struck me as a very raw note, but I can't blame you. When I beat Sonny Liston, I didn't say those words, but I was glad to win, so I can't take nothing from Spinks. He's good. He's a lot better fighter than people thought he was. Tell me a little about this tri-cornered thing between you and Norton and Spinks. Well, Norton feels he deserves the next shot. Do you think he does? No, he deserves a shot at the winner between me and Spinks. I gave Spinks a shot. He owes me a shot for giving him a shot. The champion always gets a return. They used to have return clauses. We didn't have that. I don't have that. He's given me a shot because I gave him a break. I beat Norton twice. Foreman annihilated Norton, so therefore he's not better than me. I'm the number one contender, not him. What did Leon tell you? When I talked to him in Vegas, I got the feeling he honestly wants to give you a return shot. I think he's ready for that. Sure he will. By the time this article will come out, the fight probably will have been signed and everything. The date's set, and we ready to fight. Don't say yet, but I'm sure it's getting pretty close, and I'm the one they'll choose. He makes $5 million with me and $1.5 with Norton. Who would you fight?
Anyway, what happens if it turns out that Leon is legally obligated to fight Norton first? That's all right. I ain't tired. I got four or five more years of good fighting. Four or five years? Ollie nods, grins. Plenty of time, boss. All the time I need. How do you think Spinks would do against Norton? I think he'd beat Norton. Did I hear you say that you were going up to the camp today? I start training in about two weeks. And that's going to be straight through for five or six months? You've never done that before, have you? Never in my life. Never more than two months. But this time, I'm going to be in there five months, chopping trees, running up hills. I'll be coming in dancing. Dancing. Sudden grin. I'll be winning my title for the third time. Shouting. The greatest of all times. Of all times. Laughing and jabbing. Come on now, we're not on TV. Let's get back to this Norton Spinks thing. Why do you say Spinks will win? Because he's too fast. He's aggressive. He's young. He takes a punch. The mere fact that he can beat me means he can beat Norton. I'm better than Norton. I pick him. It don't have to be that way, but I pick him. How about Frazier? Could Leon have beaten the Joe Frazier of four or five years ago? Around the first or second time you fought him? Who does Leon compare to? Leon compared to, he compared to Frazier's style, always coming in. Spanks, Frazier. Frazier at his best? Frazier at his best, yeah. How good is Leon? I don't really know myself. Leon is unexplored, unknown. And after I beat him, he'll come back and win the title and he'll hold it four or five years. And he'll go down in history as one of the great heavyweights. Not the greatest, but one of the greatest. So if you fought him one more time, you think that'd be it? Is that what you're saying? I'm not sure that'll be it for me. I might take another fight. Don't know yet, according to how I feel when that time comes. Did you see Kali Notzi, that South African fighter? The one who beat Bobbick? I heard about him. Me and Conrad spent a lot of time talking to him before the fight. I was trying to work up a really serious spectacle between you and him down in South Africa. He seemed like a nice fella. Oh, yeah, he was really eager to have you come down there and fight. Does that interest you? To fight a white cop in South Africa? On the basis that on that day there'd be equality in the arena where I'm fighting. But would that interest you? With all the heavy political overtones, how do you feel about something like that? Along with a million-dollar gate? Yeah, I like it. With the approval of all the other African nations and Muslim countries, I wouldn't go against their wishes regardless of how they made the arena that night. If the masses of the country and the world were against it, I wouldn't go. I know that I have a lot of fans in South Africa, and they want to see me. But I'm not going to crawl over other nations to go. The world would have to say, well, this case is special. They've given the people justice. His going is helping the freedom. There's a dramatic quality to that thing. I can't think of any other fight that would have that kind of theater. Actually, it might even be too much politics. What worries me is getting whooped by a white man in South Africa. Oh, ho, yeah! Nervous chuckle. Room breaks into laughter. Laughing. That's what the world needs. Me getting whooped by a white man in South Africa. Still laughing. Oh, yeah. Getting whooped by a white man, period. But in South Africa, if a white South African fire to beat me, Jesus. Oh, Lord. Chuckles. Oh, you'd have to win. You would definitely have to win. Did you see the film of his fight with Bobbick when he took him out in the third round? Was he good? He was a little slow, but he looked powerful. He didn't look to me like you would have any trouble with him. But I'm not an expert. 
he looked like you'd have to watch it. Yeah, he took Bobak real hard. I don't think it would be wise for me to fight him in South Africa. If I beat him too bad and then leave the country, they might beat up some of the brothers. Laughter in the room. Or if he whooped me too bad, then there might be riots. People crazy. You know what I mean? If I whoop him too bad and look too good, then the brothers might get beat up after I leave. I wouldn't fool with it. I'm a representative of black people. It'd be good if I don't go to nothing like that. It's too touchy. It's more than a sport when I get involved. But it's the fact that he's white. Did you know he called me a nigger? What? You didn't hear it? The South African... No! You was in Vegas, right? Yeah, we talked to him. He said, that cocky nigger, that's one nigger I want. Oh, come on. He didn't say that. That guy was on his best behavior. He said, I want that nigger. Come on. I was joking. He was on his best behavior. The lawyer said, you don't understand our country. I mean, it's not like you've heard at all. And Conrad was saying, bullshit, you got cages for those black people down there. He was rude. He gave me a big argument. Did he slap you? Slap me? I had Hunter with me. I had a can of mace in my pocket. Ollie laughing and looking at his watch. Okay, now you got five minutes. Let's see, five minutes? I'll give you ten minutes. See, see the clock? Yeah, don't worry. I've got my own clock. See this magnesium Rolex? Heavy, eh? And see these? After you called me a bum and a hippie last night, look what I wore for you this morning. Holding up perforated wingtips. You're getting a pretty good interview, man. Yeah. Reaches for one of the shoes. Look at that shine, too. Those are some good shoes. Those shoes must have cost about $50. Yeah, they're about ten years old. Are they? Same soles? Yeah, these are my FBI shoes. I only wear them for special occasions. Nobody's called me a bum and a hippie for a long time. You're not going to drink your beer? You an alcoholic? Alcoholic? Bum? Hippie? Remember, I got to write an article about you before Friday. <laughs> You got the beer. <laughs> Bum and a hippie. Where are you going? Right here. I'll talk louder so you can hear. What else you want to ask me? My head's, uh, I'm still on that South Africa trip. I guess there'd be no way you could go down there without beating Leon first, right? No, I got to beat Leon first. I will defeat Leon first. I will go down as the triple greatest of all time. Oh, yeah, I think you might, if you train, if you get serious. If I get serious, I'm as serious as cancer. Is cancer serious? Well, yeah, I didn't realize, um, if you're going to start training now, that is serious. That's five months, six months. I'm going to be ready. Would you call him a fast fighter, Leon? Seems like a funny word to use for him. Fast? Yeah, he was fast. Faster than I was that night. He's fast, period. Fast hands, fast feet. Fast hands. Not as fast as reflexes because of his weight. When I'm down to my weight that I would like to be, I know I'm faster. I noticed in the third round the first time I smelled a little bit of trouble was when I saw you missing him with the jab. It would be about six inches. The one thing I did wrong, I didn't do no boxing hardly before this fight. Why? Well, my belief was at this age, too much pounding and getting hit and unnecessary training wasn't necessary. Well, if too much training would have been bad for that fight, how about the next one? Why would it be good for the next fight? A timing was lost. Well, I'm going to have to box. I'm not saying it would have been bad to box, Better for me, see? I wasn't boxing nobody, and I was missing a lot of punches in that fight. Yeah, I noticed that. 
That's when I first thought, uh-oh, it'll be a long fight. That's because I wasn't boxing. I was hitting bad. You think you could knock Leon out? I thought you could have in the 15th round. I couldn't follow him up. Might knock him out and might not. Was there any time you thought maybe you might have? Did you ever think he was going to knock you out? Was there any time you thought, uh-oh, he might even put you down? No, nothing like that. Would it be more important next time to get faster? No, next time it's to be in better shape, to take him more serious, to know him. Why the hell didn't you this time? Didn't know him. You got some of the smartest people in the business working with you. Didn't know him. See, all my worst fights was when I fought nobodies. Jurgen Blinn, Zurich, Switzerland, seven rounds with him. Didn't look too good. Al Lewis, Dublin, Ireland, a nobody. Went 11 rounds. Jean-Pierre Koopman, San Juan, Puerto Rico, a nobody. Bonavina, he was pretty good. Alfredo Evangelista, a nobody. Didn't look that hot. Yeah, but Leon... You saw him fight several times, didn't you? Amateurs, just seven. What can this man do with seven pro fights? Never been over ten rounds. But you had about 15 or 18 pro fights when you fought Liston the first time. I don't know. I think I counted them up the other day. Nineteen, maybe. I caught him off guard, too. I was supposed to have been annihilated like this boy was. But my best fights were those fights where I was the underdog. George Foreman's comeback, two Liston fights, Frazier fights, Norton. Is that something in your head? It makes you hungry. Got something to work for. I'm doing good. Everything is going my way. I'm eating dinner. I'm living with my wife and my two children all up to the fight, which ain't that good. At least six weeks before the fight, I should get away from my children because they make you soft. You hug them and you kiss them, you know? You round babies all day. Day before the fight, I'm babysitting because my wife done some shopping. She didn't mean no harm. You can't blame it on her, though. No, I got to get away from the babies. I got to get evil. Got to chop trees, run up hills, get in my old log cabin. You plan to go up there to stay at the camp? Live there until the fight? Where? What fight? You say you're going to go up there and do a monk sort of trip. No, my wife and babies would be with me. But my babies, they cry at night and they'll be in another cabin. What about Leon's rib? Do you think you broke his rib? He got hurt in the fight some kind of way. And I was told after the fight he was hurt and some doctor was looking at him and that it wasn't that bad. And I guess when it looked like he was going to fight Norton... They had to admit he was hurt because Norton's a body puncher. Well, speaking of that, I don't want to bring up any sore subject, but did you see Pacheco on the Tom Snyder show when he was talking about all athletes getting old? He seemed to come down pretty hard. He said, physically, it would just be impossible for you to get back in shape to beat Leon. I was fighting years before I knew Pacheco. He got famous hanging around me. They all got known. Popular. They'd never admit it. And also, Pacheco don't know me. He works in my corner. He's not my real physical doctor. So you think you can get back in 98 on a scale of 100? Yeah. What I like, this is what I love. To do the impossible. Be the underdog. Pressure makes me go. I couldn't... I didn't beat Frazier the first time. I didn't beat Norton the first time. I gotta beat the animal. I almost gotta lose to keep going. It would be hard for me to keep getting the spirit up. What have I got to accomplish? Who have I got to prove wrong? Speaking of that, how did you ever get yourself in a situation where you had so much to lose and so little to gain by fighting Leon down there? How did I get him what? You got yourself in an almost no-win situation there where you had very little to win and a hell of a lot to lose. It struck me as strategically bad. That's the way it is. 
That's the way it's been ever since I held the crown. I didn't have nothing to gain by fighting Bugner. I didn't have nothing to gain by fighting Jean-Pierre Koopman. I didn't have nothing to gain by fighting a lot of people. You sure as hell will next time by fighting Leon. That will be real pressure. Oh, yeah. I like the pressure, need the pressure. The world likes... People like to see miracles. People like to see... People like to see underdogs that do it. People like to be there when history is made. Raw eggs and beer in the top-ranked suite. A sea of noise and violence. An eerie, roaring chant. The final bell. A quote from George Plimpton, Shadow Box. One thing that Ernest Hemingway had always told me was that it was a bad idea to get to know an active fighter and become interested in his career. Sooner or later, he was going to get hurt in the ring and beaten, and it would be an almost unbearable thing to see if he were a friend. Well, I wondered why George never showed up in Las Vegas. Muhammad Ali is a friend of Norman Mailer's, too, and also Bud Schulberg's along with most of the other big-time boxing writers who skipped the Sphinx fight. I was too strung out on the simple horror of spending two weeks in the Las Vegas Hilton to understand anything more complex than fear, hunger, and daytime TV at the time, to grasp my own lack of sensitivity. And at first I thought it was some kind of monumental botch on my part. Sybil Aram tried to reassure me, but others said I was paranoid. Day after endless day, I would check into top rank headquarters on the fifth floor director's suite and ask as casually as possible if George or Norman had showed up yet, and the answer was always the same. Or perhaps I was overcompensating somehow for my shameful malaria freak out in Zaire by showing up for this one two weeks earlier than anybody except Aram and Leon. After a week or so of feeling so conspicuously alone in my role of behind-the-scenes fight writer, I finally began passing myself off as the official top-ranked bartender instead. I began to get seriously paranoid about the situation. What was wrong, I wondered. Had I chosen the wrong hotel? Were all the heavies staying somewhere else like the Aladdin or Caesar's Palace where the real action was? Or maybe I was working too hard doing unnatural things like waking up at 10 o'clock in the morning to attend the daily promo strategy meetings down in Aram's top-ranked director's suite, taking voluminous notes on such problems as the Ghanaian featherweight challenger's baffling refusal to wear Everlast gloves for his fight with Danny Lopez, and whether the public should be charged $1 or $2 to attend Ali's daily workouts if and when Ali finally showed up for any workouts at all. He was not taking the fight seriously, according to rumors out of Dundee's gym in Miami, and to make matters worse, he was also refusing to talk to anybody except his wife. There was also the matter of how to cope with a mindset ranging from blank apathy to outright mockery on the part of the national boxing press. The only fight writers who could be counted on for Daily Inc. were locals such as Tommy Lopez from the Review Journal and Mike Marley from the Las Vegas Sun which was good for me because they both knew a hell of a lot more about the fight game than I did. And between the two of them, I was getting a dose of education about the technical aspects of boxing that I have never known much about. But the New York media continued to dismiss the fight as either a farce or a fraud, or perhaps even a fix, as frustrated challenger Ken Norton would suggest afterward, and Aram's humor grew more and more foul as Leon absorbed more and more bum-of-the-month jokes from the national boxing press. Aram was shocked and genuinely outraged as the pre-fight coverage dwindled down to a one-line joke about this upcoming mystery match between one fighter who won't talk and another who can't. Spinks wandered in and out of the suite from time to time, seeming totally oblivious to what anybody in the world, including me and Aram, had to say about the fight or anything else. 
He was not even disturbed when his mother arrived in Las Vegas and told the first reporter she met that she thought it was a shame that her son was going to have to get beat up on TV just to make a bundle of money for big business people from New York. Leon Spinks is not one of your chronic worriers. His mind moves in pretty straight lines, and the more I saw of him in Las Vegas, the more I became convinced that the idea of fighting his boyhood idol for the heavyweight championship of the world didn't bother him at all, win or lose. Sure, he's the greatest, he would say to the few reporters who managed to track him down and ask how he felt about Ali. But he has to give it up sometime, right? He was polite with the press, but it was clear that he had no interest at all in their questions, and even less in his own answers, which he passed off as casually as he dropped two raw eggs in every glass of beer he drank during interviews. Nor did he have any interest in Aram's desperate scrambling for pre-fight publicity. No half-bright presidential candidate, rock star, or championship boxing promoter would do anything but fire any ranking advisor who had arranged for him and his wife to spend two weeks in a small bedroom adjoining the main suite slash bar slash war room and the base for all serious business. But this is what Bob Arum did in Las Vegas, and it was so entirely out of character for anybody dealing in power and leverage and money on that scale that it made me suspicious. Bob and I have been friends long enough for me to be relatively certain he wasn't either dumb or crazy. But I have a lot of strange friends, and I still trust my instincts in this area about 98%, despite a few glaring exceptions in the area of southern politicians and black drug dealers wearing iron boy overalls. And until Aram pulls that kind of switch on me, I will still call him my friend and treat him the same way. Indeed! And now that we've settled that, Let's get back to this twisted saga and my feeling in Las Vegas as the day of the fight approached and my lonely perceptions with regard to its possible meaning and in fact my whole understanding of professional boxing as either a sport or a business came more and more into question. Well, I began to feel very isolated down there in the huge Vegas Hilton and when even my good friends smiled indulgently when I said on the phone that I was having a hell of a hard time getting a bet on Leon Spinks at 10 or even 8 to 1, I had a few nervous moments wondering if perhaps I really was as crazy as so much of the evidence suggested. This was, however, before I'd read Plimpton's book and found out that I was the only writer in America so cold-hearted as to show up in Las Vegas to watch Muhammad Ali get beaten. Whatever else I might or might not have been, I was clearly no friend of the champs, which was true on one level because I not only showed for the fight, but wallowed so deep in the quicksands of human treachery as to bet against him. A ten to one. Let's not forget those numbers, especially not if the difference between ten and five is really the difference between a friend and an enemy. When the bell rang to start number 15 in Vegas, Leon Spinks was so tired and wasted that he could barely keep his balance for the next three minutes. And now, after watching that fight on videotape at least 20 times, I think that even world lightweight champ Roberto Duran could have taken Leon out with one quick and savage combination. A hard jab in the eyes to bring his hands up in front of his face, just long enough to crack him under the heart with a right uppercut. Then another left into the stomach to bring his head forward again to that target point in the crosshairs of Ollie's brittle but still murderous bazooka right hand at 20 or 21 inches. No fighter except Joe Frazier had ever survived one of Muhammad's frenzied killer combinations in a round as late as the 15th. And until those last incredibly brutal three minutes in Las Vegas, Leon Spinks had never gone more than 10 rounds in his life. When he shuffled half-blindly out of his corner for number 15 against the champ, who was obviously and terminally behind on points after 14, Leon Spinks was ready to go, as they say in that merciless million-dollar-a-minute world of the squared circle. But so was Muhammad Ali. 
fight film shot from a catwalk directly above the ring, looking straight down from the high ceiling of the Hilton Pavilion, show both fighters reeling off balance and virtually holding on to each other at times, just to keep from falling down in that vicious final round. There was no more strategy at that point, and the bloodlust howl of the small crowd of 5,000 or so white-on-white pro-Spinks high rollers who had made the fight a cynical and almost reluctant sellout in a town where a shrewd promoter like Aram or Don King or even Raul Duke could sell 5,000 tickets to a world championship cockfight, told Muhammad Ali all he needed to know at that point in time. The same people who'd been chanting Ali, Ali just a few minutes ago when it looked like the champ had once again known exactly what he was doing all along as Leon looked to be fading badly in the late rounds. These same people were now chanting as if led by some unseen cheerleader, but they were no longer saying Ali. As it became more and more obvious that Muhammad was just as dead on his feet as Spinks seemed to be, the hall slowly filled with a new sound. It began late in the 14th, as I recall, and since I was by that time engulfed in the hell-on-earth chaos that had overtaken the 50 or so close friends and family members in the champ's corner were people like ex-heavyweight champ Jimmy Ellis and Ali's hot-tempered brother Rahman had been clawing at the ring ropes and screaming doomed advice at Muhammad ever since Bundini had become sick and collapsed right next to Angelo Dundee in the corner at the end of round number 12, causing Kilroy and Patterson to start yelling into the mob for a doctor. Patterson, right in front of me, was holding Bundini with one arm and waving at Kilroy with the other. Drew's had a heart attack, he shouted. A heart attack! Ali's corner was a deafening mix of fear, madness, and emotional dysfunction at that point a sea of noise and violence, total chaos. And then came the eerie, roaring chant from the crowd, Leon! Leon! The chant grew louder and somehow malignant as the 15th round staggered on to its obvious end. Leon! 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 Muhammad Ali had never heard that chant before, and neither had Leon Spinks. Or me either. Or Angelo. Or Bundini. Or Kilroy. Or Conrad. Or Pat Patterson. Or Chris Christofferson either, who was hanging on to Rita Coolidge just a few feet away from me, and looking very stricken while the last few seconds ticked off until the bell finally rang and made every one of us in that corner feel suddenly very old. Billy the Geek calls New Orleans, even odds and rancid karma. The Ali Spinks rematch on September 15th will not be dull. The early rumor line has Ali a two-to-one favorite, but these numbers will not hold up. Or if they do, Spinks as a two-to-one underdog will be a very tempting bet, even for me. And anything higher than that will be almost irresistible. When I arrived in Las Vegas two weeks before the last fight, I told Bob Arum that I figured Leon had a 20% chance of winning. That translates into 4-1 to one odds, which even the nickel-and-dime experts said was a bad joke. The fight was considered such a gross mismatch that every bookie in Vegas except one had it off the board, meaning no bets at all, because Ali was such a prohibitive favorite, even 10-1 to one was deemed a sure way to lose money. As late as the 13th round, in fact, freelance bookies at ringside were still laying 8-1 to one on Muhammad. My friend Sam's Luckett, sitting in one of the $200 seats with a gaggle of high rollers, watched the round-by-round -round destruction of one poor bastard who lost at least $40,000 in 45 minutes, betting on Ali first at 10-1, to one, then down to 8-1 to one after the first six or seven rounds, then 4-1 to one after 11, and finally all the way down to 2-1 to one at the end of 13. The man was in a blathering rage by the time the fight was over. I was betting on a goddamn legend, he shouted. I must have been out of my mind. I have watched the videotape of that fight enough times to risk wondering out loud at this point on the subject of what may or may not have been wrong with Ali's right hand in that fight. It was totally ineffective. The jab was still there, even with five or six pounds of flab to slow it down. 
and the right was getting through Leon's guard with a consistency that would have ended the fight in 10 or 11 rounds if Muhammad had been able to land it with any power at all. Spinks must have taken 25 or 30 right-hand shots from Ali, and I doubt if he felt more than one or two of them. That was the real key to the fight, and if Ali's right hand is as useless in New Orleans as it was in Las Vegas, Spinks will win by a TKO in eight or nine rounds. Both fighters understand at this point that Ali has already tried what he and his handlers felt was the best strategy for dealing with Leon. That was the time-tested rope-a-dope, which assumed that a frenzied, undisciplined fighter like Spinks would punch himself out in the early rounds like George Foreman and become a tired sitting duck for Ali by the time the bell rang for number 10. That was a very bad mistake, because Leon did not punch himself out, and there is no reason to think he will in the rematch, which means that Ali will have to fight a very different fight this time. He will have to risk punching himself out in the first five or six rounds in what Aram is calling the Battle of New Orleans, and the odds on his getting away with it are no better than 50-50 and he will have to be in miraculously top shape even then. Because if he can't come zooming out of his corner at the opening bell and whack Leon off balance real quick, Muhammad will not last ten rounds. If I were a bookie, I would make Leon a 60-40 favorite, which is exactly the same way Bob Arum was seeing it, even before the fight finally found a home in New Orleans. There are some people in the fight game who will tell you that Aram doesn't know boxing from badminton, but not one of them went on the record last time with anything riskier than the idea that Leon might have a chance. Bob Aram called it 60-40 Ali at least six weeks prior to the fight, which stunned me at first because I thought my own 20% figure was borderline madness at best. But Aram stuck with his 40% bet on Leon all the way up to the fight. And after watching Leon for two weeks in Vegas, my own figure went up to 30 or 35 percent. Or perhaps even 40 or 45 percent on the day of the fight when I heard Aram screaming at Spinks on the house phone at 2.30 in the afternoon, telling him to stop worrying about getting tickets for his friends and get ready to do battle against a man that a lot of people, including me, still call the best fighter who ever climbed into a ring. And if I had known before the fight that Leon forced his handlers to get him a steak for lunch at 5 o'clock, I would probably have called the fight even. That's how the Battle of New Orleans looks to me now. Dead even. And if the numbers turn up that way on September 15th, I will bet on Muhammad Ali for reasons of my own. I hate to lose any bet, but losing on this one would not hurt that much. The last 20 years of my life would have been just a little bit cheaper and duller if Muhammad Ali had not been around to keep me cranked up. And there is no way I could bet against him this time in what could well be his last fight. I figure I can afford to bet on him and lose. That is an acceptable risk. But something very deep inside me curdles at the thought of what kind of rancid karma I could bring down on myself if I bet against him. And he won. That is not an acceptable risk. The Roving Tripod, the experts at the Hilton Bar. A final adventure in fish wrap journalism. Muhammad Ali has interested a lot of different people for a lot of very different reasons since he became a media superstar and a high-energy national presence almost two decades ago. And he has interested me, too, for reasons that ranged from a sort of amused camaraderie in the beginning to wary admiration, then sympathy, and a new level of personal respect, followed by a dip into a different kind of wariness that was more exasperation than admiration. And finally, into a mix of all these things that never really surfaced and came together until I heard that he'd signed to fight Leon Spinks as a warm-up for his $16 million swan song against Ken Norton. This was the point where my interest in Muhammad Ali moved almost subconsciously to a new and higher gear. I had seen all of Leon's fights in the 1976 Montreal Olympics, and I recall being impressed to the point of awe at the way he attacked and destroyed whatever they put in front of him. I had never seen a young fighter who could get away with planting both feet 
and leaning forward when he hooked with either hand. Archie Moore was probably the last big fighter with that rare combination of power, reflexes, and high tactical instinct that a boxer must have to get away with risking moments of total commitment even occasionally. But Leon did it constantly, and in most of his fights, that was all he did. It was a pure kamikaze style, the roving tripod, as it were, with Leon's legs forming two poles of the tripod and the body of his opponent forming the third, which is interesting for at least two reasons. Number one, there is no tripod until a punch off that stance connects with the opponent's head or body, so the effect of a miss can range from fatal to unnerving, or at the very least, it will cause raised eyebrows and even a faint smile or two among the ringside judges who are scoring the fight. And number two, if the punch connects solidly, then the tripod is formed, and an almost preternatural blast of energy is delivered at the point of impact, especially if the hapless target is leaning as far back on the ropes as he can get with his head ducked in and forward in a cover-up stance, like Ali's rope-a-dope. A boxer who plants both feet and then leans forward to lash out with a hook has his whole weight and also his whole balance behind it. He cannot pull back at that point, and if he fails to connect, he will not only lose points for dumb awkwardness, but he'll plunge his head out front, low and wide open for one of those close-in jackhammer combinations that usually end with a knockdown. That was Leon's style in the Olympics, and it was a terrifying thing to see. All he had to do was catch his opponent with no place to run, then land one or two of those brain-rattling tripod shots in the first round, and once you get stunned and intimidated like that in the first round of a three-round Olympic bout, there is not enough time to recover. Or even want to, for that matter, once you begin to think that this brute they pushed you into the ring with has no reverse gear and would just as soon attack a telephone pole as a human being. Not many fighters can handle that style of all-out assault without having to back off and devise a new game plan. But there is no time for devising new plans in a three-round fight, and perhaps not in 10, 12, or 15 rounds either, because Leon doesn't give you much time to think. He keeps coming, swarming, pounding, and he can land three or four shots from both directions once he gets braced and leans out to meet that third leg of the tripod. On the other hand... Those poor geeks that Leon beat silly in the Olympics were amateurs, and we are all a bit poorer for the fact that he was a light heavyweight when he won that gold medal. Because if he'd been a few pounds heavier, he would have had to go against the elegant Cuban heavyweight champion Teofilo Stevenson, who would have beaten him like a gong for all three rounds. But Stevenson, the Olympic heavyweight champ in both 1972 and 76, and the only modern heavyweight with the physical and mental equipment to compete with Muhammad Ali, has insisted for reasons of his own and Fidel Castro's on remaining the amateur heavyweight champion of the world. Instead of taking that one final leap for the great ring that a fight against Muhammad Ali could have been for him. Whatever reasons might have led Castro to decide that an Ali Stevenson match sometime in 1973 or 74, after Muhammad had won the hearts and minds of the whole world with his win over George Foreman in Zaire, was not in the interest of either Cuba, Castro, or perhaps even Stevenson himself, will always be clouded in the dark fog of politics and the conviction of people like me that the same low-rent political priorities that heaped a legacy of failure and shame on every other main issue of this generation was also the real reason why the two great heavyweight artists of our time were never allowed in the ring with each other. This is one of those private opinions of my own that even my friends in the boxing industry still dismiss as the flaky gibberish of a half-smart writer who was doing okay with things like drugs, violence, and presidential politics, but who couldn't quite cut the mustard in their world. Boxing. These were the same people who chuckled indulgently when I said, in Las Vegas, that I'd take every bet I could get on Leon Spinks against Muhammad Ali at 10 to 1, and with anybody who was seriously into numbers, I was ready to haggle all the way down to 5 to 1, or maybe even 4. But even at 8 to 1, it was somewhere between hard and impossible to get a bet down on Spinks with anybody in Vegas 
who was even a 50-50 bet to pay off in real money. One of the few consistent traits shared by experts in any field is that they will almost never bet money or anything else that might turn up in public on whatever they call their convictions. That is why they are experts. They have waltzed through that minefield of high-risk commitments that separates politicians from gamblers. And once you've reached that plateau where you can pass for an expert, the best way to stay there is to hedge all your bets, private and public, so artistically that nothing short of a thing so bizarre that it can pass for an act of God can damage your high-priced reputation. I remember vividly, for instance, my frustration at Norman Mailer's refusal to bet money on his almost certain conviction that George Foreman was too powerful for Muhammad Ali to cope with in Zaire. And I also recall being slapped on the chest by an Associated Press boxing writer in Las Vegas while we were talking about the fight one afternoon at the casino bar in the Hilton. Leon Spinks is a dumb midget, he snarled in the teeth of all the other experts who'd gathered on that afternoon to get each other's fix on the fight. He has about as much chance of winning the heavyweight championship as this guy. This guy was me, and the AP writer emphasized his total conviction by giving me a swift backhand to the sternum. I have talked to him since on this subject, and when I said I planned to quote him absolutely verbatim with regard to his pre-fight wisdom in Vegas, he seemed like a different man and said that if I was going to quote him on his outburst of public stupidity, that I should at least be fair enough to explain that he had been with Muhammad Ali for so long and through so many wild scenes that he simply couldn't go against him on this one. Well, this is my final adventure in fish rap journalism, and I frankly don't give a fuck whether or not it makes sense to the readers. Especially since you chintzy greedheads tried to put a double-paged full-color ad right in the middle of this story. Somewhere in my files I have a letter from Honda's U.S. ad agency that says they would just as soon avoid any image identification with Rolling Stone. And those lame-slash-ten bastards have heaped enough abuse on me over the years to make me wonder what kind of mentality we're dealing with if they've come so far around the bend that they now want to put a gigantic Honda ad right in the middle of my article. Fuck those people. I wouldn't ride a Honda to Richard Nixon's funeral. And in fact, the last person I knew who owned a Honda was Ron Ziegler. That was down in San Clemente, just before the resignation, and I recall that Ron was eager to lend the thing to me for reasons I never quite understood. But I remember a cocktail party down at Nixon's house, crazed on mescaline and bending the casual elbow with Ron, Henry Kissinger, General Haig, and others of that stripe, who were all very friendly at that point in time. Even to me! Annie Leibovitz was there, and I was negotiating with Ziegler about trading me his Honda for my Z Dotson for a few days, while Ziegler's deputy, Gerald Warren, was laughing with Annie about how Kissinger thought I was an Air Force colonel in Mufti. Tell him he's right, I whispered to Annie. Then let's trade for Ziegler's bike and run it straight off the Laguna Beach Pier tomorrow morning. I'll take the bugger out over the water at top speed while you get a few good shots. Then I'll get off in midair before it hits. Right, and we'll give Ron an autographed photo from the colonel. Whoops. Here we go again, drifting back to the good old days when men were men and fun was fun, and a well-mannered Air Force doctor could still have cocktails with the president without causing a scandal. That was before the circus left town, as Dick Goodwin put it so starkly, as we sat in a Washington peg house on the day of Nixon's resignation. And indeed, everything since then has been downhill. Hamilton Jordan is too fat to ride a motorcycle, and Jody Powell is too slow. Jesus! How low have we sunk? Was Ron Ziegler the last free spirit in the White House? Jimmy's sister Gloria rides a big Honda? But they won't let her north of Chattanooga, and the rest of the family is laying low, working feverishly on a formula to convert peanuts into Swiss francs. Ah, mother of raving God, what are we into? How did we get down in this hole? And how can we get out? Or, more on the point, how can this cross-eyed story be salvaged? 
Now that I've spent a whole night babbling about Ron Ziegler and Hondas and that crowd of flabby clubfoots in the White House. What about the rest of the story? What about serious journalism and decency and truth and beauty? The eternal verities and Law Day in Georgia. Yes, that's almost on us again, and this time they want me to deliver the main address. Why not? For $100,000, I'll do anything, just as long as the cash comes up front. What? Ye gods, what have I said? Should we cut that last outburst? Or maybe just print the bugger and get braced for a sphinx-like assault from the Secret Service? No, this shit can't go on. It could get me in serious trouble. And what a tragedy it would be if I got locked up now after ten years of abusing the White House for what were always good reasons. Ziegler said it was because I was crazy and Kissinger thought I was some kind of rogue Air Force colonel. But my old friend Pat Buchanan called it a character defect. Which may or may not have been true, but if calling Richard Nixon a liar and a thief was evidence of a character defect, what in the hell kind of defect, disease, or even brain damage would cause a man to spend ten years of his life writing angry, self-righteous speeches for Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew? No Viet Cong ever called me nigger. Muhammad Ali said that back in 1967, and he almost went to prison for it, which says all that needs to be said right now about justice and gibberish in the White House. Some people write their novels, and others roll high enough to live them, and some fools try to do both. But Ali can barely read, much less write, so he came to that fork in the road a long time ago, and he had the rare instinct to find that one seam in the defense that let him opt for a third choice. He would get rid of words altogether and live his own movie. A brown Jay Gatsby, not black and with a head that would never be white. He moved from the very beginning with the same instinct that drove Gatsby, an endless fascination with that green light at the end of the pier. He had shirts for Daisy, Magic leverage for Wolfsheim. A delicate and dangerously vulnerable Ali Gatsby shuffle for Tom Buchanan and no answers at all for Nick Carraway, the word junkie. There are two kinds of counterpunchers in this world. One learns early to live by his reactions and quick reflexes and the other, the one with a taste for high rolling, has the instinct to make an aggressor's art of what is essentially the defensive survivor's style of the counterpuncher. Muhammad Ali decided one day a long time ago, not long after his 21st birthday, that he was not only going to be king of the world on his own turf, but crown prince on everybody else's. Which is very, very high thinking, even if you can't pull it off. Most people can't handle the action on whatever they chose or have to call their own turf and the few who can usually have better sense than to push their luck any further. That was always the difference between Muhammad Ali and the rest of us. He came, he saw, and if he didn't entirely conquer, he came as close as anybody we are likely to see in the lifetime of this doomed generation. Race Ipsa Loquitur The End You've been listening to The Great Shark Hunt, Gonzo Papers, Volume 1, Strange Tales from a Strange Time, by Hunter S. Thompson. Narrated by Scott Sowers and directed by Inok Yenti Aksentyev. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends another title by Hunter S. Thompson, Kingdom of Fear, Loathsome Secrets of a Star-Crossed Child in the Final Days of the American Century, also narrated by Scott Sowers. This brilliant and provocative book traces the course of Thompson's life as a rebel, from a smart-mouthed Kentucky kid flouting all authority to a convention-defying journalist who came to personify a wild fusion of fact, fiction, and mind-altering substances. 
Here are the formative experiences that comprise Thompson's legendary trajectory alongside the weird and the ugly. Whether detailing his exploits as a foreign correspondent in Rio, his job as night manager of the notorious O'Farrell Theater in San Francisco, his epic run for sheriff of Aspen on the freak power ticket, or the sensational legal maneuvering that led to his full acquittal in the famous 99 Days trial in Kingdom of Fear, Thompson is at the peak of his narrative powers. And this boisterous, blistering ride illuminates as never before the professional and ideological risk-taking of a literary genius and transgressive icon. Recorded Books offers a wide selection of bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So visit us at recordedbooks.com to learn about our latest releases and special offers. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.